Good morning. Hi. Hi. Hopefully you haven't been up for that long. Yeah. Yeah. Been up for a little bit. Yeah. We're having a little little challenge this morning. What's the challenge? Can I tell you the challenge? Yeah. Go ahead. You can tell tell Dr. DeSilva the challenge. No. No, you don't want to? Okay. Can I guess? Yeah. You won't guess. Okay, can I guess? <laughs> I'm going to guess that daddy has an important meeting and that the challenge is that maybe you have to keep the house a little quiet. Is that a challenge? Am I right? Is it a good guess? Yeah. That's a good guess. Okay. <laughs> Was I right? Yeah. Yeah. You can say you can nod too yeah. or be louder. <laughs> well, it's very nice to meet you. What's your name? Oliver Schoberg. Oliver Schoberg. Nice to meet you, Oliver. It's one of my favorite names. <gasps> but don't tell my little boy. That's no, no. Name. All right. Are you going to go down and see Mama? Yeah. Okay. Did you, want, you didn't say bye. Bye, Oliver. Don't forget <laughs> your job. <laughs> Morning. Good morning. Morning. Good morning, everyone. Morning. Morning. Good morning, everyone. It is 8.30 and it looks like we have the entire board here, which is great. Um, it's gonna be a long day. Might as well get it started right on time. Um, calling to this meeting to order and uh, we can start with the Pledge of Allegiance. Everybody turn their mics on for this. All right, do we have a... I have a flag in my room. I hope you all do. Let's see if John Mansfield can get the flag here for us. Oh, thank you, Rachel. Here we go. Oh, there we go. <laughs> okay. I pledge allegiance to the flag, flag of the United, United States, 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 States of America, America. America. and to the Republic for which it stands, stands. One, one nation, nation. Under, under God, God. indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Okay, uh, we're going to start with uh, opening remarks. Uh, Dr. De Silver, do you want me to start, or would you like to start? Either's fine. I'll, I'll just go. I'll, I'll take one minute of our time. 
Our students have suffered through the largest disruption to education to occur in generations, and they're still not done fighting through this. That said, Dr. De Silva and her team have put for us, before us a proposed budget increase of only 3.45%, a number so reasonable that if this board adopts, I would expect broad support from both the Board of Selectmen and the Board of Finance, as well as from the community as a whole. Our responsibility today and over the next few weeks is great. We must ensure that the budget we adopt meets the learning needs of Ridgefield students in an unprecedented time. Our decisions will affect the town's tax rate next year, sure, but they will also affect the trajectory of a generation. That's all. Okay, good morning, everybody, and welcome. Uh, thank you for spending your Saturday with us. It's uh, a little bit of a, a long day for many of you and um, certainly appreciate it. I hope that uh, all of you feel like this type of structure is beneficial. Uh, the intent is to have every cost center present today so that you could see the flow of the work that's done pre-K through 12 across our schools, across our curriculum areas, across facilities. So hopefully um, the structure allows us to do that in the best way possible. That said, if there's any feedback after today's uh, day, I certainly would wel welcome that for uh, shifts for next year. In terms of the expectations for today, the public and the Board of Education can expect each cost center to present. Generally speaking, they're in the order, this, the presentations are in the order of our book. Generally speaking, we have one little shift. Um, naturally, they're approximate times, so I would ask that folks be flexible and that some are probably gonna end later and some are going to be ending early, but we will finish today regardless of the time and get through all of our cost centers. I know our administrators are ready to be flexible and adaptable in terms of the time. We will for sure break um, at the time after the athletics presentation. So families who would like to take a lunch and certainly our board um, can expect that right after the athletics presentation, wherever you are, you'll know that that transition will allow us um, to take a break. Um, in terms of questions, we encourage them, ask as many as you'd like uh, in terms of structure of that. So we would hope that after each cost center, you can bring up questions related to that cost center. If you remember questions later that connect to a different cost center that already was already presented, that's fine. We'll do our best to answer them. If we can't answer them or we feel as if the answer may not be accurate or is not comprehensive enough. We will have a running Google doc that my colleagues and I will be typing on that we will have the question and then the answer. And so what we'll do is at our budget meeting or our board of education meeting on Monday night where we have the budget um, on the agenda, we will further discuss the questions that were per perhaps not answered tonight or may come over the weekend in some cases, we may need a little bit extra time, and so therefore they may come at a later time, but we'll have like one full Google Doc with all of the questions and the answers. Um, right now, we're thinking that we'll probably just have one document that will include the town questions that might come later, whether that's Board of Finance or Board of Selectmen, so that we can, our families and the public can find all the questions in one spot. And as time goes on, you can imagine that some of those might get repetitive so they can at least see the general theme. Um, let me see if there's anything else that I don't think I missed. Um, so again, Monday night, we have our uh, regular Board of Education meeting, budget is on the agenda. We have a public hearing meeting next Saturday. So we look forward to any comments or questions or thoughts about the budget. Um, we're proud of the budget that we're presenting this year. Um, I think that the presentation that uh, we shared a couple of weeks ago does show um, the responsibility that the leadership team has taken in creating what is a sound budget for this coming year and at the same time building a structure for future years and a foundation. So ultimately, again, I wanna thank Dawn and her team, cabinet and all of the cost centers who has spent a lot of time um, being thoughtful, mindful and responsible in creating uh, our budget that we'll present to you today. And now I'm gonna transition over to Dawn and Dawn is just gonna spend a few minutes going through the budget book, in particular for new board members and for the public, just so that everybody understands how the budget book is structured. Um, again, we're collecting feedback all along the way. So if there's feedback this year that you'd like us to consider into next year, 
please be sure to do that. Okay, so I think Dawn is gonna share her screen. Good morning, everyone. Let me see if I can get my screen. And so while she's doing that, if you have your budget book in front of you, she'll, she'll guide you in terms of what that budget book. Did that work? The book is yeah, structured. Yeah, it's working, Dawn. Okay. Um, one moment. All right, let's see. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for sharing your Saturday with us as we bring to light the Ridgeville Public Schools budget, proposed budget for 2021-22. I'm hoping that this morning's uh, review of the budget book will help you understand how the budget book is put together and how to best understand the contents of the budget book. For those who are viewing at home and don't have a budget book in front of you, uh, the proposed budget is on our website and the exact information that's in a budget book is on the website. Our budget book is set up into six different sections. Introduction is at the beginning of our budget book. This contains the Board of Education member information, mission, statement, vision of the graduate, the table of contents, and the superintendent's transmittal letter for the proposed budget. Following the introduction is an orientation to our budget book. This has some helpful areas, uh, a user guide and a glossary. The budget book starts with budget summary and some budget drivers. Following that are the individual schools and programs. Following that is the district-wide operations. And at the end of our book is the appendix. The appendix has some financials, a very high level summary, a full staffing and enrollment report, and some information on revenue that is shared, collected by the board but shared with the town and it, expenses that the town incurs that the Board of Education pays for. If you do have your budget book with you or if you're viewing online, if you could move to either scroll down or, or um, open to the user guide tab. The user guide includes definitions that are organized in specific categories meant to target areas of interest for the reader and support and understand the financial details that are in each of the tabs. I wanted to bring information to you about our accounting structure. Our accounting structure is set up with seven elements. The elements of each accounting structure is fund, function, object, location, goal, program, and objective. Within each of these elements gives us the ability to run reports, to uh, gather data, and to understand how best our financial ledger account is set up. The seven elements that we use are based on standards provided to us by the US Department of Education. In addition to the orientation section is a glossary tab. This glossary tab is a short list of common abbreviations that are used throughout the book and what those definitions are. To go through the accounting structure, I have an example of office supplies. If you turn to the third page in the user guide, in the user guide section, that starts the example of what the accounting structure is. 100, in this example of an accounting structure is general fund. The second element in this example is 2400. 2400 is the function. In this example, that's the principal's office services. Third element is probably the most known element, and that's the object. In this example, 6111 is the supplies and materials. 
The next element is the location. In this example, 11 indicates that this particular expense account is in Barlow Mountain. Each cost center department or, or organization is, has a specific location. The next element currently is not used, but is there for us to use should we need a different type of reporting uh, gathering of information, or we wanna use that for something in the future that we haven't uh, already broken our, our expenses out by. The next element, 96 in this example, indicates that it's the program offices. And the final element of our accounting structure is the objective. And in the, this example, it is objectives. You'll see that the objective uh, element is most often used throughout our budget book in the athletics uh, department. Our budget book uh, has a, after the user guide, as you get used to understanding the accounting of the budget book, starts with a budget section. The budget section includes a financial summary grouping by major categories, but it's shown at a very high level analysis of the proposed budget. There are two tabs in this section, the budget summary tab, the summary tab is a multi-year view of various aspects of our budget. The budget drivers tab is specific to the proposed budget and has a high level view of the major categories that is driving the increase or where most of our expenses are incurred for the proposed budget. It has two different breakouts. You'll see those. They're both based off of the object element and one, one is just a higher level grouping and then one has a little bit more detail in it. The final area within the budget drivers tab is an FTE addition and reduction that is specific to this proposed budget. Following the overall view of the, 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 the budget, there's the schools and program section of our budget book. This section starts with pertains to all elementary schools and pertains to all middle schools. These two areas are sheets, staffing, enrollment, and financials that pertain to either all the elementaries or pertains to both middle schools. Following these, this little section here, are the individual tabs for each of the schools. In each of the tabs, you'll see that there's a narrative for the school, a specific staffing and enrollment for that particular school, a financial sheet, and the financial sheet are identical throughout the entire book. They'll give you two years of actual, current year budget, and the proposed budget for next year. In each, of the, in each of the schools and programs section are the elementary schools, the middle school, both middle schools, the high school, and the athletics. After the viewing of the schools tabs is the district-wide tabs. This section pertains to the central office service department. Each department has its own tab and also starts with a narrative followed by staffing and enrollment for the specific department and the financials for the department. You'll see in some of the uh, departments, there is a new organizational chart. We hope that you find this organizational chart in these areas helpful. At the very end of our book is the appendix. There's three sections to the appendix. This section, the first section has a financial tab and it's a very summary level of the overall budget that follows the same financial sheets throughout the book. Two years of actual, the budget for this year, and the proposed budget for next year. This financial sheet is grouped by the object code. The second set in the appendix 
is the staff and enrollment section that you'll see throughout your entire book based on each of the tabs, but in one full report. The final uh, sheet that you'll see, the final tab in our budget book, is a collection of, of revenue that the Bridgeville Public Schools has collected but turned over to the town. In addition, it also shows town expenses that the Board of Education pays for. Thank you. Thank you, Don. Does anybody have questions about the book itself? Great. We can move right on into uh, the presentation on the elementary schools. Okay, I'm sharing my screen for the presentation, so. Can everybody see our presentation? Notes. Yeah, you still have speaker notes up. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Give me one second. Try that again. So while, while Becky's getting that started, uh, I'll just start off by thanking everybody um, for putting the most important part of the budget first, the elementary school budget. Um, we, we always appreciate that. Uh, and also just uh, thank you for the opportunity to discuss some of our priorities and, and work that makes up the elementary school and how it connects to the budget. Before we dig in though, I thought it'd be important that we just introduce ourselves. I'm Jamie Palladino, the principal of Ridgebury Elementary School. I'm Becky Loss. I am the principal at Barlow Mountain Elementary School. Good morning. Good morning, everyone. Keith Margolis, principal at Branchville Elementary School. Good morning. I'm Tracy Mayette, interim principal at Farmingville Elementary School. Good morning. I'm Jill Katkosen. I'm the principal at Scotland Elementary. And I'm Ellen Tuckner, principal at Veterans Park Elementary. Good morning. So our goal this morning is, is for you to get a better understanding of the foundation that our work is based off and how that work is connected to the budget. My colleagues will take you through some slides that touch upon the work of elementary schools. Then we'll go through slides that touch upon how they're connected actually to the budget. You'll also probably see some of these connections throughout your day with potentially the curriculum budget as well as SPED budget and, and other budgets. So as you go through these slides, uh, you may hear things like this come up throughout the day. Um, and so at this time, I want to turn it over to Mrs. Tuckner and she'll take us through some of that work. Good morning. Thank you, Jamie. Good morning, everyone. Uh, as Jamie said, the, our first few slides will be uh, kind of provide some context about our programming and resources to help give us uh, some um, understanding to what our budget covers. But we wanted to lead with this slide that uh, speaks to the complexity of teaching. And some of you may have seen this slide before. It does such a great job. Uh, I'm gonna read it just because it's so, it's so important to understand. Classroom teaching is perhaps the most complex, most challenging and most demanding, subtle, nuanced and frightened activity that our species has ever invented. The only time a physician could possibly encounter a situation of comparable complexity would be in the emergency room of a hospital during a natural disaster. And that's a quote from Lee Shulman, who's a psychologist. So we thought, um, we thought that was, sorry, Ellen, but we thought that was actually really important to share again this year um, as we're going through a pandemic and these hospitals are probably seeing these things as, as well as uh, our teachers doing all the different things. Uh, yes, yeah, so the, the, to bring it to life, um, can we go back to that slide a moment, um, Becky? To bring that to life is the idea of, think of 25 students in a classroom, all with 25 different academic and social emotional needs. Um, and a teacher has to um, understand what those are, assess what those are, plan for every one of those needs, uh, deliver engaging instruction around every one of those needs while she, he or she is balancing all the other things that are going on in the room behaviorally, um, and then um, deciding whether or not in every moment there's something that has to be addressed with regard to somebody's needs. And, and then on top of that, as Jamie just said, in this environment, um, we are balancing who's on the screen, who's in front of you. Some are on the screen every day, some are on the screen some days. 
it, and then get the materials for them. It's just a, a Herculean task that our incredible teachers manage every day. Um, and in order to make that a reality, the next slide speaks to um, all of the different components of elementary programming and resources that ultimately lead to our intention of the most, the highest possible achievement for our, for our children. So I'm gonna turn it over to um, Becky Loss to share a little more about that. Thank you, Ellen. So at, at elementary school, obviously, as Ellen is speaking to, we are very focused on achievement for all of our students through the interaction of curriculum and supports for all of our students as well as social and emotional well-being. So to that end, as Jamie had mentioned, the elementary school budget is influenced by, by a variety of facets of the budget, not just our elementary budget. So that in, could include technology. Um, it'll very much include the curriculum budget, which you'll hear about later today, um, it, which will include the continued support for math and balanced literacy, and will also include a district-wide systematic phonics program as part of that curriculum budget. So um, all students have access to appropriate experiences in learning experiences in Ridgefield Public Schools. So we use a multi-tiered system of support where children have access to a literacy interventionist or a math interventionist if need be. They have access to a variety of special educational needs um, from our RISE program to uh, students who are provided with related services. And it all comes together through our social and emotional learning. We're really focused on the whole child, not just academics. So we are implementing the ruler curriculum in all of our schools and using the responsive classroom approach to classroom management. And it provides personalized learning for all of our students. So they have access to technology, which is most important this year than it has ever been. It provides for, uh, for activities during extension block, which uh, might include uh, it might include extensions and it might include uh, reteaching experiences or sensory needs for our students who uh, who have who have needs under an accommodation plan or just for what works best for them. So. And at that point, I'm going to hand it over to Tracy to speak about how that all comes together in a budget. Great. So now connecting to our actual budget, our elementary team of six schools represents 9.8% of the overall Ridgefield public schools budget. This percentage includes the total of the six elementary pages in the budget book and it includes essentially the general education staffing at each school, along with materials and supplies necessary to run each school. So our elementary schools educate just over 1800 children up to grade five. To make up the school, there are many dedicated professionals who um, come together. So we'll just kind of highlight to, to give a little bit of explanation of the structure. Every school has one principal and a half-time elementary supervisor making up the administrators. And then depending on the school size, there are between 13 and 18 certified classroom teachers depending on enrollment at each school. Our specials team is made up of a half-time art teacher who teaches art classes to all of our students, a full-time library media specialist who teaches library media skills classes and runs the library media center along with some technology integration. We have a full-time PE teacher who teaches PE classes added in, to, um, added in with a 0 0.03 FTE for health lessons that are taught in the school. And that comes up to the um, to the 1.03 that you see in the budget book. We have a full FTE for general music teacher who teaches music classes to all of our students along with chorus and instrumental band lessons. And then added to that in the music department is a 0.3 strings teacher 
who teaches orchestra lessons to our students. Our academic support team consists of a literacy interventionist providing intervention services to students, as um, Becky referred to a moment ago, a literacy coach, and a math specialist who fulfills both the intervention and the, um, the coaching role in the field of math. Each school has supervisory paraprofessionals who supervise um, lunch and recess each day, and we have office and clerical staff. Who, um, who support the school functions as well. Our special education and related services team at each school is not part of the budget pages in the budget book um, for each school line, but they are captured in the special education and services um, section of the book that will be discussed later on today. However, these staff are in our building uh, each day and round out our ranks. So um, just to give you an idea to, to have the full picture. So that includes our special education teachers, psychologists, speech and language pathologists, um, tutors, paraeducators. And then um, as Becky mentioned, four of our schools do house the district RISE program, the Ridgefield Intensive Special Education Program. So um, we have additional staff um, for those as well. So this is who makes up our elementary schools and supports our students each day. We're going to um, take you through, we do have one staffing request related to the budget for next year. So we'll explain that in more detail. For the 21-22 school year, the elementary schools are requesting an increase in hours for our supervisory paraprofessionals. These individuals support our students for one hour daily during lunch and recess. The model we budgeted for this year would have resulted in each paraprofessional supporting approximately 180 students daily. Our proposed model was used this year due to COVID mitigation measures, resulting in paraprofessionals supporting approximately 60 students instead. As we've observed this year, the increase in the staff will have a direct impact on the physical and social emotional safety of our students with significant reduction in recess behavioral challenges. The end result of increasing adult support made it possible for one adult to support one class per grade level, which allowed schools to maintain lunch by grade. This model will allow for one adult to build and maintain relationships with students in a classroom, supporting the overall social emotional climate, as well as reducing behavioral instances during these less structured time. My colleague Keith Margolis will now discuss the breakdown of our elementary budget. Thanks, Jill. Uh, as you may have noticed a couple of slides ago, Tracy outlined uh, the elementary budget proportion to the overall request, uh, making up about 10% or 9.8. We're gonna take a moment to drill down, drill down and bring life to some of the account lines that you'd find in the budget book. Uh, we're gonna drill down to more broadly uh, the category of materials and I'll, I'll unpack that in a moment. It uh, makes up about four tenths or more accurately, I believe it's 63 hundredths of the overall budget at a sum of $376,088. Becky, if you'd switch. Go ahead, Becky. Not bad. No problem. There you go. To complement uh, your budget book, uh, we thought that we'd collapse some lines. I'll break out the lines in, in a moment. This is uh, the average of the spending categories collapsed for an elementary school budget. You may note that if you take a look at the school books, I'll describe that in a moment in instructional materials, it makes up about nine, and well, it makes up 90% of our budget. Again, I'll break out those lines, but broadly speaking, school books uh, make up our classroom libraries. They're the lifeblood of an elementary school uh, to teach reading and writing. Uh, students need access to high quality literature. At minimum, uh, an elementary classroom needs 400 to 700 books. So. Our school books, uh, yes, we have a classroom, uh, a library in the school, in each of our schools. School books also exist in our classroom libraries. I'll talk more about it in a moment. Instructional materials, uh, broadly speaking, is consumables and non-consumables. So this is sort of a really high level view of how uh, the lines look if you combine them. Becky, if you could push ahead, thank you. 
So this resembles what you'd see in your budget book that uh, by way of example, instructional materials, we also have instructional materials, art, music, PE, reading. Let me dig into the broad category of instructional materials. A moment ago, I mentioned consumables and non-consumables. So our consumables are the items, right? Of course, that we have to buy year over year. Tape, pencils, paper, a variety of kind of papers, a paper that we need in say a, a first grade room. Year over year, we need to make those purchases, post-it notes, things of that nature. In addition to that, uh, we need to purchase items like easels. Certainly not every elementary classroom every year uh, are we buying a new easel for, but you know, Branchville, we're probably buying two, maybe on a, on a bigger year, four uh, easels uh, to replace those that have over time, over many years have become tattered. So those are captured in that instructional material budget. Similarly, art and music have their consumables year over year. Um, physical education, while there aren't as many consumables, cones, certainly basketballs, things of that nature, need to be replaced year over year. Um, by way of example, you know, we're slowly over time at, at Branchville, replacing mats and things of that nature that come with a, a heftier cost. You may note some variation between schools on some of these lines. Let me speak to that for a moment. Uh, one, you may note that there's different populations uh, at each school, and to some degree, um, that explains part of the variation. In addition to that, every year we're looking closely at what supplies we may need uh, in our own schools. Uh, for example, I'll come back to school books, right? Year, as I outlined a moment ago, four to 700 minimum in a classroom library. Uh, those books need to be weeded, meaning there's going to be tattered books. They're shared. A, a element, a first grader has, you know, four to seven books in, in their book bin every week. Um, they return to the library, they're, they're passed out. So we look at just simple re replacements. Uh, and so each of our buildings sort of assess that, that need. It can uh, account for some of the variation. Or there may be a, a type of uh, special purchase, if you will, at Branchville. We're looking at high reader, I'm um, sorry, high interest, low readability books, meaning we want to invest in books for students who are older, who are having a bumpy time, so that the books they're reading, honestly, they, they look more mature. They're uh, easily accessed, so they're uh, high readability, uh, high interest, but lower readability. So each of us are assessing that in our own buildings, and that sort of variation plays uh, out across the other budget lines. Uh, at the end of this presentation, we're more than happy to unpack and, and talk more about that. Um, so we'll now uh, pass it back to Jamie. So we always try to pride ourselves in trying to anchor our work and our priorities back into the Ridgefield mission as well as the vision of the graduates. Um, so whenever we're moving through the budget cycle, we're always bringing it back to these two documents to make sure that our work fits there. So hopefully you were able to see some links to both of those. But at this time, we'd be happy to open it up to any questions that you may have. Who wants to start us off? Tina? Okay. Um, first of all, I want to thank you all. I think it was great. Thank you for a quick snapshot. Thank you for all that you do for elementary schools. Uh, I'm not in elementary, but I know most of you, so I know it's been a hard work. Uh, I can never imagine my child being in elementary and going through the pandemic. So thank you all for all that you're doing. Um, I'm gonna address the elephant in the room. I'm gonna ask about art. Um, I, I mean, I've been hearing about the uh, cut in art teachers. I understand last year there was a cut because of, the, because of COVID, because of the reality of the budget and the way the Board of Finance suggested for this cut. So it was beyond our hand, uh, it was beyond the Board of Education's hand. It was just a forced hand, I would say. Um, we are, uh, parents want art back. And I wanna ask why, is it reflecting our values? I saw that you mentioned, we focus on the entire child. We're talking about social emotional learning and many parents feel that art is one factor of that. You know, um, Many believe that equitable exposure and introduction to the, all the known non-core subjects essential for our community and our parents, and we should reflect that in a budget. We will never know whose life can be enhanced by art, and if we take that away, 
Is that like we're shortchanging our children? So that's my first question. I mean, I have a bunch of them, but this is the most important one because you've seen, I'm sure you've seen the petition, you've seen the comments, we've read the emails, parents are passionate about it. So is there a reason we're not talking about introducing the other three our teachers? So Tina, why don't we just do one question at a time? Who on the elementary wants to take that one? So I can, I can start to address that and then anyone can jump in um, for anything further. Um, reducing the art um, staffing was, was not a request, um, you know, that was made throughout the budget process last year. It, um, you know, as you, as you mentioned, it, it was a, a reaction to some pretty um, tight um, budgetary decisions that had to be made very late in the season. All of our students do receive art, so um, it, it has not taken away art access um, for students. In terms of really evaluating the specials and where we could make, um, you know, cuts um, last April, May at the end of the budget season, you know, we really had to look at if there was any flexibility within the the specials areas to reduce the amount of FTE and still provide, you know, as much experience to students as we could. In in terms of you know looking at library media or music, there are other components with direct service time to students that we wouldn't be able to, um, to cut down on. But in terms of art, there was some, um, you know, thinking that perhaps we could combine schools and still provide art to all students, but, um, you know, make use of the, um, the timing between some of our larger and smaller schools. So we did, um, you know, we were forced to, to make that decision last year. Um, certainly everyone on the elementary team absolutely supports art education and wants that for our students. We may have to, to revisit after this year, which is very atypical. And um, we, know, we know that all of our specials classes have been impacted by the, the needs of the school year. So it's definitely something that we might want to relook at and revisit after living through a typical year but I just want to make very clear that all of our students do receive art education. Tracy, can I, can I follow up on that a little bit? Um, so can you explain a, a little bit more? I think you just, you just touched on it that you did look at, at the other um, specials. And so when I'm just looking at straight the budget, we have eight FTEs for music. If you count six for music and two for instrumental yet only three for art. And, and sort of from my broad understanding of music and art, music, the art applies to, to, to I, I would see an impact to more students through art. Ken, you may have gotten cut off a little bit there. I'm not sure if that was just over on my side. No, it's Ken, everywhere. We didn't hear the last part of your question. I dropped. You're back. Okay, I'm sorry. It was more, it was more the, I know that you did the analysis and I would just like to hear a little more detail about why the, that the, we need eight FTEs for music yet only three for art to accomplish, you know, the, 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 the exposure for our students. So the, you know, the music FTEs represent general music classes, just like art has, you know, general art classes. Mm -hmm. the music FTEs also represent the, the band and chorus time that is offered to our students, as well as the instrumental orchestra and ensemble time that is offered to our students. So the, the music FTEs capture much more than just the, the general classes. Whereas when we're talking about art, you know, we're really looking at the, the general art classes on um, what are taught. So sure, we have, is, have those additional is, components in there so that, you know, is, is why the, the numbers are different. Well, as I understand also that though the art program does encompass more than just the general classes. There, there are art shows, there are arts in the hallway, there are, so, so while it may not be as structured as say a band concert, an art show, I mean, just I, I, by I don't have any kids in elementary school right now, but that was always, again, one of the highlights was walking through the, the hallway and seeing all, all of the art presentations. And, and to be fair, I did attend one music um, 
you know, I guess I'll call it a concert that he did. Um, you know, I think it was the art that, that really stood out for him. And um, I'm just wondering, it just, it seems like there's more emphasis being put on the music than the art. They're both equally important. I'm just curious how we decided that one was more important than the other. So I, I, I don't want to, to tie this into importance at all because they're both very important. Um, but it, in terms of, you know, us looking at the contact time with students, you know, and, and what could be possible in terms of scheduling and, and being able to, to provide that to all students. That's what we really had to look at. Fully acknowledging that our art teachers offer so much to our schools and it is a huge culture change, you know, to go from a, a full-time art teacher in a building to a half-time art teacher. Um, it certainly isn't something that anybody desired um, or wanted in terms of making that change. But unfortunately, when you get to a point where the, you know, the, the, the budgetary needs are the way they are in terms of cutting. Oh, absolutely. You, you, absolutely. And, and there's, you can see in, in terms of the budget, there's not much there in terms of um, doing that. And we do know that, you know, with slightly different size schools across the elementary landscape, we know that there were some inconsistencies in terms of a larger school and a smaller school in terms of how much that art teacher could provide in terms of those extras that don't get captured in, in okay. um, class numbers. And, and, and understand, so is, would, it be, would it be possible to look at, um, you know, I'm an accountant by trade, so I like to, I like to see things. So is, is, there, is there some way that you can, because I, I presume that you did it when you made the decision to, to cut art, that you, um, some analysis of the contact hours. I mean, I think you just mentioned it, that, that, that you did look at that. Is there, is there um, some kind of documentation that, that can be shared with us that, that would show that so that we can be made, so that we can understand the analysis that went in. And so, um, and if I can you know, give us a clear picture. If I can just jump in, the elementary principals do have that. They have the instructional minutes, not only in the special areas, but also in the um, content areas laid out by um, obviously by school and by very specific how many minutes and again that doesn't include assemblies sure. and transitions and you know someone just spilled their milk and it took us 50 right. minutes <laughs> could not, yeah. over somebody so yep. they have done that work which we're glad to actually link to um, to the question and the answer document that we'll put on our website okay. also important to note just another piece is that we are having a presentation on March 8th around the special areas. We have a new assistant okay. superintendent coming in. So I think it's a good time to publicly, um, not just in a document, but bring that document to life a bit. Yeah, um, of course. Explain not only the special areas, but again, those content areas, there's only so many hours in the day. So yeah. how is that day, What you know, how is that day broken up and how are we devoting it? Um, and ultimately, I think just a one, one other piece to what Tracy said, and is it, because what Tracy was, was describing is real in that, Music has their general music classes as we have our general art classes, but then they have their very specific chorus classes and their very specific band classes. And so, yes, then there's the concerts and all that come with music, just like there's art shows and all that come with art, but those were very specific classes that were, we were required, right? Or we have always given our kids and that was a consistent experience, let's just say for chorus for fifth grade. And so when they looked at that holistically, and they had to make a decision um, that that seemed to be the best decision possible. That's not to say that there isn't a time for a discussion around a curriculum discussion around what is the value of, of Richfield? What do we value, right? What would we like to see more of and perhaps less of? Um, because something's got to give, right? If there's right. four hours a day, what do we want to see more of? What do we want to see less of? And then it's our obligation to reflect those values in our budget. Um, but I do think that it needs to be a part of a broader conversation that brings Absolutely. all of into place. And, and, you know, the principals obviously cared very much about their art teachers and, and, and the program. Yeah, um, they all, were, all, the program. all of the programs, they were forced mm -hmm. to make a decision. In some ways it was um, as a result of the budget, but as I think many board members know, this wasn't, it was certainly new to me because I was coming in April, but it wasn't new to the superintendents of the past. I think art, the art program was something that was considered as a, a reduction for a number of years, primarily because it's it was a um, very uh, 
school-based decision, meaning you have one faculty member per school, regardless of the size of the school, right? So if I'm, just briefly, if I'm an art teacher at Veterans Park, I'm teaching 13 sections. Let's say I'm at Ranchville, I'm a different art teacher, I'm teaching 18 sections. If I'm the Veterans Park art teacher, I have a lot more time for preparing for those art shows and all of the great contributions that our, our kids and our teachers offer. But I also have extra time, maybe or maybe not, if I use it this way, to offer other programming. That may not be the case at that other school with 18 sections. Right. And so we have to be careful if we're gonna make a decision one for one in a budget discussion, because it's not necessarily gonna provide the equity that I would imagine. And I know that I will be advocating for across mm -hmm. every content area in our school district when you have six elementary schools. Yeah, uh, well, uh, on, the, on the thing of equity, I think. Oh, Ken, you froze again. Ken, you freeze whenever you have a great question. Or a we need to go fund me to get Ken an internet connection. <laughs> Logic apply. Oh, okay. That, that a music teacher at, at, a, at a larger school is going to have more sections than a music teacher at a smaller school? The same, lo the same logic would apply, but we know that that assured program is offered. Okay. Sure. And these, so that person is likely going to have uh, less extra time, right, for, for preparing for a concert. Um, and, and that's part, that's the nature of, of an elementary teacher, without a doubt. Right. But those assured experiences are there. Um, and so it's not like they're producing extra necessarily, but sure. the assured experience and they're tighter and they're far tighter schedules. Um, again, could we have cut maybe, yes, maybe a veterans park, we could have cut, it, you know, a little, right. But not in the same way and not as cleanly. And ultimately maybe clean isn't what we need here. Maybe we need, you know, one, a teacher that's working across one building a little bit more time, three and a half days and one working in another building because we're a six day schedule sure. and a half sure. so that it may not be as clean as we created this year again this isn't a typical year right. um, so you know i think it's worth we all value the art program I, you know i came from two other districts where it was just as important as it as it is here and we all want to see it as a part of our school not just in a traditional class but but outside of that but what that looks like is the part of the work that we haven't done and isn't reflected in this budget I understand, and 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 also I and I might be mixing this up too, but the, this the budget, um, the cuts were made because of COVID, but but I think the 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 cuts to the art, as you pointed out, has been something that has been been sort of an ongoing theme, and so I, I just think that that's important that we remember that too. It's not just in response to to the pandemic. This is something that's been um, sort of ongoing. So yes, the Board of Finance made a cut to the Board of Education budget. Yes. I'm, I'm going to gather that that was partly <laughs> reflective of COVID. Yes. Um, I don't know what they would have cut if COVID had not hit. Maybe they would have cut the exact same amount. Exactly. We would have been in the exact same position. The right. art teachers, for sure, was a discussion point for many years. And so, right. unfortunately, for me, it had to be my first month. But, right. but ultimately, it was a discussion for many years. So yes. again, I'm not sure that it's as black and white as one for one. It may be something more formula driven. The programs that I know were offered in some of the schools are clearly very valued. And so we don't want to lose things that our community and our families and our kids appreciate. So how can we look at this whole, and we may be able to do it within the model we have, the three, or we may not be. Um, and I, I do think it's an opportunity for all of us to come together and say, okay, let's take a real big look and then let's dive down and, and reflect what matters to our community. Yeah, ab absolutely. And that's, and that, uh, let's take that detailed look. Um, because I, I, I would, uh, because again, I know, I know, like you mentioned chorus, for example, and that's very important to the fifth graders. And that, that absolutely is where an, an, uh, an art program touches K through five. So I, I mean, so just using that one very simple example, that 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 art teacher or that portion of an art teacher would, or the equivalent, um, would would impact an entire elementary school of students versus one class of student, one grade of students. So that that that's the kind of that's the analysis that I would like to see. And again, I, I know it, it, the numbers are important to me, and I know it's just, it's just as important to bring life to those numbers. But um, it just personally, um, and, and I, I think there are other people with similar minds that, that would like to see that. Um, 
So thank you. I know you, you said you were going to present that, but provide that, but thank you. Before we go off of this, so the presentation on March in March is going to be after our budget uh, vote, correct? Yeah. And March 8th, that'll be, I don't, if I look at the Board of Education meetings, the soonest we could, um, I think we have one on the 22nd as well. And then uh, sooner we wouldn't have the new assistant superintendent. Well, be our first day here on February. <laughs> <laughs> if we felt like we wanted to do that, it, you know, I'm at the board. But but, but we could get but we could get the the numbers that underlying data we could get that well before that i Absolutely. presume yeah okay we can, maybe we can, we can circle that. back to this question on monday night as well sure and we'll link that formula right onto the the document with the question so it could be publicly seen as well thank you to add on to that i'm sorry just uh, because ken stated something i didn't know it's uh, you have given us instructional hours and i saw them very clearly but what we don't have i when i'm hearing this every child in every school gets music how often every week does everyone get band how often every week does everyone get chorus and how often every week does everyone get strings to see did that I, broken did someone get cut off or i can't hear anyone oh. i hear kathleen i heard kathleen is it me that, that time it was you oh, it's me okay <laughs> it's usually me so. so basically i know everyone gets general music every week in a six-day cycle how often does everyone get chorus? How often does everyone get banned? How often does everyone, because I, I, I've seen the instructional hours and reading and all of that, but not those. Can you hear me uh, now or no? I, can't, I hear you. Yeah, I can't hear anyone. Oh dear. Okay, Dr. so Ms. technical Ms. difficulty for me. So I'm gonna try to log off and log back on. I think the principals heard me, right? Yeah, Kathleen, we, we heard you. Um, you know, one of the things that we've talked about is this is a, a typical year and it's somewhat hard to gauge on that because for instance, chorus, we can't put 50 kids in a room and have them singing. So therefore chorus isn't happening. Um, band, we're trying to reduce numbers of kids in a room and spread them out. So therefore they may end up seeing more groups. So I think one of the things that we, we look at is how many sections each teacher would have. So while Ken, you talked about only fifth grade getting chorus, well, that doesn't really make a, a decision based on you know where a cut could come from but that's an additional section and it's actually fourth and fifth grade so that's two additional sections every six days that teacher needs to have, have in their schedule band numbers kind of fluctuate if, if we have a lot of kids that really want band they're going to have multiple classes you know up to up to nine ten classes within a six-day rotation if we have less kids with band um, that want to take band those numbers may be reduced um, so I, I think it's a great question. I think we can get those numbers to you. I think it's better off if we actually get those numbers in twofold, kind of a COVID year and maybe a non-COVID year. Oh, non-COVID, yeah, for sure. Yeah. Yeah, both and, years. And, and I think even when we look at our art data, right, it, it's hard to it's hard to say the impact that that the cut has had on us, because these art teachers are on carts going into the classroom. We've had to reduce these minutes for all kids because we need to give them time to prep and 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 get from one place to another. Um, so, so I think it's better off if we look at a non-COVID year, uh, because it's not a fair uh, for anybody to, to say this is the year and, and this represents the cuts, because this this art yeah. program, music program, PE program doesn't represent any other year prior. So, and and that brings up a good question to me is so this, these budgets are they they're they're given that we're going to have a we we lost you again. Lost I think you, you were, I think yeah. you were saying these budgets are represented as if we're going to have a, a, a typical year next year. Um, uh, yeah, I think I think that's the plan. Although when we put in the elementary supervisors, we realized that we still may need to cohort in the fall with our kids. Um, so that was another reason why we put those supervisors for for lunch recess in, knowing that that if we still have to cohort. But regardless, those would have been put in anyway, even if we were back to a typical year. Sorry, I think Ken, I'm going to pause you for a second because I know Nora and Liz both had their hands up for a few times here. Uh, Liz? Yeah, thanks, Jonathan. Um, so just a couple of points. Susie, you said earlier that the Board of Finance cut the budget. They actually just reduced the increase. So I just want to make sure we're not talking about that they cut last year's budget because there is a public viewing here to clarify that. But then the second thing on the art, what I would ask is as you come back, not just look within the schools on these. I mean, it's clear from our community that 
Ridgefield values our art program. That's already decided. We don't need to debate that. We don't need to deep dive on that. We've heard from more constituents across all of us on multiple occasions through multiple channels that this cut isn't working, right? That they're concerned that we're losing the feel of the Ridgefield public schools, not our other cohorts and places we were before. This is about Ridgefield. And so I think as you'll hear from this board and you've heard from many of us, this is important to our community. And so I think we need to come up with options that tell the community what we will trade off to get the art program back in the elementary schools. This isn't about, well, you know, we're gonna try to take an hour from VP and put it at Barlow and change the percentages. It's literally our parents do not want art on a cart. They want a full art program because Ridgefield is an arts community. And you guys know I'm super fiscally conservative. I don't wanna see a huge increase. I respect that you came back with a 3% plus increase. I think that's absolutely appropriate. And I respect every single person on this phone for coming back with that kind of reality budget. I just think we need to look holistically at administrative costs and other overhead bureaucracy stuff and cut that out to get our art program back to our kids because that's where our money belongs for our community. So I would just ask that as we talk about this on Monday night or whenever, that we reflect that our Ridgefield community is an arts community. We value this program. We think it's a critical part of our community. Whether they have an hour of music and an hour of art, it almost doesn't matter. Art is a part of the fabric of Ridgefield. So I would just ask you guys to come back and say, what are we going to trade off, right? What are the trade-offs? And let the community hear that. Let the parents hear that. Let us hear it. And I wouldn't take it from another classroom. I'd take it from somewhere else in the budget. So just some, or, you know, say, hey, here's what it's gonna cost if we do that. That would be my ask. So I'm glad to present whatever the board asks us to, to try to figure out. So my question then would be to the board is, are you looking for, because currently, so I think this is an important piece to me, and I don't wanna go down too far into the curriculum rabbit hole, but in, in the past, there were programs that were being offered in some of our schools and not in others. So for example, Art Leap, that's a program that I think you've heard in the communications we've had from our families. That was not consistently applied in our six schools. That's one. The second program that I believe that families have described is perhaps um, Art to the Rise program. So we know that that happens in four of our schools, not six of our schools. So from what I understand, and there was an extra, let me just say this, there was an extra, and our elementary principals can chime in, there was an extra art class basically every trimester. So a group of children would have in each trimester an extra session of art. Is that accurate, elementary principals? Yes. Okay. Okay, so if the charge is to go back and create a schedule that was here before this reduction this past spring, we didn't have a consistent schedule. I'm glad to create, and with the support of my colleagues and hopefully some art professionals, right? A schedule that makes sense, that reflects the values of the district. But I, I wouldn't be completely transparent if I wasn't saying it was not consistently applied. And I'm not, I'm not saying that the consistency problem can't be solved. It can be, but it can be yeah. solved through a method other than art on the cart, if we're gonna reflect the community for which we serve, right? That's what I'm saying. And I'm not, to your point, I'm not gonna get into the curriculum. That is the experts on the phone here that run elementary schools and, and yourself and run curriculum. The inconsistency problem was solved by splitting a teacher time. And perhaps that was the wrong decision. And we need to revisit it and understand what the trade-offs of that decision are, as we've heard very clearly from our elementary constituents, as well as beyond that, and I think we've gotten the letters to the Board of Ed. I've certainly heard it individually. I'm sure many of us have as well, that we're asking for another option as well because it reflects the values of the Ridgefield community. And we promise that we heard the people that we serve too. And that's what we're asking. And I'm not yeah. saying go backwards, Dr. De Silva. That's not what, this isn't in a, a let's go back to what we had and have it inconsistent. This is lay out what the programs are and what a consistent model could look like that still allows for an appropriately invested in art program that yep. doesn't say I got one person doing 600 classes. I've got art in a cart and I can't do clay and I can't do this and I can't do that. And because those are the trade-offs, that's not a, that's not an art program that certainly my kids went through even in their short time in the elementary schools. And I think that our parents expect more than that. Dr. I don't think, I don't think anybody's looking to go back to where we were yeah. to an inequitable art no. solution. Um, but maybe there's something else that 
that three teachers can't do, but four or five, maybe, I don't even know if it would have to be six, but some other way to get back to a, to a higher level of, of art access, equitably applied is what, what the board would be generally looking to see. May I just clarify one part of, of what Liz shared? Is that okay? Is it about the cart? It is. So <laughs> on a cart this year, our specials are on carts because we are not having students share spaces within the building. So the art on a cart, um, our music is on a cart and it's pushing into classrooms as well, as is our library media specialist. So, and Liz, I know I'm not, I'm not um, disputing. No, well, that's a great like, clarification. I'm Thank you. I just clarify yeah. that all our specials with the exception of PE are on a cart and they're pushing into classrooms so that we could keep our students cohorted in the same space. Right. We do hope that in the coming years as we, um, um, are no longer in a COVID environment, that that won't be the case. But I just do want to clarify that art is not on a cart because of the cut, rather just because of our, our mitigating measures for COVID. That's a great, that's, that's a great important. clarification. Thank you. Yeah. You're Thank welcome. You. Okay, I think I captured, I understand what Liz and the board is asking us to do. Could I add one thing? Nora? Yeah, I just wanted to add, I definitely agree with everything that Liz said. Um, but also, if you're in an elementary school, certainly if you're teaching in one, but if you know elementary schools, I don't think that, I think that the issue of equity is, is existent in every elementary school. So in a classroom, I mean, the classroom next door, you know, will have a different number of special ed kids, a different number of kids with 504 plans, a totally different makeup. There is very little equity from classroom to classroom in an elementary school. So I think that the issue of equity is, is sort of a moot point in the sense that the elementary schools need an art teacher. It was billed last year to us as a temporary reduction. And I do believe that Ridgefield is um, is speaking up and we need that. And I think it's realistic to our program will look exactly the same. That's just the way it is because every school is a little different. And I think that is a big piece of it. Also, the fact that um, it's been discussed for years and that every student is receiving art um, is fine to say, but the truth is the quality is not there. And so I do believe strongly that that needs to be discussed. And I also just want to raise, although it doesn't need to be addressed right now, but the justification for an elementary uh, director of curriculum, another administrative position, high level, um, how the justification for that um, over art teachers and at the expense of some class sizes um, is an issue, I think that needs to be discussed. Tina, and then Rachel. Um, just to follow up on what Nora said. Um, yeah, I agree. I mean, you know how I feel about art by now. Uh, but I also want to talk, I mean, not now, but um, as we look into the future, equity, we keep talking about equity, but we've never addressed, and we've said this millions of times, but the later elementary times. I, I think these children have been shortchanged for years, but we've never talked about. Of course, this is not a usual year. There's so many changes. We don't know what the fall will look like, but I do think we have to talk about the inequity. Oh, sorry, about the later school times, right? The kids who do go home in the dark, and how that affects their families and everything. We never talk about it. I think we should be talking about it, and as we look into the future, we should be talking about the class sizes because, and I said it when the projections were the class sizes were there, and I do understand it's a fluid moment. It depends on where people buy houses. But we do need to look at how our elementary class sizes are and how the feeder patterns go into middle school. So obviously it's not a time for discussion now, but as Nora has pointed out, we have to look for the future and plan this into our budget because I don't see this in our budget right now. Uh, so that's just a quick follow up. So just, I just wanna be sure that we don't miss anything, Tina. So that I think what you're asking from me and or the board chairs to talk about at some point school start times at the elementary level and class size guidelines. Yes. And feeder patterns. And feeder patterns, yes, thank you. 
Rachel, I know you were up next. So I think you all know where I stand on the art conversation, because um, I've been vocal about that before. Um, so can I move on to two other questions I have for the elementary schools if we're done with the art conversation? Please. Okay. So my question is around class size projections at the elementary level. Uh, there has been recent communication around the class sizes at Barlow Mountain Elementary School, specifically second grade. Please clarify for us, what is the current number of sections on the second grade level? Are there any other current grades among our elementary schools where there was a section reduction from the anticipated projections this year? And can it be assumed that we will maintain all projected sections for next year among our elementary schools? I do think it's important to keep the class sizes relatively lower, um, especially during COVID, so teachers can support our students more. That's my first part. Sure, so I can begin uh, by answering part of your question, which would be our current number of students and sections at Barlow Mountain. So we currently have uh, 51 students enrolled in second grade. We started our year with uh, we started our year with 48 students, and uh, we had some enrollment throughout the year. So one one of our courses has 25. I'm sorry, one of our sections has 25, and the other has 26. At which point, uh, when 20 when the 26 student enrolled, we did hire a pair a full time paraprofessional to support in that classroom. Um, so, so it is my understanding, though I was not here in the spring last year, that we were budgeted for three sections at which time there were more students enrolled, children left, children came back, and, um, and, that's, how, and that's how that rolled out. But, you know, I definitely can certainly assure you that currently at Barlow, when we think about mitigating measures and distancing among our students, uh, with the number of students in our classroom, I, I have assured that we're safely distanced. Um, all students are, are getting what they need. And most definitely our teachers, not just our second grade teachers, are trained and equipped and, and very talented and able to continue to meet the needs of all of those students in second grade. So I can say, I can say without a doubt that that everybody's getting what they're need, they're getting what they're needing. So, you know, when it comes to sections for next year, we are uh, we currently have fifty one students in first grade. Um, I know the numbers in the budget book reflect our our what was happening on October first or our enrollment on October first. So at this point, we have fifty or I'm sorry, 51 students in first grade, and we are budgeted for three sections going into second grade next year. So um, I don't know if Karen wants to add, or maybe Karen, for just the public's benefit, can you just uh, describe the class size guidelines, K-5? Sure. And then sure. I'll I'd be happy to, Dr. De Silva. Um, so right now, the current class size guidelines are for K and one, a maximum of 21 students in a class, for grade two, a maximum of 24, and for grades three through five, a maximum of 25. So we do monitor our actual enrollments all summer long so that until right when um, parents receive notification of who their student's teacher will be, we adjust accordingly to our actual registration. So um, for example, at Barlow, they had not exceeded our class size guidelines in August. Therefore, we staffed um, accordingly at the two sections. I do wanna make one clarification to what Becky just said. The um, enrollment projections in the budget are not actuals from October 1. They are the enrollment projections from our demographer, Malona McBroon. So every November they present to the Board of Education their projection of what our enrollment should be by grade, by class for next year. And that is how we determine our staffing allocation at the elementary level in the budget. And, and on that point, um, our enrollment projections also said that we could see an incredibly large kindergarten class. Um, and then also children coming back from homeschooling are we prepared to hire more teachers and support staff if need be? Would there be funds to do that? Um, so the budget right now does not include any what we call contingency teachers if a class should break. 
Um, it is solely based upon, um, so Malone and McBruin did suggest that we use their medium projection numbers, not their high or their low, um, to uh, safeguard to some extent against that from happening. Um, however, uh, outside of that, there's no other contingency in the budget if we break. But that said, Rachel, when we break, we break. So in other words, so long as that happens prior to, um, and Karen, remind me what the cutoff is here. Is it just when it, teachers receive their class? It's letters? pretty much uh, as soon as those letters are going to go out, we establish a date with the principals of that prior week. So a few days before so that we can make any adjustments if needed. So, but it's as late in August as possible. And that, that's a little bit unique to Ridgefield. And I think that's primarily because we don't have the contingency piece to, to play a role. But one of the challenges that you described is real in that, and, and it actually it kind of impacts the earlier conversation of art or special education or you know, children with learning differences that come into our district. And what I mean by that is our, our current budget is based off of those numbers that Karen just described. And so let's just say that um, those enrollments are off, right? And up until the week that, a week prior or so that um, our families receive their teacher's name and their class lists, all of a sudden a class breaks on the opposite end, on the higher end. And we have to go find the money, right? To hire that teacher. Or if a child comes in to district with learning differences that are significant, let's just say, then we either need to increase special education teachers or perhaps hire um, an additional para, or if it's not a student that has an IEP and it's a student that's in general education, but let's say receiving response to intervention or MTSS as we call it, it could mean that it could mean that, that teacher's caseload is incredibly tight, right? In that particular school, if they already have a lot of students in, um, in their classroom that are receiving support. To go back to even Nora's point about sometimes that's just the, the way things balance themselves out in a particular school or in a particular class or in a particular grade level. Um, but what I think families need to know is that we use those class size guidelines. And if we end up breaking after the start of the school year, then we add a paraprofessional to support the classroom teacher. Again, that's unbudgeted, right? Because we didn't know that that's the way, the direction in which it might have gone unless we did, unless we actually, like in Barlow Mountain's case, we anticipated we were gonna have three sections, we actually had two. And so therefore we hired a, a paraprofessional because it happened after the start of the school year. And I'm sure that there are very few parents and or children that would want a change of classroom uh, in the month of October, November, December, let's just say. Um, but it is, that's a, a, a real challenge. It's a separate discussion. If you wanna look at class size guidelines and you heard Karen share them with you, and what the budget impact would be if we were to decrease class size in any one of those grade levels or increase class size in any one of those grade levels. Um, but I think that they are two distinct conversations because if you don't, if you don't start with the class size, you're in a position of, you know, I hate to use the word equity again, but a position where it's not fair, right? In one school, they have less kids and more teachers and another school, not. So it sounds to me like the, the administration is consistency, consistently applying the board's class size guidelines. So can, separate we, from the budget, we can have another, we can have an agenda item later on this year to review and potentially ask for a revision to our to the board's own class size guidelines. That's one possibility. And the other, the other conversation that this board may want to have at some point, it's not in this budget um, intentionally because it is a very, very tight budget. It's not in this budget, but is, is contingency a discussion that we wanna have, right? Is, should we be running a budget that's so tight that we have to pull from Peter to pay Paul in those unusual years or usual years where there's a lot happening in our, in our schools um, and with our children? And, and again, whether that's in general education, MTSS, whether that's through special education or whether that's you know with other special areas that may require additional points here, points there. Good point. And I just have one more thing, Jonathan, if we're okay. Sure. So um, thank you, Dr. De Silva. Um, across all six elementary schools, the budget stays flat among instructional material, supplies, school books, and library collections with any increase offsetting by other deductions. The only increase I see is in the salary line. So this seems to be a very lean budget 
across our six elementary schools. As leaders in our schools, you have faced one of the greatest health crises as far as I can, and as far as I can see, you have shown bravery in leading your schools and supporting our children and families. We've also seen our teachers dive into a new teaching age with different responsibilities. And with all of that supporting the health and safety, mental health and academic needs of our children. So on the heels of that, I do ask you, if you were asked to increase your individual budgets, is there anything you would add or wanna see in terms of academic or mental support moving forward for next year? I understand that there are pieces in the curriculum and professional development budgets for next year, um, as you spoke about earlier, but I'm just interested, is there anything that you feel that you really need that's not included? Well, I think that was a wish list question, so I'll, I'll, let, I'll let the elementary principals jump in. Not necessarily a wish list question, but a question, does this budget provide what our students will need next year? Correct. I'm going to let our elementary principals, any one of you or all six of you can jump in. Not all at once. Sorry, uh, I, I don't mind starting. I mean, R Rachel, thank you for, for uh, asking that. And, and as you mentioned, it, it's, it's flat. So we're able to, to do the great work we're doing this year in a COVID year um, with what we have. If you're really asking a, a wish list question to how, right, uh, you know, that, that, that certainly uh, could be ex extensive. You know, there was a similar question, I believe, you know, posed to us, was that just last year? Um, in which we did talk about um, uh, math, math support, right, in, in a position in, in, in that area. Um, that on my own personal sort of like uh, view uh, in the landscape of the, of the school, and if you're talking about FTE, um, that is something that's on my mind. I do want to take a moment just to, to say one of the commitments that you said, you know, is, is down the line in, in this discussion that I'm really glad to see, particularly in a COVID year, is that dedication to social emotional and, and ruler. And so I, that represented later is definitely high on my level when I think about, or high on my list when I think about just overall uh, professional development, something you also mentioned. So uh, math, math is, is something that comes top of mind. Thank you. Anybody else? I would uh, add to what Keith said, the ma I would concur. The math piece would certainly be uh, high on the list to have another professional um, along the lines of matching our um, model for literacy, where we have one coach and one interventionist. We'd love to mirror that in math. And also in the area of special education, I know Dr. Hanaway has spoken or, um, about the idea of more of a co-teaching experience at the elementary level where we have um, a special education teacher as well as a classroom teacher together for a significant portion of the day that would really do a, a very strong job of supporting our children. Not that we don't now, but that would certainly enhance our program. So that's something that I think if we had our druthers would, would be wonderful. Thank you. So I'll jump in and I would add to, uh, or concur with, with Keith and Ellen, but I also really believe that professional, shared professional learning experiences for our staff and our teachers are really, really important. Not only does it provide learning experiences and prepare teachers and staff members to support our children socially and emotionally, but academically, it's also an opportunity for them to have time together and collaborate. And so, Obviously, the, the biggest uh, and the most important piece of our budget is the talent that we have in our building and what and our teachers who are able to provide for our students in unbelievably exceptional ways at this point in time, especially, um, you know, I, I, I would I would emphasize the need for continued continuous professional learning because it's so important for our staff members and our teachers to, to have that time together. Becky, yeah, I'd like to just add to that. You know, it's interesting. We talk about COVID and the changes that have happened, you know, um, and, and how education is different and, and really professional learning has looked different during COVID as we can't get teachers in the same classrooms teaching together. Or we can't get jigsaw lessons going. 
Um, so so uh, another thing that Ridgefield has always prided itself on was a professional learning of, of the staff and, and the leadership for that matter as well. Um, this board has in the past always supported that uh, initiative. So as we move away from COVID, hopefully soon, we want to make sure that's something that doesn't get lost because it definitely it definitely did have to change this year. While we're able to provide it, it looks different. And I think we want to get back to really having teachers work with each other in rooms, having coaches more often in rooms and things like that. So I just wanted to add that. John. Thanks again to all for the, the heavy lifting. I know there's a lot of work that goes into this and I won't reiterate what everybody said to thank you for all the work you've done this year. It's been great. Um, a question that I'll ask at this level, and we'll ask it again at, at uh, the middle school and the high school again is, you know, we, we talk about IEPs, we talk about 504s, we talk about special supports. Uh, are we starting to think about doing anything for the other 20%? So we're handling the the 20% at the bottom, how about the, the gifted, the 20% at the top? Are we doing anything uh, new or different for that group of kids? I know they've they've kind of been, um, I don't know about forgotten about, but swept under the rug for, for a long time. And I know we, we've we talked about doing a program for people like that, but uh, what do we, what do we uh, envision in this budget for that? So I'll speak to that a little bit and if my colleagues wanna jump in. Um, so, before we even talk about gifted education, we talk about a lot of what you just described, um, Sean, but we talk about differentiation, right? How do we support the individual needs of kids through the general education classroom? And then there's a population of kids that, um, that despite the hard work of our educators, they either need additional support or further planning or additional resources to really engage a very small population. It's not a, a big, you know, most of the time our teachers can differentiate for the wide spectrum of the needs that actually Ellen described earlier on in the presentation. But there is that small population of kids that come to learning in a different way. And there's some unique characteristics about who those children are and how we identify those children. Um, and so while we have a, a structure to identify the children in terms of a structured for lack of a better word, I'm gonna use gifted and talented program, but there's lots of ways in which we can describe it. We don't currently offer that. Um, one of the goals that the, um, in hiring the director of elementary education would be that that individual would oversee that population of children who may require some differentiated um, supports outside of what a general education teacher may be able to provide individually, right? They just need that extra help in terms of identifying strategies, tools, lessons, et cetera. Um, what that means in terms of staffing is a different, um, a different conversation that is not reflected in this budget. And so while the get us started is reflected in this budget in terms of really having a global understanding of an elementary program and having someone that is devoted to that work, um, the actual operation of that is not reflected in this budget, Sean. And, in, in while in many ways the, the launching of my budget presentation a few weeks ago spoke to the foundation and then being able to forward think, um, we didn't get into the details of that. I didn't get into the details of that, but this is one of those pieces that we would like um, seen and consider because there, it, there are those kids that are there um, and our teachers, I'm sure, are working incredibly hard to give them what they need, but sometimes they just need extra tools and an extra staff. Can okay, I so it's, can it's I on the radar. If my Is it okay if I that? add to that? Yeah, of course. So, um, and, and just for the for the board and the public's sake, I just want to be clear that um, for students who are gifted, which is a specific actual delineation within the law, we do have a process not only for identifying, but for programming for them. We don't have a gifted and talented program that's a set model, but we do take referrals, we evaluate, we identify, and we create um, specific plans for those kids that are more than just their teacher differentiating for them. Um, statistically, students who are gifted are one to 2% of the population. So as you can imagine, it reflects that way in Ridgefield as well. And we don't have a whole program for one to 2% of the population. And so we are creating individual plans for those kids. Um, and we have them in every school, in every elementary school, we do have students who have um, qualified and they have identified plans. But that is not speaking to your high performing learners, which I think is a bigger, 
a much broader population. I think that's really what we're talking about right now. It is. Okay. If I can add a little too, I think going back to that professional learning that we talked about earlier, a lot of times that professional learning um, would actually focus on those high performing kids as well, because we'd have an opportunity to talk about these kids that, that, that may be a little bit more difficult to reach because they're, they're one or two grade levels ahead of writing. And some of our professional learning consultants that would come in would actually target those children in that professional learning for the, those teachers. I just might add to that. And when um, we talk about the literacy coach or you know that conversation we just had about math, um, in many cases, it's that literacy coach who, in the area of literacy, who is working with the teacher and, so, and often even directly with students, setting them on their sort of own, own path and their own footing that assures us that they are getting not just what they need, but they're getting what they need to grow. Mm -hmm. um, Dr. Nasilva, you hit on something that I was thinking about as I was listening to the principals, is that this director of elementary education can provide some of the direct embedded support and coordination and uh, coaching for the schools that some of the, some of the teachers, some of the principals are asking for, particularly in terms of PD, right? I think that they'll, the elementary director will have a role in that for sure, and a role in working very, very closely with the elementary principals. I think one of the, the words that you just used, um, Kathleen, is really important when you have six schools. It's coordination. You know, we have, we have as a collective team, obviously in COVID, come together often. But when you're not jumping onto a Zoom and planning in the way that we've been planning this past year, having somebody to support the coordination, to lead the coaches, right? To lead, have somebody that brings those six coaches together and says, okay, let's, let's see what the needs of our schools are. How do those needs look different? How do we support our, our teachers? What are the needs of our teachers? What kind of PD do they want? Um, and again, even with the interventionists, being sure that they have um, the tools that they need and that coordination is incredibly important. There's a lot of content areas across our elementary schools. It's different than our secondary schools, right? There's art, which we've spoken about a lot. You know, there are standards, right? There's standards for art, there's music, there's PE, there's health education, there's math, reading, science, social studies, um, phonics, all of that. And so when you have, when you have six schools, that much programming, who's coordinating that? You're not necessarily gonna have someone with content expertise in one person, right? That's gonna know everything about art or PE or music, but you have somebody that's gonna coordinate the six schools to come together and support the professional learning that that's how schools grow and continue to grow. That's how they don't become stagnant um, is by having somebody that's, that's leading, coordinating and finding the outside resources, like Jamie said, to, to continue to support in those particular areas. Any more questions for this group? Margaret. Sorry, and I know we're, we're running late on time, so perhaps these can be addressed on, on Monday. I'd be fine with that. Um, but I really just have well two questions. And first of all, a statement again, thank you as the other board members have said, thank you to our principals and to our teachers. It's been an incredible year and you've just um, held your, your heads high and done what's best for our students. And I just thank you so much for all that work you've done this year and what you're looking to do next year. So thank you. Um, in terms of my questions, um, a build a little bit upon what I've been hearing is last year we spent a lot of time during our budget discussions talking about um, a desire for three math coaches at the elementary level. Um, and if I'm hearing the principals correctly, I'm hearing perhaps that's something that, you know, might still be something that, that they would like to consider. Again, I, so I'd just like to hear a little bit more about um, why the decision was made not, not to put those in the budget for this year. And again, that can be a conversation for Monday, but I'd like to hear a little bit more about that. Um, and then my second question is about the um, supervisory paras for lunch and recess. It feels like for as long as I've been listening to board meetings, we, we, we've always been trying to figure out how do we how do we handle kids at recess and lunch, right? Um, and there's been quite a few different tactics that have come up throughout the years. And I see some of our principals shaking their heads remembering those. Um, so my question about that, about this is, is that 0.63 para at each school, is that a benefited position? And does the amount that's in our budget book, if it is a benefited position, does that cover salary and benefits or is that 11,592 just salary? Um, and then the second piece of that is because I think the challenge we've seen in the past with some of the solutions to this supervision at lunch and recess is staffing. 
and trying to find people who can come in for that time of the day. Um, so just wanted to understand what the reality of that is, even if it were to be approved in the budget, is it something where we would find um, challenges in terms of the staffing? And again, this can be addressed on Monday if we wanna get moving on to the next piece. And we can have our elementary principals are here. So why don't we have them speak to the second part at least? Yeah, I can um, just quickly say, Margaret, that the ask is, is not for additional staffing, it's for additional time or for our existing staff. Um, that we've, it, um, and it is not um, a benefited, it's not a position with benefits. Um, so that quick answers to the question, but it, it's more about having them stay longer so that we can spread our lunch and recess waves a little longer throughout the day, which is what we did this year because we had to because of COVID. Typically we have a grade level eating and having recess together. This year we had to keep our classes separate for cohorting sake and safety sake. So we had one um, recess paraprofessional with each class for the most part. And that in that tighter amount of supervision, um, resulted in a much better uh, uh, way of managing um, a lot of our the challenges that have presented to us previously because there are just less children for each adult. Um, so that's the quick answer to the question. Did that answer your question? Did, and I'll, you. I'll just jump in regarding to, I, I think, Margaret, you were asking about the ability to actually staff those positions. And uh, currently I'm hiring a supervisory Para. So it's an excellent opportunity for parents with ch school age children to, to um, who have responsibilities in the morning and afternoon. So at least for my from my own personal experience, I found that it's it's a really great opportunity for uh, for working or um, for parents who aren't otherwise working to come in during the day and be part of the school community. So um, and I know that other schools have had that experience as well. So right. it is, it is, we are able to staff that. Right. That's the majority yeah. of our staff, our parents, um, particularly parents of other schools. You know, it's easier for, uh, to have a parent from a different school come to a school where, you know, it, it's just cleaner, but um, that tends to be our staff parents. If I could actually yeah. add to that, our, our hope is actually it becomes a little bit more attractive because right now some of the positions are about an hour and a half or two hours in the middle of the day. This would extend some of those to be more of a two and a half, three hour position. And so like uh, Ms. Tuckner said, as a person from Ridgebury to drive down to a VP for an hour and a half position, may, maybe not that attractive. However, if I'm gonna get two and a half, three hours in the day, it's actually perfect for parents uh, and it extends beyond the boundaries of necessarily just the school is close to them. Yeah. Can I add further clarification to what Jamie just said? Yes. So thank you. The request is a total of 19 hours of supervisory time for each elementary school. So ideally that would be broken out into hiring six paraeducators, each who work three hours of 10 minutes a day. That's very helpful to answering the question. Thank you. Uh, Margaret, your first question, which was around coaches, um, and, and actually it, it's in many ways connected to the security director and, and Dr. Patty Foote's uh, approved budget for last year, is that there, there's, no, you know, there's no doubt that the additional staffing would support us, and especially coaches. You've heard our elementary principals speak about the emphasis on professional learning and how much that matters, and certainly in terms of growing and innovation and everything else. That's a priority. The coach's primary role is to do just that, right? Is to bring new work that, that our teachers are engaged in or perhaps a new strategy or support a teacher by providing a, a coaching opportunity. And so there's no doubt that at some point you'll likely be hearing from our principals and from me or perhaps from um, my other colleagues that we believe that these roles are important and um, need to come back into the budget. We did not included in the budget this year and just in terms of priority. So let me explain a little bit about that also, is that our, our coaches this year in the area of reading have been exceptional because they know that their role has had to be a little bit transferable, right? It's been transferable in lots of different ways, not only providing the coaching, but also providing intervention for kids. And um, same with the math, right? The math ideally would have been 0.5 math support and 0.5 
coach, but the reality is when you have kids that may be struggling is our roles have had to be flexible in that way. And so right now, if we were to look at the role in and of itself as a coach, um, it just big picture in terms of this budget wasn't a priority. It doesn't mean that it won't be, it doesn't mean that it's not important or not value, just not a priority this year. Anyone else have questions for this team? Thank you all very much. Uh, appreciate all the work that's gone into this presentation. I also want to thank you for letting us have the presentation early. That was very helpful for us to be able to, to prepare ourselves last night um, for today's meeting. Thank you all for that. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Dr. De Silva, do you want to move us into uh, We're ready school? for middle school, yeah. Tim and Trish are here. So they're one, I think Trish is going to present her screen. Good morning. Tom, Tom's going to pre present his screen. Tom is going to present his screen. Yeah. And Tom while he's doing screen. that, we will introduce ourselves. I'm Trisha Ranieri, the principal of Eastridge Middle School. Good morning, everyone. Tim Salem, principal at Scotts Ridge. Good morning, Tom Grace, Tom Grace is the principal of Eastridge. Oh. And Lisa's Lisa's here. Sorry, I was having technical difficulties. <laughs> Lisa Freeze, the assistant principal at Scotts Ridge. <laughs> and there we go. Can we see it? We can, Tom. Yeah, we can, Thank Tom. you. We can. So we can jump right in, Tom. So you know, as educators, never has our mission and vision of the graduate dispositions been so critical uh, for our students. In the throes of this pandemic, we are simultaneously addressing our students' academic, social, and emotional needs, including their physical health. With our staff, we have strived to provide a, a very predictable structure with consistent routines, although they be new ones, to instill trust and feelings of safety. Um, I'd just like to add, I think just at the outset here, it's important to note that our teachers and our students have been champions, especially with all the work that we've been engaged in this year. And um, we couldn't have done it without the support of our fellow administrators, but also our parent community. I think it's important. We'd be remiss not to say it publicly, um, how supportive they've been and how appreciative we are. And it's just important to note, if we go back to these dispositions, um, they do serve as a critical guide for us in conversations with our department leaders and other teachers as we develop the budget. It's a, it's a part of our process in speaking specifically about these dispositions. Oh, and I think I have this next slide. Um, these, are just, these are just some examples um, of how those pertinent characteristics are reflected in the classroom setting whether it's depth of thinking, whether it's peaking curiosity or sustaining curiosity, which we know is so essential, um, whether it's developing a growth mindset and the idea of perseverance, both schools embed these in our learning communities. And it's in collaboration truly with our, with our teachers and staff that we aim to implement this in, in all that we do um, through the vision of the, of the graduate competencies. So these are, these are just important for you to be able to, to reference when we look at what classrooms are now versus perhaps what they what they were in the past. And you'll see in our presentation that the middle school budgets are consistently lean and efficient. The majority of our budget is staffing, um, similar to the elementary schools, and there's no extra in any of our budget lines. Our, our wonderful staff, they are our greatest asset and our human capital um, and the implementers of all of this great work. And so to support their work and the instruction for our students, a very small percentage of our budget actually is spent on instructional materials, so things such as lab materials, consumables, office supplies, those types of things. And we spread that money across all the content areas so that our students have what they need to maintain the course of what we know to be uh, best practice instruction, but also be able to engage in authentic, relevant, and personalized learning. And here we're, we're highlighting some of those instructional priorities. Uh, as a middle school administration uh, with our department leaders, we meet regularly to collaborate 
uh, plan curriculum and instructional priorities. Our department leaders also plan and align their work across the, the district. And although we do have goals in common, certainly, uh, there are still some individual budget differences. Um, some of these may be due to enrollment, student cho choice. Um, in some cases, the sharing of staff across the, across the district and between our buildings. However, it's important to note, and I'm sure you saw this, that our overall spending has been flat. Um, there's a 0% increase. Uh, the middle schools are a lean, mean fighting machine, <laughs> so to speak. Um, but the, it's also important that the funding is distributed amongst all curricular, curricular areas. And we're just gonna touch upon some of those now. So in the area of world, world language, there is no one textbook that meets the needs of our programming. So the monies in this area are to, used to support supplemental materials that will support opportunities uh, for speaking and listening for our students. So we use um, programs, or I should say digital uh, resources, such as BOCES, Conjugamos, uh, Flangu, Keo, and Garbanzo. In science, the middle schools continue to develop and fine tune their NGSS model of instruction for all of our students. Due to the personalized nature of the bundles inherent in NGSS, they're based on student curiosity and questions. Teachers have a continuing need to purchase hand-on consumable supplies as well as other lab materials, such as probes for collecting data, such as temperature, pH, acceleration, and force. They also need glue sticks, foam boards, chart paper throughout the year. Equipment repair, such as our microscopes and balances, which need servicing every year, is a recurring expense. In our science lines, you'll see that there's an increase of $2,622 to support instruction through the NGSS model. In literacy, in alignment with our district priorities, the middle schools are continuing to focus on acquiring differentiated materials for our students, primarily reading materials that are written at multiple levels of difficulty and accessibility. These will be used to supplement instruction in science and social studies. There is an also, this also supports, pardon me, our co-teaching and inclusion classes that are aligned with our special education priorities. You'll see in our reading lines, 13,300 has been allocated to support those priorities. And to further support literacy growth for all students, uh, you'll see reflected in the teaching and learning curriculum budget, which is the assistant superintendent's curriculum, uh, the middle schools have been allocated five uh, days with TC, Teachers College, for coaching, uh, which is in alignment with our humanities curriculum. And this truly supports the efforts of our English teachers across the, the district in working with students in level reading groups. Uh, it also connects to our budget requests, as you'll see at both schools, related to a wide spectrum of corollary reading materials, which is vital and important. Art is also personalized based on our students' interest. Voice and choice in their projects is um, one of the priorities in the art program. So you may notice that there is a 25% increase in supplies and materials at Eastridge for consumables that need to be replaced or refreshed regularly. And at Scottsridge, you're going to notice a 0.3 increase in FTE. And that was to address the class sizes in our um, art program at Scottsridge and to also meet the students' needs. Other areas um, at Eastridge, you'll see um, in particular a decrease in our PE line of $5,000 from last year. And that's because we purchased a treadmill, stationary bike, and elliptical machine for our fitness room. So now that those purchases are, have been completed, um, we've reduced that budget um, to allocate that money elsewhere. In music, um, we did not spend the money uh, that we had planned to spend on equipment replacement. Um, and so we are keeping that $4,000 in our line this year. Um, last year, we reallocated that money to support the remote teaching and learning. Um, and so now we're anticipating uh, being able to buy these instruments for, uh, in, with next year's money. And then lastly, in the area of music at Eastridge, we do hire an accompanist um, to support our choral director during school performances. Um, and you'll see that reflected in our budget. Just to add on, um, with more emphasis in social studies on primary sources to deepen the connection to learning, our talented teachers at, at both schools are using more digital platforms to support that learning. 
Um, additionally, in the Scotts Ridge budget, you'll notice that the only area of increase for us is uh, $900. And um, that's in the area for social emotional learning for consumables and materials. And, and truly we anticipate in planning ahead for the fall uh, that we're gonna need to require, uh, it's gonna require increased efforts in, in SEL. And so we're already looking at that and planning for that. And that's where, where that, um, that funding comes from and that planning, thank you. You're also going to notice in both budgets a line for an additional $20,000 for substitutes. Um, those are for lingering COVID related absences. Social emotional learning this year uh, continues to be more important than ever uh, to support students managing the conflicts or I'm sorry, the effects of changes in schedules, the impact of cohorting is having on students. We're using the tools of ruler such as the mood meter more than ever across the buildings to check in and also check out with our students. Instruction includes teaching students coping strategies as well as strategies to shift from one quadrant of the mood meter to another. You'll see that our budget reflects $6,300 towards these support efforts. And we don't wanna forget about our teachers. Teacher wellness is also important focus for this year and next year. Um, each school is facilitating different activities to support our staff. At Scottsbridge, we offer a teacher wellness day one Thursday each month. Uh, the teachers will run different wellness activities for their colleagues and they will choose a wellness workshop based on their needs and interests. I, I think it's also just important for both the board and the public to be aware that um, you know, our middle schools have been commonly used by other districts for the work that we've done in this area. In fact, we presented at the national conference last year. A group of us just did a presentation for Yale a couple of weeks ago, sharing with um, schools across the country about some of the work that we're doing currently in this re remote environment. And I think that's important for, for you to know that, that the work that's being done and honestly led by our teaching staff with our support um, is being recognized nationally and by Yale itself for all the work that, that we have done um, in this area. It's, it's truly important and, and really gratifying. In the areas of intervention, our staff continually meet in team meetings and MTSS meetings to find ways to support our struggling students. And we regularly analyze the effectiveness of in, and impact of our intervention supports on student performance. At each middle school, we have a literacy and numeracy interventionist who provide direct instruction for our students. And you re may remember that last year we had the Math 180 program in last year's budget, and in this year's budget, we do not. And that's because our math interventionists looked very closely at student performance data using um, map results, classroom performance, student assessments, and teacher feedback, and, and identified that the Math 180 program was not serving our students as well as we had hoped. The program itself is not aligned with our big ideas, uh, which is our primary math resource. And students were not able to generalize the skills that they were learning. Um, so we feel it, it's best moving forward that our interventionists drive um, the teaching um, and really in collaboration with classroom teachers, with the math department, looking at student performance, they make the decisions about what kind of programming our students need to be successful. So with the elimination of this program, you'll see that decrease reflected in the district's curriculum budget. Um, it's also important to note, and I think this gets to, to Sean's question that he asked at the, uh, at the elementary meeting, but it applies to all three levels. Uh, and you'll notice that wh where we have MAP, we have intervention and acceleration. It's important to note that on the learning continuum, when we get those MAP scores or we get other data, you know, we look at we look at both ends of the spectrum, right? We look at those students that we need to support uh, with intervention, but we also look at those students who we need to accelerate. That we always do that, and I think it's important to note. Um, and we do use our our learning lab um, to help us get at those. So whether it's students needing additional support in an area, or whether it's students that need to be challenged, um, our teachers do an exceptional job of looking at the the whole student um, and filling those needs. Uh, that's important to to note. It's also important to note that. And I think this is a great touch point to show alignment across the district. You know, we have incredible students at the high school who offer time. And even in this environment, 
virtually or offering their own time twice a week to support students. Uh, I think it's an incredible testament to uh, the fortitude and the, and the consciousness of our high school students to be able to look and say, hey, we want to help support middle schoolers during this, this environment. Uh, we Obviously, that was more of an in-person operation prior to this year, but the fact that they were able to make it work um, in, in a virtual environment is really important to note. And it's also important to note that we're still doing our best to provide enrichment activities for students both before and, and after school. It's presented some challenges along the way this year, but um, I, I think it's been an, an incredible testament to the fortitude of our teachers, the fact that they've been able to still figure out ways to do that at both middle schools in a variety of areas. Sorry, I think I went a little off script, guys. That's okay, Tim. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I would like to. I, would I, I like am to. much better extemporaneously than following. I, I apologize. <laughs> um, and obviously, the result of of all of this great work is is noted is noted here. And again, it sort of goes back to that first slide. I mean, our our work is truly driven um, by those competencies, and and this is where we we highlight those. Um, and it gives us an opportunity to help students learn how to problem solve. Uh, we're, we're really focused on, on complex thinking and solving uh, problems in multiple ways and also deepening the connection to both the school community and the community at large through empathy and kindness. That's really foundational at the middle school. We know how important that is. And so uh, we, we embed that in certainly in, in everything that we do. So I think... Yeah. And, oh, I'm and, sorry. and Go Tim, ahead. Just, just to add, our, our teachers have just really, our teachers and staff and, and our kids have just done such a wonderful job with supporting each other and the creativity and the innovation that's been bubbling up through this time um, has been just truly impressive um, on so many levels. And, and we just want to remind the board that and the public that our budgets are really lean and our staff, it's all a tribute to, to their work that we're able to maintain such strong instructional practices um, and still find ways for creativity and innovation. So it's really uh, kudos to them. And we're just very happy we were able to share um, with you the work that we are doing and, and, and how we base our decisions for our budget. So thank you for the opportunity to present. Questions? Rachel, I saw your hand first. Thank you so much for your presentations and the enormous undertaking of providing support to our students, our families, and our staff. Um, our middle schools have been hybrid since we cannot socially distance our children safely in schools. How has this learning model impacted the growth um, of learning for our students? And do you believe this budget is reflective of reaching those needs next year? If you are asked to increase your budgets, is there anything you would add or want to see in terms of academic or mental health support moving forward? That's a good question, Rachel, and I'll answer it from the reverse if I could. I, I obviously, you know, you, you noted that the only increase in the Scotts Ridge budget is in SEL. So, you know, we've recognized the importance of, of trying to plan in advance next year for that because we anticipate that with the hybrid situation that we're in and some students who have not stepped foot in the building this year, our cohort C students, that we really need to, to plan for what that's going to be like. And I don't know that we honestly know the answer to that, um, but we're doing the best we can and we're putting a lot of brains around that in both buildings and we're also seeking input. As I mentioned, we just did a presentation that we had people from, you know, across the, the country at, at, from Yale, and we were all, everybody were, was talking just about that component, you know, how it's going to be a challenge. Um, but I, I do think that we're thinking about that, and we're, we're planning for that to the best of our ability. But I also think that to some degree, it, it's going to be sort of almost like this year, a lot of ways, we're, we're sort of going to have to plan as we go. So you do your best to create the best plan possible. And then, and then, as things pop up, we'll, we'll, we'll be flexible and we'll adjust. And I think if there's any community that has um, certainly modeled that, when you think back, we started in August. I don't know of any other schools that started in, in August and we're still here and we're still going and we're doing our best to support our kids. Um, but that's a certainly your point about the social emotional realm is one that's not lost on us. And it's certainly one that we're thinking about and planning for. 
And, and to that point too, Tim, I think one of the, the biggest things, uh, Rachel, that's been very helpful for our teachers is the early release time. The time for them to have these conversations with their colleagues about our students and which students, and then the planning and how can we meet not only their social emotional needs, because Tim just spoke to that, and I, I agree with every single thing he, he said. I'm just going to take it from the academic side now too, for students who have been either struggling with hybrid. We've also had students who have done really well with hybrid. So letting our teachers talk to those children. At, and I think, let me just backtrack for a second. I think um, the hybrid has allowed us time when kids are in school to teach them how to be more successful when they're home. Right, teaching them the strategies that they need, how they can organize themselves, what they can do differently, but all of that requires time. And so those early release days, and I'm glad to see that we're, we're having them moving forward because they are critical because time is, is so needed uh, for our staff to be able, for us to be able to do that work. And Rachel, I just wanted to, it's a great question and I wanted to make sure everybody is aware. We also um, identified students that are struggling um, and we have invited them back for five days of full instruction. So that invitation has been out there for students that are really struggling with the digital learning. Um, so we've been trying to build in supports in other ways as well. So if they don't choose to take the invitation to come back, they do have additional opportunities um, at the middle school level to add uh, structured study hall class for work completion, um, meet with their teachers during learning lab, so we do have some other supports in there as well. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Tina. Thank you, Tim and Trisha. Thank you. Um, I mean, I, you know, I love middle school. Um, and I was going to remind you, Tim, you also, you've talked about ruler for years. You've gone to Connecticut PTAs. You've done this all. So I know that it's truly appreciated. So thank you. Uh, I have a more question. Uh, if I heard correct, Math 180 is out, right? So I'm, if I'm understanding this correct, intervention will be led by the teachers or the math specialists. So there is no program per se. But, you know, just for clarification and the fact that all our uh, parents are listening, the community at large, is the math program going to look differently? Are we still going to have three levels of math? And if so, how is this, how are the kids, you know, for example, I remember last year, if I'm correct, or the year before, when kids were starting sixth grade math, it was uh, decided by the fourth grade um, SPAC scores teacher, there were four input factors in where the kids went. So for this year, have you thought about how this will look? Is it going to be in your budget? Um, are you already starting to talk about it? Um, it's, I know it's a broader question and it probably may not tie to your budget currently, but I think it's important that parents hear about this as we go through this process. Well, that, that's a great question, Tina. And um, we're, a few of us are smiling because we literally were just on the phone about this. I think it was Thursday afternoon um, discussing you know, how the, the placement process, what information would we be looking at? So that is still under development and we'll be communicating that to parents um, probably in the, in the next few weeks um, to let them know how, how we're doing things. Um, but just to go back to the intervention piece, um, the, the, so the math levels, nothing is changing for next year. Everything is going to be the same. The difference is that Math 180 was a very scripted and very controlled program. And so it didn't allow our math interventionists to really address what it was that a child might be struggling with in the classroom at that moment, right? Which was directly impacting their ability to engage in the classroom, to feel comfortable and competent in the classroom. So that's where that shift is made. So. Mathematically speaking, we don't have any staffing uh, changes um, and or uh, budget changes um, for that area. And just to add to that, what, what Trish was saying, I think Tina, you know, it's, um, you know, the Math 180 is a prescribed program. So it doesn't really lend to the, as much for the ability for our math specialists to be able to connect with the teacher and really drill down into where the student needs are um, with the same specificity. And so we, we just feel it's important that our math specialist takes the ownership of that, works closely with the teacher, it's aligned with the curriculum. Um, you know, we, we did all that, all that, all that work and, and analysis to make sure that we were going into this with the right mindset. So it's, I think it's important for um, parents listening in to understand that. 
Thank you. And I, I think it's great that the teachers are leading this, right? Because the mm -hmm. teachers know best eventually how their kids are doing. Right. So it's, a compute, uh, it's just my opinion, but thank you for that. So you know, you. if I can just add to like just two pieces and just one is connected to budget is that the interventionist um, that both the middle schools are served by is actually partly paid for in one of our grants our Title I grant, I believe. And so that's just a, a piece of information. The other piece that just in terms of clarity around um, prescribed programs, oftentimes in intervention, in intervention spaces, we do use a prescribed program that is lesson by lesson because it's typically building foundational skills that children are missing. That has its strengths and then it has its challenges. It has its challenges in particular when you get to the second with dairy level in your grades six through eight where kids have to generalize skills. Mm -hmm. We have other digital resources, uh, whether that's IXL math or other digital resources that kids can continue to grow when it's those foundational skills that are they're digital, they can do them on their own, they can do them when they have free time in school, but aren't necessarily, um, aren't as, aren't necessarily uh, directly taught by an interventionist. So therefore, since we have a skilled teacher, we want them to be able to work on the skills that the kids need in a secondary math class so they can go back and be successful in that general area. John. Uh, thank you both for the heavy lifting. There's a lot in here. Um, I also agree that the removing Math 180 gives a little more flexibility and a little more transparency. I know parents were very confused as to how my kid got where they are, or I think they should be there and the metrics aren't. So I, I think it'll give a little more flexibility. Um, I'll ask the ugly question early. Um, <laughs> Teachers College, uh, we went through a lot of ugliness last year on this and we pulled it out of the budget and it it's reappeared. It's like a bad zombie. Um, why, how much, and is it really necessary, I guess? Um, I mean, I, I could start with that. I think that, you know, Sean, the benefits of the teacher's college in terms of their writing program and structure um, definitely benefits us. At, I'm just speaking at the middle school level in terms of best preparing those students for the demands of the high school writing. Um, I know it, it is definitely um, an area of discussion every year. So we've really trimmed it down to pull out the pieces that we think would benefit the department most. Sean, in terms of cost um, and just in terms of a piece from last year, one of the reasons that Teachers College or the work of um, staff development with Teachers College was pulled out last year, primarily is because we did avoid professional development in terms of outside sources coming in. And we quite frankly, didn't have the time allocated in our calendar this year because of maximizing time with teachers and children in school, given the circumstances. So that was one of the reasons that it was reduced. Just in turn, you'll hear it later in the curriculum presentation, but just in terms of costs, where it sits in the curriculum budget, it's about $23,000 divided by the two schools. I think that is probably about five days of staff development um, per school. It's not a significant amount, but it's about five days. Um, and so when it comes to the work that our teachers are already doing, having that support, again, this isn't, if we were gonna substitute it with something else, I think there needed to be a plan for that, which we haven't had. Um, so I appreciate the question. I think it's important for transparency for the public to understand where it's coming from and where it is in the budget, uh, because I think that that was a concern in years past that perhaps it wasn't as cleanly delineated. So people couldn't exactly see how much it was. Um, so that's an important piece that I just wanna be sure everyone knows it's $23,000 divided by the two schools. Um, and if I just might add, Sean, I, I, I also appreciate the question. And as someone who's been here for a long time, um, I can attest to the fact that several administrations ago, if you looked at those consultant lines, they were a lot larger. Mm -hmm. um, and we really worked hard. And, and Susie's been very supportive of us scaling those to what we need. Um, in the past, that wasn't always the case, that, that we had a lot of voice in that. Um, I'm just being honest. And so I, I think that for us to be able to articulate to the administration who we feel we would need um, best serve the needs of our community. And, and so 
Um, Susie was saying it in a really nice way. I'm just giving you sort of the broad expanse of how we arrived there. I get it. I, I think there's two contingents out there. One contingent is teachers college is terrible and it just needs to go away forever. And then there are some, I, I know Liz has been on this bandwagon is when is enough training enough? When can we uh, walk on our own? And, and it sounds like we're getting to that part where we can kind of walk on our own and use what's good and, and jettison what's bad and, and move forward. But maybe I'm completely wrong about all that. So there's two parts to that. And I, you know, professional development is one of those is one of those questions that's always asked, like, when is enough enough? Why do we always have to see it each year? Why is it always in the budget? Um, a couple of pieces, I think, just in terms of teacher college, again, I don't want to go down the curriculum rabbit hole, but it is one piece of a balanced literacy, a comprehensive literacy program. It is not a full, if done well, it's it's one piece, right? That's one over here. But then on the second part of the question that I think is a real question and, and what boards and publics should be asking is when is professional development enough? Well, the art and science of teaching would say that it never ends and that we're always becoming more sophisticated. We're always becoming better. And we always have teachers that struggle or particular needs of kids that require us to look at that unit of study in a completely different way because now my population of kids is different than I've ever had, or I'm, I'm a brand new teacher. And so even though the amounts of money may shift here and there, think about five days in a school the size of Eastridge or, or Scottsridge, that's not a lot of time, right? And so maximizing that time across all of our teachers and being sure that it's thoughtful, it's not just me telling you, but me showing me you, you working with me, let's working alongside of each other, is not a lot of, it's not a lot of cost at this point, um, but it doesn't really end, it might shift, you know, so maybe we're working on differentiation this year, but next year we're working on something else, that absolutely happens um, because our crafts, we're always getting better and better um, or struggling and struggling. And that's just, you know, when it comes to technology or whatever else it is, it's, that's real. Thank you. Any other questions Can I for Historically, Sean, that, uh, yes, you're right about the teacher's college, but a lot of the conversation over the last couple of years has been its efficacy in the very early literacy, particularly um, it, it for emergent reading and, and, and the science of that. So there, there, I think there were different conversations, not that they didn't overlap. So that's a historical perspective. Any other questions for this team? Um, you had mentioned that uh, students that were struggling this year have been invited to come back five days. Is that correct? Yes. Yes. What about students that are struggling emotionally, but not necessarily in their in their schoolwork? Is there are they invited to come back? Is there a way for, for them to be? A, they help? are. They are, Jonathan. Um, we we work with our counselors very closely. Who work with the families, um, and we really uh, look at who who whether it's um, academic or emotional. Who really look? They all can be in school. They, they should all be in school five days, but obviously um, that, that's not gonna happen. So within um, our abilities to maintain safe social distancing too, we're, we're inviting uh, people, we're inviting students back where we can. It's not easy, Jonathan. You know, it, it, it's a struggle because of the spacing. And, and, you know, obviously as Trisha said, we would love to just get everybody back and get into a regular flow, but those conversations do happen. Um, but it, it sometimes, depending upon the cohort, it does present us with some challenges. There's no doubt about that part of it. That'd be difficult even just recognizing who's struggling emotionally when yeah. you're not seeing them every day as well. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes, especially for those cohort C kids. That's a challenge. Yep. Um, a question following up, I think you both sp uh, spoke to it because I know you've been using Ruler for quite a while and are, are, are very um, adept at it. Uh, you're able to use it uh, uh, virtually, and is that helping you to identify? Do you understand what I'm saying? Yes, yeah. it, yes. It, it is actually one of the things um, that we're able to do is have the kids um, with the mood meter check in digitally and the teachers are able to see everyone's responses. So whether you're home or in school, they can see how kids are feeling on any given day. Um, which has been really helpful because then sometimes they'll have a classroom conversation about it, um, depending on what the kids are presenting, um, and, and they'll address it and or they'll talk to a counselor about it, right, and follow up with the family. That's great. It's a safe way to be able to do that on a virtual mm -hmm. platform. I 
Like yeah, that. and they're also able to explicitly teach some of the coping strategies. So, you know, when we talk about the mood meter and moving from zone to zone, if you are in the blue and you'd like to get to the green, you know, what are some strategies you can do to help move yourself there? So there is explicit teaching going on as well. Thank you. Tina? Yeah, I just want to say thank you for um, talking about that because I do think um, kids who are struggling mentally, right? There are sometimes there are no signs. You, maybe yeah. academically they're doing great. They could have straight A's, but it's identifying the kids who are struggling emotionally and mentally and how to give them coping strategies. I mean, it's adolescent, you know, teenagers, they're by nature social. This is an entirely different world for whatever reasons, maybe they have to stay home. So I do appreciate that we are talking about it. We are identifying those kids and there are resources available because I think that will be the most important piece as we look into next year, because I don't know how next year will look. It depends, right? If we're still gonna continue this model, these issues will grow. Mental health issues, emotional struggles will grow. It might, may or may not be reflected in their academic work, but it will be reflected. So I truly thank you for talking about this, for addressing this and having tools beyond words, right? Sometimes uh, adolescents are not really adequately equipped to identify their deeper emotions, but hopefully they can identify if they're feeling blue. So I think that's great that you're doing that. And I do wanna acknowledge that you're doing that because I truly believe that we do, we do need more mental and emotional support. Uh, and we need to keep continuing to do that because I still think, I mean, I'm sure we, you know this too. There are so many kids who are still missed at this point, but mm -hmm. I'm hoping as we go forward, they will be at, you know, they can, there are ways to identify them and come um, bring, give them help. So my question, just a quick follow-up is, is there any tangible data, is there any tangible or hard data that you have that helps you identify kids who are struggling academically? I mean, I know there's any, you've been having map testing. So is that what you're doing? You're using map testing and in-class testing to identify kids who need help? Well, could I jump in, Tina? Because you brought up a couple of great points and I think um, it will answer sort of all of those things. One of the big benefits, I think one of the biggest benefits we have at the middle school is the team model. Um, so you have the same core teachers and guidance counselor that's traveling with those kids that can acknowledge, you know, they've changed from, you know, this is, I've seen this change over time. And then when you have the, the academic teachers meeting every other day with the counselor talking about that particular group of students, I honestly do believe that structure leaves very little cracks for kids to fall through. Um, so, it, you know, the math teacher and science teacher might pick up on something because they're struggling just in those areas, but that won't be missed. That will be shared with the guidance counselor and discussed. And in terms of data points, we do have, you know, unit assessments, attendance, map data, lots of pieces of data to look at individually. So that, that the structure that we have at the middle school, I think, is a huge, huge benefit, particularly in this environment. Yeah, and if I could add, our MTSS process and our meetings that we have as teams really gets at not just a single data point, but really looking at the child holistically and getting that conversation going with all the kids and with all the teachers. And Tina, I think how you started this is, is probably most important. You know, if you, 20 years ago, kids didn't talk about their feelings. I mean, not as readily as they do now. And I, and I think that... Um, Ruler is truly a vehicle for students to be honest and upfront, and it also gives us an entry point into those things. So they're more apt to tell us when they're struggling now more than they ever have before. So sometimes it's, yes, those conversations are important, but sometimes it's out of the mouth of the students themselves in identifying, plotting themselves on the mood meter or through um, enacting a strategy where they'll articulate it and it gives us the ability to, to then confront it. Thank you, thank you so much. Nora. All right, um, so just real quick off, off of that subject for a moment, um, the middle school as well as the elementary school has um, a $20,000 increase in the substitute teacher line. And I just wondered um, for clarification if that was, um, is this a building substitute or is this um, an increase in sub pay or what accounts for that? I'll let Karen jump in first. And then I just wanna be sure that everyone knows that it's in the, the $60,000, we divided it evenly among the three levels. Obviously it's probably not going to be even, but that's how we divided it. And that really was relative to COVID. So there's 20,000 in middle, 20,000 at elementary and 20,000 at the high school. Karen, do you wanna talk about um, what types of subs? 
Um, sure. So we do have, um, just for the general public, um, daily subs and building subs. Um, building subs are subs that we commit to, to come to work um, for us every single day. Um, those subs are paid $110 a day, and they can assume any role that we need them to fill uh, during that day. Um, so it's regardless of, um, you know, if you're a certified position, non-certified, a para, we can place that person wherever there's a need. We did increase the number of building subs we have this year due to COVID. Uh, we've not had conversations yet about uh, what specifically we'll need for next year um, for the number of building subs. Then our daily subs are subs that are called in only when we need them. They are paid $100 a day um, uh, as a, for a certified teacher. We also look for substitutes for our non-certified and they're paid hourly. There will need to be some slight shifts in our sub pay for those just due to minimum um, wage increases that uh, will be required by law. Um, so this is just a general pool. We know that uh, we've not been able to get as the number of subs that we need. Uh, we're hoping that next year our, our supply will be stronger and we'll be able to fill um, the, the requests that we have. And therefore you'll see that uh, slight adjustment in the amount uh, at each level. The building subs have really been instrumental this year because we've been able to, with teachers needing to go into quarantine, we've been able to keep our instruction going without missing a beat. They, the building subs have access to all of the teachers' materials and they're able to run Google Meets, for example. They're able to access student work. So it really um, keeps the work, uh, the work going with children in a meaningful way versus if we had a daily sub only, they would not be able to access all of that. So the building subs have really allowed us to continue our instruction this year in a positive well, quite, way. Quite frankly, Nora, I, I honestly, I, and I don't know who to give credit to. I don't know if it's, if it's Susie or if it's Karen or if it's Liz or, or, the, or the committee as a whole, but I will tell you for certain, we would not have been able to stay open if no. we were not able to hire those subs in advance. There's just no way that would have been possible. And so they've been instrumental for us, as Trish said, to, to keep the continuity of learning going in, in adapting to whichever environment that we've been in, but we would not have been able to stay open without them. Thank you. Anyone else? Thank you all so much again for the work that you put into this. Um, there's not a lot Perfect. new in here, so it's probably why there's not a lot of questions because you're not asking for much. Um, Thank you again for everything. And uh, I think we should take a 10 minute break, Dr. De Silva. That sounds good. I 11 think 11 o'clock. Does that work for everyone? Thank you all very Thanks, much. Tim. Thank you. Thank you again. Thank you again. Thank you, Trish. Thanks, Tom. Thanks, Lisa. Thank you.
Hi, Jake. Good morning. Good morning. Hello there, doctor. That's you, Greenwood. Yep. How are you? Oh, I'm good, thank you. Jake, you look cold. <laughs> I had to break into one of the guidance offices and steal the heater. <laughs> It's all right. I'm saving money. Turn down on the weekends. I like that. That's right. That's right. That's okay. Wear a Ridgefield High School hat. It'll keep you warm. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah you, have, you guys have some nice gear. Come on over. We'll hook you up anytime. I am missing my gear. I just got a great mug from Branch Bell, though. I had to go return the umbrella I stole. See, I only get pens. I got a pen too. <laughs> yeah, but I don't get anything else other than pens. Mm. Well, we'll have to set up our logo gear <laughs> order form. Looks like everyone's back. Should we jump right in? Okay. You have to say anything, Susie, or do you want me to just start? <laughs> It's actually Jonathan that's going to start us. Gotcha. <laughs> I'm starting us off. I think, uh, Jake, you can jump right in here. OK, great. Thanks, everyone. Um, thanks for the opportunity to present the Richfield High School 21-22 budget. I have uh, Jared Pepe on with me, um, one of my assistant principals. Um, he does all of our scheduling. So if questions come around to class sizes, et cetera, we can head in that direction. Um, he'll be a good resource for us. Um, just starting off here. Um, I know you've seen this a few times already today, of course, um, looking at the mission statement. This is for um, looking at our school, uh, that we strive to cultivate a highly engaging and personalized learning environment, encouraging individual growth, resilience, citizenship, empathy. Um, you know, this really came out of an initiative um, uh, from NEASC that, was, that we went through and finished up in the fall last year. And part of that was to work on something called the vision of the graduate, which again, I know you've heard of a number of times today. And those are really guiding goals for what a successful graduate would look like um, leaving Richville High School. And so the characteristics we're really trying to, to deliver would be um, communication, um, knowledge, resiliency, collaboration, uh, innovation, and mindfulness. And so hopefully this budget and those you've seen from my predecessors really uh, speaks to these, these values that we're working on with students. Um, part of the NEASC report is they give us what's called commendations and recommendations. Um, and there's over 60 of them in general. Um, I wanted to just highlight those that I think directly relate to both the budgeting and also to the Board of Education. Um, uh, probably among the most important here, I'm moving my, sorry, I'm moving you guys on my screen over the words. Um, probably among the most important I thought um, was right towards the top. And that is uh, the accommodation with the collaborative relationship between the school board, the principal, and the superintendent ensuring students receive high quality resources and opportunities. Um, I, I really found this to be, um, you know, really something that we should be proud of is that NIAS came in and in a 48 hour period, we're able to recognize um, this relationship that we have together leading to the vision, vision of the graduate um, and, and um, days like this where we can go through talk about um, resources that we need to support our students. Uh, they also talked a lot about our value in support of professional development, um, the funding around uh, technology initiatives. Um, specifically, they spoke about our commitment to providing staffing levels and materials and equipment. You'll see this one is directly related to our LLC, to the library, and the continuous funding for program services, materials, and technology overall in the building. 
They also um, spoke about our writing labs and the board's continuing uh, support of our writing conferences, uh, the variety of resources that allow students opportunity to access challenging academic courses. They talked about the, the rigor of our courses um, and how we support students through that. Also resources providing to engage professional development. They highlighted our student load and class sizes, making sure the teachers are able to meet the learning needs of all their students, um, sufficient supportive support for our instructional materials and our numerous support service professionals, our paraeducators and other support staff. Uh, and finally, the funding of the school safety uh, in terms of capital improvement plans. So those are all commendations again of the 60 some odd that I thought were directly related to the budgeting and of course the continued support the Board of Ed provides us. There were some recommendations um, which were important to highlight heading into the budgeting process. Um, one being ensuring a sufficient, uh, excuse me, effective curricular coordination and vertical articulation. And the second one about a formal review cycle for departments and curriculum. And this is a conversation that we've spoke of uh, a couple of times um, at, at early Board of Education meetings this year. And Dr. De Silva and I, um, along with the middle school principals have been in communication about what does a more articulated six through 12 plan look like. And I know we have some long range plans uh, heading out of, uh, hopefully heading out of the pandemic to take a look at what that would look like. Um, implement formal time on a regular basis for school-wide collaboration. That's really talking about where we place our PD time in our calendar and how we split up the school day. Uh, increase communication with staff and teachers during the budgeting process. This is one for me to be sure that my staff is on board with each step of the way. And last thing is uh, resolving uneven heating and cooling issues relating to HVAC. And I know that um, I think Joe's going to speak to that a little bit when his presentation comes up uh, in, uh, in, in a little while here. So just explaining the budgets, um, we've, in terms of our instructional supplies, um, we're having no change from last year to this year. So from 2020 to 2021, that's a 0% increase. And so just to give you an idea, the instructional supplies, that's materials, equipment, clubs, trips, textbooks, repairs, memberships. Um, you would be looking at things like uh, textbooks and book replacements, um, science lab equipment, sheet music, copyright fees for plays, classroom manipulatives, furniture, club and competition fees, that, that really would be part of that, that bulk. Um, you will note when you look at the budget book, um, there are some changes. However, we stayed at zero. For instance, you notice that the library moved a sufficient amount of their funds from furniture to books. So they are replacing books that um, frankly were not returned uh, in, in, the, uh, in the spring last year, but we've had very little wear and tear on furniture this year. So they're moving money. So it's a 0% increase, but that might catch your eye as you're going through the budget book. In uh, the same with um, music transportation, you'll see there's an increase. We haven't done trips in music now for bordering on a year. So we have two classes of kids who have some trips that we wanna um, support. And also uh, English and literary books, and that's in our reading program and our English, same, we have to replace some books that unfortunately were, were not returned in the spring. Uh, World language memberships is up a hair. That's for the Yukon courses that we're offering and conferences and training from the assistant superintendent's budget is, is up just a little bit. Um, again, and that's to support our UConn and AP courses for our teachers. But I decreased uh, an equipment repair line, which hadn't been used, frankly, in, in two years. And so in the end, it came to plus $45, which uh, is uh, basically a 0% increase for us. So again, a few things might catch your eye, but I wanted to just sort of um, explain better how we came to 0%. We're not asking for any new textbooks next year. So we have replacement of textbooks. Those that are in disrepair need to be repaired and replaced but no new textbooks have been adopted. Uh, planning on flat funding my clubs for next year. Um, generally, we've asked for about seven new clubs. We're gonna restructure the process we use in order to bring clubs forward. So we're gonna be sure that we weed out clubs uh, earlier that aren't running and then use that money to add new clubs on. So it doesn't mean we won't have new clubs. It means we're, we don't need, um, we're gonna ask not to use the money to add new clubs every single year. Conferences and training. Um, that's a $32,000 line that has been moved to the assistant superintendent's PD budget. And on technology, we need to repair and upgrade our digital displays around the system. Those are the TV systems that students use for announcements. That's going to come to the tune of somewhere around six or $7,000. You'll see that in the tech budget. Um, I believe the system they're using, I think it's Scottsridge, has already upgraded the year or the year before that. Um, and um, they've been very happy with it. So we're hoping to move in that direction and, and just bring us a little into the, uh, into the 2020s with our digital displays here. 
Uh, and then looking at staffing explains, you'll see in my budget, the addition of a data specialist. It's, it's not a new position, it's an existing position that's actually in the IT staffing budget. We're just moving that over to the RHS staffing budget. Uh, my data specialist really works with PowerSchool running all the state reporting, um, does, uh, helps Jarrett with the scheduling. And so that really is a high school specific position. So that's moved over to my budget. You will see in Liz's budget, the addition of one special education teacher, and that's strictly to implement required uh, IEPs. Uh, there's a $20,000 substitute line. I was, I was just watching, I saw that that came up uh, in the last presentation. So don't need to spend a lot of time on this, but I just was highlighting that you'll see that we have a $20,000 addition to our substitute line. That's really in response to the potential need next year with, uh, with COVID-19. Um, I did reduce one instructional paraprofessional, or paraeducator, excuse me. Um, that's from the LLC in your book. Um, as a placeholder, it was removed from science. I just wanted to, again, point your eyes to that. It's actually coming from, from the LLC. That's our library. I have two paraeducators in there. We're going to change the hours. They've collected data over the last three to five years. They've been using staggered hours and staying open until 4.30. Um, and in the afternoons from 3.30 to 4.30, we had very, very, very little use of that. And so we're going to be able to cover the um, workload during the day by changing around some of our teacher duties uh, and close the library at 3.30, um, which is really what, how the kids are using it. And I'll be able to make that reduction in the paraeducator. In terms of teaching and administrative FTEs, we're going to remain unchanged. Um, the predicted enrollment decreases 50 students moving into next year. And, you know, I think Tim Salem did a nice job um, in his last presentation, really highlighting the fact that, you know, we are coming out of uh, an area where we have students who so far have not been in the building since since last March. Um, and they have a wide, wide variety of needs, both both academic uh, and socially and emotionally. And so, you know, re reducing staff with uh, 50 students decrease, which equals uh, potentially a, a 0.5 FTE, I don't think would be in the best interest of our students really going to need, I, I frankly believe we're going to need all hands on deck. Uh, keep the class sizes as low as we possibly can to be sure that they're interact, interacting with as many um, with, with as many adults as possible because, um, you know, the human capital, we know the, the best way to success is really having adults interacting with our kids. So I feel strongly about maintaining my current FDE levels going into going into this year. And that's my, my budget explained. So I'm happy to take some questions here. Who would like to lead us off? Tina. Okay, I'm sorry, I keep raising my hand before anyone else. Um, sorry about that. Um, thank you, Jake. Uh, thank you so much for the presentation. I appreciate everything the high school is doing for all our kids and all the staff. So thank you. Um, it, it's almost a similar question that I've asked Tim, and I don't see in this budget, maybe you can explain it, maybe I missed. Uh, I'm talking about the emotional and mental health, right? And um, there is something at, as Tim explained at the middle school, it is the ruler program. Of course, when we get to the high school, it's a different age of kids. We're, all, we're dealing with almost adults, right? 18 year olds who are seniors. Uh, I, do, I did not see anything in the budget that talks about true emotional and mental health programming. And I'll go back to my uh, statement again. There are kids who can be thriving academically, right? They could have A's, straight A's, but they would be struggling emotionally. They could still log on, they could still submit their homework, but they are struggling. So I guess my question is, I, I don't see in this budget, and if there is something which I've missed, but I think it gives you an opportunity to share with our community and our parents, what the high school does to talk, to address those needs, uh, because there are. And you know, I know, and this is just tangent, because of the way the world is, there are kids who are quarantined back to back and it does affect the family, it affects the kids. So just wanna give you an opportunity and the community to understand how the high school handles this, how we how you address it, parents or children, whatever it is you do. So I think it's important that we all hear about it. Sure, I mean, I, I would start with in terms of staffing, I was fortunate that you know, inherited a school, we had addition of a social worker out of last year's budget. So um, I, I'm, you know, I'm proud to say that I feel that we're um, well staffed in, in that area. Um, additionally, you know, Dr. Silva has been very, very good this year in terms of supporting, for instance, our clubs and activities. Um, we've virtually run, you know, every club and activity that we could. Um, we've run plays, we're still doing our plays. We're doing our, you saw our music concert online, um, obviously been in support of as much as we can safely, you know, run our athletic programs. Dane's done um, weightlifting programs along, you know, all along the way. And so as much as we can interact our students, outside of the classroom environment. Um, that's really been supported um, throughout the year and will continue going into next year. Uh, in terms of our, you know, how on a day-to-day -day basis, certainly our teachers are our greatest avenue 
Um, you know, they're interacting with kids. There's time built into the day in the morning. We're starting a little bit later. Uh, and then the, we have a, in a little bit of time before lunch um, um, of these sort of virtual office hours and meeting times where te teachers are interacting with kids on a one-to-one -one basis. Uh, there's still strong support in this community for our um, writing conferences, which allow our English teachers are meeting face-to-face -face with our students, every single student, numerous times throughout the year. So I could probably keep going on and on and on about ways but um, you know, I'm happy to say that, I, um, again, to, to Tim's point, you know, are we catching every single kid, particularly in this you know, remote environment? I, I'm sure not, but I feel comfortable as we transition back into the building, we have enough supports in place that we're gonna be able to move the kids back uh, and keep them moving in the right direction. Jake, do you wanna speak a little bit about how you all given, and, and you knew this last summer, how you've revamped your um, CIT, process in terms of identifying kids who are flying below the radar or just not responding? Yeah, yeah, great. So um, one of the things, we have a, a pre-referral process that we, we call CIT. And um, the way that it works uh, previously, um, guidance counselors were going through some traditional measures in terms of, I know, contacting, um, contacting contacts from individual teachers and going through grades. And we've revamped the process to bring the teachers really into the fold because we're not seeing kids. And I mean, physically with our eyeballs, the way that we normally would see them, where teachers have now um, a referral process where they can bring the kids to the counselors and to a group of professionals, including all of our mental health professionals, administrators, deans. Uh, and they're all broken up into smaller groups and they sit on a weekly basis uh, and go through this referral list, which comes in every single week and talk about individually, what are we doing for each child, how are we? How are we? How can we intervene on their behalf so that um, you know the 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 contact is much more is much quicker uh, and it's more pincer in terms of planning uh, and the communication feedback with the individual families is quicker too. So they really revamped the process. I would say most importantly, it's a, a much more highly personalized process, which absolutely was necessary this year. I know Jar Jarrett's actually in charge of the guidance department. I, I don't mean to put him on the spot, but I don't know if you want to speak to that a little bit yourself too. Yeah, no, I, I think this year we're really asking all staff uh, to, to identify those students who are in need. Obviously with, with COVID, we've seen so much social emotional issues that don't present in traditional ways. So Dr. Greenwood, I think has really been a, such a strong leader in really ha letting teachers know, like, a, a, you know, we have a, a new form process where teachers could identify students struggling in, in social, emotional and academic ways. Um, as he explained, our traditional way of referrals was, you know, coming from kind of just one source. We're really asking everyone, um, any adult in the building to contribute to identify students who may be struggling. And then we go through a variety of different ways to, to try to re-engage some of these students. Uh, it's, you know, in, in the past, we could have access to students so quickly. We, we, we'll send someone up to the room, you know, we'll bring them down, we'll do a check-in. We found it's been difficult to have a student who's, for whatever reason, struggling to have that, that check-in opportunity. Uh, so we've been, you know, very creative with everything from home visits to, um, you know, Zoom visits and, and calls like these to really try to re-engage those students and, and work with their families to identify areas that, that we can really help them in. So it, it's definitely been um, a challenge for all of our mental health staff, but they've really risen to it. And, and, you know, we just did a review, I think, what was it last week about some of these, you know, contacts and log entries and things that they're doing. And, and it's really quite impressive, all the outreach they've done. If I could just add, and this is like a, a very small example, but hopefully a powerful one. At the beginning of this school year, we um, extended more than we would in a traditional year, the opportunity for our school psychologists and social workers to use Google Hangouts to stay connected with kids, which is something that we really didn't support much in the past for lots of reasons, FERPA being one of them, uh, because it's FERPA uh, those conversations. But for some kids, it has been the thing that has kept them connected because they're anxious to get on a meet, they may not be attending school, the comfort level as they do with texting, we all know sometimes we have a little bit more courage <laughs> when we're not talking to somebody's face or their voice. But doing like trying to be really putting ourselves in the kids shoes and thinking about how can we leverage the things that are valuable to them in communication and in their you know, 
social interactions as a way to stay connected with them. Again, it's not like our only strategy by any stretch, but that's how we tried to approach this year is really from the kids perspective and using something like Google Hangouts, which is, a, for those of you who don't know, it's a chat feature through the Google suite that we have access to because we're a Google district. Um, for a lot of kids has made a very, very big difference in keeping them connected with the adults who are supporting them and not necessarily um, putting them in a spot that they're not comfortable with as, you know, as being on camera can sometimes make us feel. Um, just very quickly, I just want to thank you. Um, uh, being a parent to a freshman, I do want to publicly thank you for me, at least for our family, not having the midterms was great. I mean, these are freshmen, they're already having trouble connecting, right? They have a huge course load, they're adjusting to their homework, uh, assignments, all the new standards, what is, which goes with the rigor of our high school, which we're very proud of. So I think it's great that you have ex you accepted that. And I think from a mental health perspective, I think that was great because you gave them a chance to kind of almost de-stress. So I think personally for us as a family, and I am not sure if I speak for all, but at least for majority of parents who talk to me, I think it was a welcome move. So I do want to publicly thank you in that. And I hope you will continue to keep that in mind as we go forward with this process. And hopefully we go back to normal one day. So thank you. Yeah, hopefully. Margaret? Hi. Um, perhaps, again, thank you also. I, I echo Tina in terms of thank you so much for all the work. And um, But perhaps related to the, this question, perhaps not, is can you help me understand how does the alternative high school show up in this budget? Like what, where are the lines or, or where is it? And then and then probably more importantly, are, are the needs that we have for that alternative high school being met? And I, I don't know. I can imagine potentially that... Um, the students who might need an alternative high school, perhaps after COVID, that I, I don't know if we'd have an increase in the A school. I just wonder what kind of thinking has gone behind that. And again, how that shows up in this budget. Thank you. Yeah, that, that's a great question, Mary. Thank you. Um, in fact, all the people who are part of that answer are, are, are on right now, including you know, Liz and Joe. Um, so the alternative high school, uh, a, a few things. The physical space um, is provided by the town. Um, the maintenance of that space comes through Joe's budget. Um, yep. Um, the staffing, um, in terms of special education staffing, uh, the director and some of ancillary, specific ancillary supports related to special education needs would come through Liz's budget. Um, I provide the actual content area teachers and I would say your um, materials, uh, regular classroom materials, meaning textbooks, um, you know, pens <laughs> come from the high school budget. So truly the town, um, yeah, facilities, special education and the high school all each provide some pieces in order to, to make the, um, the alternative high school run. The, in terms of your question, the needs, um, from, my, from my perspective, the continual conversation that we're, we're working on is about the space itself, Not, hasn't been about the budgeting um, in terms of personnel. It's really been about the physical space. And I know Liz has been involved in this. And so uh, I don't know if she wants yeah. to speak to that maybe a little bit too. Yeah, so um, uh, I have the, the lucky benefit of meeting every two weeks with the leadership at the Alternative High School uh, on a regular basis. And partly because we have new leadership there uh, this school year, but also um, because you know there are best practices and guidelines for running programs such as such as our A school that um, we have goals to continue to evolve over the next coming years. So uh, budgetarily, we don't have uh, a reason to predict that we need to budget differently than we have, but we do plan to consider, you know, how can we evolve the program? For example, how can we improve our vocational opportunities for these students? How can we improve their CTE opportunities because they're communicating to us that they want more CTE opportunities? Um, how can we look towards using what teachers have already been exposed to or trained in or need training in for project-based learning, which is very much known in research to be a successful strategy for students who may participate in programs like this. None of those though right now look like they will have budgetary impacts for us. As far as numbers, um, our A school numbers are very similar to where they were um, a year ago. Um, we have had referrals this school year, but um, I, you'll hear me talk about this a bit um, when we get to the special education and pupil personnel budget. But as of right now, we don't have a, a measurable change that would require us to predict staffing differently. 
just a, a couple of little pieces, um, Margaret, from a budget point of view and from uh, a program programmatic point of view. With respect to budget, it is an obviously it's an arm of our high school. There are some districts that elect to have their alternative site as a separate cost center so they can actually see the different pieces that are um, contributing towards that alternative site. That's not been the case here. So I don't know if that's ever something that the board wants to discuss or not, but that's just something to consider. The other piece that uh, I'm not sure that I heard um, Dr. Hanaway or Dr. Greenwood say is that it is both, it, the program is created for both general education students and special education students. And the great benefit that we have, and obviously through the collaboration with the town, is that we're able to offer a program to students in our community, rather than having students who might otherwise go to different places. And so it, we feel very fortunate and it's a highly regarded program. Um, we have a great staff there. The facilities are something that um, we'll be discussing with the town in terms of next year and what possibilities we may have um, available to us because we may be just growing. We are growing out of that, that particular um, facility. So that's a, a different conversation for a different day, um, but that's just something to, to know. Thank you. Who's next? Liz. Um, so thank you. I have two questions that are, are sort of related, but not really. Um, so I'm going to ask the first one because it's not budget related and I think we need to put it on a parking lot. Um, I'm curious about the use of Google Hangouts for mental health and other social emotional discussions as a HIPAA, potentially a HIPAA or data privacy concern. Um, Google is obviously selling data all over the place, has some security concerns. And I'm concerned that if students say something that is under the protected health realm that we are not storing that inappropriately or allowing others to see it. So I think that's something we just need to ensure is covered somewhere um, because those kind of communications, I work in a regulated industry, I understand free text and things can be said that are um, under different realms of protection than perhaps other data. So just- No different than their emails, but yes. Yeah, but email isn't a fluid communication tool that people tend to talk as though they were not having bars, right? They sit down and think about it and click send. It is a little different. And it's not necessarily on the Google platform on both sides and they can be encrypted and there's a lot of data security considerations there. So I just wanna put that out there um, mm -hmm. that that actually concerns me a little bit. And I wonder if the students and parents are aware of that um, and have signed off that that's an appropriate tool for communication of that kind of information. So just something to consider. Um, the second point is, and I don't know if you addressed it, I didn't quite hear it. Why did we move the data specialist role to the high school and what's the content of that role? What are they doing? What are they doing differently than they were doing before? Um, what is the expectation in terms of dedicating them to the high school? So Dr. Greenwood okay. can speak to all of the last half. The first one though was me. I actually felt like it was not clearly delineated. There was a lot of discussion last last year's budget around the technology department and who's doing what and where. And when, I, when I'm talking to the technology department, they're like, well, he's, this person is at the high school, this person's at the high school, which is really where they're located and all the work that they're doing is specific to the high school. Whereas in the, in the rest of the technology department, you're gonna see that the work is pre-K 12. And so that's the reason that we moved, or I actually asked the, the technology department and the high school to shift that individual over. And we was it was important for you all to see where the difference in money goes. As ter in terms of the work, I'll let Dr. Greenwood speak to that. Sure. Yeah, I, I would be, I'm, I'm happy to talk about our data specialist because he is an absolute gem. You know, we, we have a, a, pers a person in this position that, um, you know, having worked in a few different settings, I've never seen anybody with the capabilities this person has. He is he's amazing. I see Jared shaking his head because I don't know that I can articulate how great he is, but um, what, what he physically does is he's, uh, you, as you can imagine, we move an incredible amount of data every single day, every day. Every teacher, every period, for instance, is putting in attendance. Um, you've got all, every single student's schedule constantly, constant shifts in scheduling. Um, You've got, um, for instance, with COVID tracking, everything that we've done in terms of tracking students with um, quarantining, he's able to take all the data in, um, have pushed it directly to teachers so that it's uh, automatically showing up on their screens and not chasing, chasing down who's quarantined, who's not. He makes runs reports all day long. It's, hey, I'm wondering, can you tell me, 
you know, what it would be if you look at, you know, ninth graders who take PE and their average score in their lab, you know, science lab class that dovetails it. And he's able to put that out. He is um, really, I would call him our efficiency center. That'd be the best way to explain it. Um, he, he's absolutely amazing. And Jarrett works very, very closely with him in terms of scheduling. And so he may want to tout his praises a little bit too from, from, from his end. Yeah, I think the position's great because it really frees up so many other people's time, uh, teachers especially. So right now, um, you know, we, we had an issue um, just as the year has gone on with students going in and out of cohorts uh, due to quarantine and due to, you know, parental choice. So, so we can, are so concerned with safety and security. We wanted to make sure our teachers knew who, who was supposed to be in front of them in the room. So uh, our data specialist designed uh, a program literally within PowerSchool with his own coding where teachers can basically just click on the day and it'll give them a breakdown right on their screen of, of what students are should be present what students are home um and you know that, that's by class that's that's live data so he really just when there's a problem that's slowing down um especially in this covid covid age with our teachers he, he can you know troubleshoot that very, very quickly and very rapidly uh so I, I think everyone just sees him as a great resource when you hit that wall of you know what do i do in terms of gathering yeah. this data or monitoring attendance um you know, all the grading processing, quarter reports, um, you know, transcript information, all that stuff, every kind of piece of data that students are going to own um, as they leave the high school, that, that's all also managed by him. So awesome. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. He sounds like a great person to have on the team. So um, thank you for that. Thank you. Nora. All right. This is just a clarifying question, but um, on the um, under pupil, pupil personnel, um, I just wondered what the explanation, um, the line titled college guides is. I wonder what that means. I've had two, um, two kids go through the high school. I have no idea what that means. Nora, can you clarify which line are you looking at? Um, it's under pupil personnel and it's, um, it's a titled college guides. Oh, so not under the high school, under under Dr. Hannaway, uh, Dr. Hannaway's cost center? Or are we looking well, at underneath the high school? No, it, well, it's under pupil personnel, but I, I did assume it was under the high school, though perhaps it's not. No, that's within my budget. All right, we can table that then. Nora, I'm happy to jump into that when we, when I present later on. That's good. Great. Kathleen, you want to go next? Hi, again, thank you again. You know, my goodness, the work, it's, it's amazing. And I don't even have a child in the school system, but I'm, I'm impressed. Um, just, you know, just for clarification, um, on the um, increase in the budget for teachers, it seems most, of course, are contractual, but I see there's a reduction that could be a salary in arts and, and, a, and an increase in science. Just for clarification for everybody, is that, am I interpreting that correctly? Uh, to be perfectly honest with you, I'm not sure if, if Karen wants to, because I, oh, I didn't. Okay. <laughs> Karen will yeah, answer that. That's actually a Dawn question, if it comes to the actual budget lines and where things are placed. Oh, okay. It just says art teacher, there's a reduction of 65.9, which could be. And then in the science teacher line, it's 141,000. That could be a very experienced science teacher. So I was just curious, but if you don't have it right now, that's fine. But I just yeah. figured for clarity. Um, on the art side there, yeah, that's 11% down in, in art teaching, uh, but there is also a point. Mm -hmm. So I think I can, for I, increase I, on, on, on FTE. I can try to elaborate a little bit on how um, the staffing then translates down to the business office and how they adjust their budget lines to some extent. Um, so this year, we always staff according to student needs. So when we're preparing a budget, we don't have that registration. So around February of each um, year, uh, the course registrations goes out to students. And then that spring, we determine, and I work very closely with Mr. Pepe, to determine where do we need to put our FTE and which classes do we need to staff. There was a reduction um, due to student registration in the visual and performing arts. So there were less um, art teachers this year in response to that. So um, likely accordingly, the budget um, 
downstairs and makes adjustments to where the actual people are. And so you'll see variations across the departments based upon our registration and then obviously what we project for next year as well. I just want to be clear though, Kathleen, we didn't reduce art programming at the high school. So I don't want to confuse Correct. <laughs> Okay. I, I, I know. I guess why I wanted clarification. I just had a little bit of a heart palpitation. No, no, no. We're, we're showing a 0.4 increase in FTE in that, but we are showing a, a decrease in salary line. It was That's just for right. the question. And in, in, in also, when you're looking at the budget, it's budget to budget. So it's last year's budget to what we're projecting for next year's budget. If there's turnover in actual um, positions where we have a new person coming in at a lower scale versus a person who's gone out at a higher scale or a person who's moved up at a higher scale based on the contractual obligations, you're going to see that variation um, throughout the whole budget book on salary lines. Thank you. Rachel, did you have a question? I have a question about the um, space going back to the alternative high school. And this is just an idea and I don't know if we can do this, but you know, there are beautiful spaces in town, office spaces that could possibly benefit in supporting vocations and providing that bridge for our students in our community. Um, I obviously would leave the curriculum and piece up to the experts here. Um, I don't know the curriculum of the alternative high school, but if a purchase could be made possibly on the town side for that, um, you know, maybe it could be rented out when it's not being used and then creating revenue for the town. So it actually might work to benefit um, both the community and the school. Any thought on that? So well, yes. Um, yeah, I was gonna say, I think that's a Dr. DeSilva question. Yeah, Sorry. that's definitely, it just took me a little longer to get off mute. Uh, throw the ball. <laughs> is that yes, um, Rachel, we are planning on having that discussions. We, uh, we look to set up a meeting with uh, First Selectman Marconi um, in the near future so that we can start seeing what's, what is available to us and or any ideas or suggestions that folks may have, again, as we're outgrowing the space. Thank you. I have a question. Um, We're just, we're just projecting enrollment to be down about 50 students. Correct. But it was also down about 50 last year, another 50 the year before, another 50 the year before that. And the building leadership has stayed the same. Is there a, a point at which we can expect a change to be made and we're just not to that point yet? Or, or how else should we be looking at that? Yeah, I think you, you hit the nail squarely on, on the head, Jonathan, that we're not at that point, but that's a, a, a continual conversation. Um, so what we do is we looked at um, just recently the number of 12 month administrators uh, in this building in terms of student size and looked at the rest of our DERG. Um, and when looking at that, we're, we're right on, right on um, par with the, our colleagues. Now, they don't necessarily use their 12 month administrators in the same way um, in terms of naming them assistant principals versus director of guidance versus director of special education. But in terms of full 12 months, we're, we're exactly there. However, as you move down into the range of um, you know, 1,300 kids versus 15 or 17, there's definitely a, a point where you know, at 150, 200 less students, we, it, we wouldn't be doing a prudent job if we didn't say you know, there's a, uh, a reduction in FTE, not just in administration, but frankly, probably you know, in other areas too, um, because you just won't have the students to support the, uh, the sizes that, that you need. So um, I think that, you know, realistically, we're two years away from um, coming to you with a, a presentation of, um, you know, a reduction, in, assuming that the, that the class, excuse the population continues to decrease. Um, but it is, that, that hasn't fallen on deaf ears and been a pretty continual conversation that you know, Dr. Sullivan and I have, have had moving forward. And in terms of, there's a NIAS recommendation you saw um, in terms of, looking at coordination between the middle school and the high school um, in terms of curriculum. And so I think we see some opportunity over the next couple of years too, to look at how the actual administration is set up as the population decreases, looking at maybe some other actual administrative structures. So not this year, not next year, but look to see it come to us 
So I would, uh, John, I would say that not this year, particularly because coming out of this, uh, the pandemic, I really, I really think that it doesn't warrant uh, a reduction in that because of the amount of interaction that they're having in terms of running the interventions. Um, next year, if uh, Dr. Silva and I were to move forward with some of our articulation plans for 6 to 12 um, administrative roles, we might be looking at that. Um, but if that, that is not realized, I don't think next year would be. The year after, I believe, would be a, a, you know, would be a reality. You haven't even seen the building in full swing yet, right, since you got here. That's, that's the absolute truth and something that's made me super, super hesitant to make any actual you know, cuts uh, in, with a 50 student reduction because I haven't been able to walk down the halls and, and see all the kids in eight years. Um, you know, so you're, you're again, hit the nail squarely on the head. So at, at least with a one year grace period to kind of get things off the ground. Another small question. Uh, on tech ed, technology education, it's projecting to go down in enrollment, but mm -hmm. up in the number of courses being provided to give us only 11 students per class. Um, explain how, we're, how we would justify you know, adding, adding staff to a smaller group of students. Jared, out did wanna, Jared, did you wanna speak to that? Yeah, so our in looking at our, our student enrollment trends, um, our, our, about three years ago, we were at like 1% of students had a technology ed request and, and our program really was at, at a low point in terms of student enrollments. Uh, we've had some excellent teachers come in and present to you some, some new courses and, and really revive the program. So we're up from 1% to almost 5% in the 2021 year of students taking a technology course. So with the new courses being proposed, and with some realignment um, in, in our Project Lead the Way courses, we do anticipate the need for, for more technology um, education staffing. In terms of student enrollment projections, um, if you can direct me to, to a page, I can better respond to that. But in general, we, we do anticipate our staffing, our student enrollments and our um, staffing needs and technology to go up. Okay, yeah, I'm just looking at the, the, the basic page with projected enrollments and, and FTEs and it's showing only a 56 so, student projected projection. Sure. So Jonathan, I'll take a look at that in uh, conjunction with Mr. Pepe um, and make sure that that uh, number did uh, get uh, updated to properly reflect what they think. So I will check okay. that out for you. Thank you. Anyone else? Margaret. Um, I don't know if this has a budgetary implication, but I'm, so I'm gonna put it out there, um, is I know that the high school this year for COVID reasons went to the block schedule. I wonder if that, if there's thought on whether that's gonna continue, but again, I don't know if that even has a budgetary impact and if this is the right forum for asking that question, but I thought I'd put it out there. Yeah, that's, yeah thanks for, for bringing that up, Marie. So look, going to next year, you know, we've already made a decision that, um, we likely have to stay with the block style schedule because of just the uncertainty. You know, we all want to think that we're coming coming back into, you know, again, quote unquote, normal situation, but you know, that's definitely not a foregone conclusion. And frankly, we have to get moving with scheduling. Um, we just have to start planning for next year. So we're going to have to keep a similar style schedule in order to um, potentially, because there's that potential need for social distancing the way we have right now, you know, we have no, uh, you know, no reason to believe that we won't be in a similar situation. So we have to at least pre prepare for it. And the block style schedule lets us do that. So we've actually had a group of um, teachers working together. We sent the student survey out this week uh, and collected information from, uh, so far, we're over five or 600 students giving us some feedback on the schedule. So we're anticipating um, tinkering with the schedule um, and making it better for our students moving forward. Um, but it won't have an impact in terms of the budget because essentially you're taking an eight period day and just breaking it over two days. You're running, you can imagine where instead of having a 45 minute period for eight times, you're having a 90 minute period every other day. So it's, re it's, really, uh, it's really the same if you really wanna think of it that way. Um, now, moving forward, again, we could look at some different ways to schedule, but I don't think we're prepared to do that going into next year just based on the uncertainty. Thank you. Anyone else? Thank you very much, Dr. Greenwood. Thank you, I appreciate the opportunity, thank you.
Should I move right into athletics? Good morning, everyone. Thanks for your time here today. I know for all of you, it's an extremely long day. And for some of us that are popping in and out, it's just a small piece, but I've uh, been in the on deck circle for a little while waiting. So uh, before I jump into my athletics budget, I did just want to make a couple of quick comments right off the top. And that is um, the first one is there's, there was a lot of talk and, and a question from Tina, I believe about the mental health of our students. And I can tell you without fail that everything we've been able to do in athletics this year, I think has been instrumental in helping our kids stay connected, keep that positive outlook on things. And so, you know, we, we had some setbacks. Certainly our fall um, wasn't exactly what we wanted it to look like. Uh, the football team wasn't able to, to play the game the way they normally do, but trying to roll with the punches and, and continue to offer opportunities. I, I'm very pleased with the work of our department and our coaches to continue to keep our kids engaged. Uh, the second thing is I just wanted to mention that uh, there was talk about our data specialist at the high school, Evan Jones, and I will throw him some kudos as well because Evan is phenomenal. He um, helps us with our athletic reports uh, and, and helps us, gives us the ability in, to work through PowerSchool to handle all of the registration, the paperwork, everything that has to happen on a on a day-to-day -day basis. So just wanted to to throw my support behind Evan as well. So um, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. And we'll jump into my budget. Okay. I assume you all can see that. All right. Give it a second, Dane. It's just loading. Gotcha. Try again. No, I think you're, I think you're up. For some reason, it doesn't seem to want to load in with full screen mode. Can anyone confirm that? Uh, it, it seems that way. So why don't you go with the partial screen? Okay. We can still see it, I think. Okay. Why don't we give it a try? Sounds can, good. Yeah. So with my athletics budget, obviously, I always start with our mission statement for Ridgefield Public Schools, because everything that we do um, in the department, even though it's extracurricular, it's central to how we operate. Um, as I mentioned, one thing that's become abundantly clear over the past year is just how important participation in athletics is for the wellness of body and mind uh, for our student athletes. I also include the vision of a successful graduate because these core values that we look to um, establish and build in each one of our students as they work through Ridgefield High School, there's often no better way to reinforce these than through athletic settings. Uh, team sports teach collaboration, athletes learn to communicate effectively with their coaches and their teammates, um, and competition, whether it's for a spot on a team or against an opponent, teaches resilience in ways that, that few lessons can. A snapshot of the athletics department overall. Um, it is an integral part of the RHS experience for, for a majority of students. We're still at about roughly 55% of RHS students participating annually, many in multiple seasons. Our 36 sports across three seasons does include three seasons of unified sports, which was an addition a couple years back. I'm proud to report that that program continues to do very well and engage quite a few of our, our special education students and um, and uh, other students as partners as they work through three different seasons of sport. One thing to note there is that that number of 36 sports does not include our two club sports. And the reason they're not included in there is that they are not varsity sports yet. They are club sports and therefore self-funded. But I mention them only because um, through our club sport process, it is possible that in the coming year or two, you may see a request um, to transition one of those club sports to a varsity sport. Our two current club sports are club rugby, which competes in the spring and is in their sixth year now, and club fencing, which was, um, many of you will remember was approved last year as a, as a winter sport. We do have a high level of success within our athletics department. Our individual athletes receive accolades, whether it's all league, all state, all New England, all American, um, each year. And we do have quite a few who head off to play at the college level. We had a fall signing ceremony this year that included 12 different students signing their letters of intent. Uh, certainly looked a little bit different than normal. <laughs> we had to do it 
one group at a time and, and make sure we clean the, the photo spots in between, but um, we were still happy to, to make that a part of their experience. And at the bottom, you see a quick snapshot of, you know, this is the period that I pride myself on because I started in fall of 2016. So since, uh, since that time up to the current, the, just this past fall, we've had 20 FCAC divisional titles, 14 FCAC championships, eight state championships, and one CISL, that's the Ski League Championship. Uh, we've also been recognized twice by our league for overall program excellence. And each year we, we win sportsmanship awards. This past year, both our boys and girls basketball teams, in addition to winning the FCAC, also received sportsmanship awards from the officials organization. Dane, do you want me to, Jake can actually try to project this just because the, the font is quite little. Do okay. you want to just hang on one sec? And well, let me Jake give it one more shot here. Let's see if we can. Are you working with a Chromebook? I am. Oh, there we go. One of the ones we'll replace. Okay. <laughs> Here we go. Is Thank that better? Can you see? That's much better. Thank okay, great. So this is the historical athletics budget breakdown. Now I know uh, some members of the board have been on the board for a couple of years. And so you'll remember that the athletics budget can be a little bit complicated, um, but for benefit of everybody, and certainly for those who are new to the board, I want to give a quick overview. So the total athletics budget is actually built from several different revenue streams. Um, by far, the largest chunk is the Board of Ed contribution each year, which makes up about 73% of the total athletics budget. The remaining 27% comes from pay to participate fees, gate receipts, facility and field rentals, and depending on the year, has also included transfers from the fund balance. And so those are the columns that you see in front of you there. Uh, this current year that we're in, the 2021 school year, the total athletic, athletics budget is a little over $1.6 million dollars with a Board of Ed contribution of $1,151,810. The anticipated um, revenue streams that you see there um, certainly are a question this year. Our, typically, we, we bring in about $312,000 in pay-to-participate fees. We're not going to hit that number this year. Uh, the gate receipts of $48,000, we likely will not hit that number this year. Uh, the field and facility rentals we may, um, it, there's still some time left as we work through the spring to see if, if there's an opportunity to get to that number. But certainly athletics is not immune to the effects of COVID just like everybody else. So we'll keep an eye on those numbers as we move forward. On the far right, you see that part of this year's budget was $115,000, almost $116,000 transfer from the fund balance. And so um, last spring, there was a lot of question about if there, was, if there were funds left over in athletics at the end of last year, which we anticipated because the spring season did not exist. Um, and so we, we didn't have pay to participate last spring, but we also didn't have all the expenses of the spring season. We did end up with a surplus in the fund balance. And so this year, the Board of Ed contribution was decreased by roughly that 116,000. And if it, there is a need for that, then we would transfer that in. Um, looking ahead to next year, the total athletics budget that I'm requesting is $1,586,510. Um, that's roughly a $57,000 decrease or about 3.5%. And I'll speak to some of the changes and reasons for that decrease in just a moment. Uh, the Board of Ed contribution toward that would be a little over 1.2 million with the remainder coming from pay to participate fees and gate receipts. One change going forward, and you'll see that reflected on the second to last column, the facility and field rentals, is that going forward, that is zeroed out. Um, this is a process change where currently certain facility rentals and usage fees run through the facilities budget through Joe Moritz. And when it was athletics related, it ran and became part of my budget. And the, the mindset going forward is to have those run the same way. And so the uh, rentals that will come in related to athletics fee, athletic facilities fees going forward will run through the facilities budget. In addition, the custodial overtime um, had been separated out and part of my budget, but going forward, that also will be part of Joe's budget. So roughly that's $16,000 in revenue that will not be reflected in the athletics budget, but it's also roughly $22,000 of custodial overtime that will not be um, an expense that is shown in the athletics budget. The budget components I've shown here, um, by far the biggest chunk of our budget goes towards salaries. So that includes all our full-time employees of the department. That's myself, the athletic secretary, athletic trainers, our facility manager, and roughly 100 paid coaching stipends. 
Um, that makes up about 57.4% of our budget. And from this current year to next year, that's, that will be an increase of about $7,500. Purchase services and officials is the next largest chunk. That red section that you see makes up about 18.4% of the budget. And that is expected to go up roughly $3,000 next fall. And in both of those, the salaries and the purchase services, um, and mainly the officials fees there, you know, these are incremental changes that we see on the coaching side and stipends. It's a, it's a slight bump because of a step from one year to the next. And likewise, um, all of our our officials organizations contract with the CIAC. And so we'll see just a minor increase from one year to the next. Uh, but when you multiply by the number of officials we have over the course of a year, it, it translates to about a $3,000 increase overall. Transportation makes up about 12.3% overall. Um, that's up almost $3,000. And materials, dues, supplies, that also includes uh, uniforms and reconditioning. That makes up about 10% overall, 10.2%. And that's where we're actually going to see the biggest decrease from this current year to next year. Um, and there's a couple of reasons for that. The first one is that part of our current year's budget was a pole vault mat system. Our pole vault landing system is um, almost 20 years old. And so that was due to be replaced. So I'm happy that that, that is actually happening out of this year's budget. And then we also had uh, several teams that were in line for uniforms this year. And so as we work forward from this year to next year, you'll see in the budget book some decreases in those materials lines for different sports of, of a couple thousand dollars here and there. Um, that's because we were able to purchase those uniforms this year um, and will not need to do that next year. So that makes up a decrease of roughly $43,000 overall. And then the support personnel makes up the remaining 1.7% of the budget. And again, as I mentioned a moment ago, that is actually going to show a decrease of 22500 uh, due to the fact that the custodial overtime that would typically be shown there is going to be in the facilities budget instead. There's one other shift that you might see as you're looking through the lines in the budget book, and that is um, in regards to athletic trainers. So we had an athletic trainer line that over the last couple of years was $25,000. And some of you may recall that we have a full-time athletic trainer at the high school, and historically we had a part-time athletic trainer and that's what the $25,000 was. It was a contract with, um, with uh, Richfield Physical Therapy where we had a part-time trainer. Over the course of last year, uh, we actually shifted that so that we, that position evolved into um, a part-time athletic trainer and a part-time strength and conditioning coach. And so you'll see those two changes in the budget book, the, the athletic trainer line being decreased by $25,000, but you'll see the offsets for those in the athletic trainer and facility manager line as well as the athletic trainer and strength and conditioning line show the increases. I always like to share the Durgay comparison of athletic budgets. Um, and I will preface this by saying I did not get new data from some of this, the schools that we typically show here. So on the left, you'll see Joel Barlow, New Canaan and Staples. This is um, information from this current school year that we're in the 1920, I'm sorry, two years ago, the 1920 budget information, Darian, Weston and and ourselves, that is the information based on the 2021 uh, budgets that we have in place for this year. So I just share this because you can see that, that as you look across, there is a wide range of how athletic budgets are built. Um, some of them include pay to participate, some don't. All of them have some sort of other revenue stream besides just board of ed funds. Um, and on the far right, you'll see some of those notes. You know, the, Let's take a look at Joel Barlow, for instance, their total athletics budget of 1.2 million. Uh, does not include roughly $140,000 from boosters and gate receipts. Um, when you go down a little bit further, if you look at Staples, it does not include about $100,000 of gate receipts and parking fees. And in Staples, they actually have additional coaches and items that are, that are paid for by boosters. So, you know, our budget is one that provides all of those things. We try to be as transparent with our funding sources as possible. So our budget for this year, as, as mentioned, does include roughly 16,000 in rentals, 48,000 in gate receipts, and a fund balance transfer um, in this current year. I would welcome the opportunity in the future to have a philosophical discussion about pay to participate. It's something that I know I've mentioned to the board in the past. Um, and so certainly I'll, I'm always open to having that conversation, whether or not that's still the, the direction that the, the board wants to go. Um, as you can see, the Board of Ed contribution or the, the money that comes from the board of, ed, board of Ed when you look at it on a per student basis, uh, we are at the bottom of the Durge, but we um, continue to um, provide safe opportunities, provide for our teams what they need in order to be competitive.
from one year to the next. Proposed five-year capital and large equipment plan. So we've, I, I've listed these in the past and I just wanted to give an update on where some of these things land. Um, as I mentioned, the new pole vault landing system was part of this year's athletics budget to the tune of roughly $20,000. Uh, we did purchase that, it arrived last week. And so once, the, once we're into warmer weather, we'll be happy to put that out and see what it looks like in use for the first time. The next two on the list there are to replace the RHS track and replace the turf on the Tiger Hollow Stadium field. Those are both nearing the end of their useful life. And I'm happy to report that we've worked very closely, um, we being myself, uh, Joe Bornstein through Tiger Hollow Inc., which is one of our nonprofit organizations that supports athletics, um, as well as Dennis DePinto with Parks and Rec, and, and Rudy and Kevin Redman with the town um, to work together to make those projects happen. And so $550,000 that you see for the RHS track was actually approved. It is in this year's town capital. And as we look forward, we are working with them to tackle that next piece, um, hopefully, so that we could do that project all at once. Uh, we'll be replacing the track this summer and it makes sense since the turf is due to be replaced as well to try to get it all done in one shot as opposed to the facility being under construction for a long period of time. The next one on the list is football helmets and we are chipping away at that. Um, there was some money built into this year's budget and materials to, to purchase some helmets, which was done and we'll be uh, doing the same going forward. So over the course of the next couple of years, uh, there will be a slightly increased budget in um, football materials than, than some of the others because of those, those helmet purchases. When you look forward, there are two things coming down the pike. Uh, one of them is to resurface the RHS tennis courts. Uh, for those of you who might be tennis players, you know that we had some work done on the courts um, last year. Actually, pro I'm going to go back. It was the fall of 2019. Um, we actually were looking forward to using them last year, all repaired and wonderful, and then our season was canceled. So we didn't get to use them last spring, but they're still in okay shape. But as you go forward, tennis courts in New England are a difficult thing. They're constantly freezing and heaving and cracking. And so one of the options that is out there is a process where you use post-tension concrete to replace those courts, and it's guaranteed to be crack-free for 20 years. Um, certainly a more expensive option than just doing repairs on the existing uh, but I've been speaking with Dennis DePinto at Parks and Rec. I believe he has a placeholder in his budget um, to actually try to tackle the courts at Yanity um, next year with this process. And so we would look a couple of years out to, to continue to work with uh, the town to, to hopefully go with that route the next time we need to make a major repair to the RHS tennis courts. And the last one on the list is to replace the, the turf on Tiger Hollow 2. Um, that field was installed in 2013 and it's holding up extremely well. And so we think that over the next couple of years, uh, we'll begin to start the work at, at looking when that one will need to be replaced as well. We do continue to have strong partnerships with Tiger Hollow Inc. and the Athletics Advisory Council. And, and most of our sports do have individual booster clubs. Um, and I'm really pleased with the collaborative approach that we've had with the town over the course of this year on, on the upcoming Tiger Hollow project. Um, I look forward to discussing with the budget and finance subcommittee on uh, Monday, the possibility of putting any remaining fund balance at the end of this year towards this project. Um, it's certainly something that benefits our athletics department uh, tremendously. And so if there's a way that we can contribute towards that project at the end of this year, that would be uh, my intention. But overall, this uh, request that I put in front of you today for the 21-22 athletics budget is designed to continue to support our large interscholastic athletic department. It is, as I said, one of the largest in the state and as well as all of New England. And it allows our student athletes to compete um, within the FCAC and the CIAC. We do always wanna provide transparency, accuracy and clarity of how allocated funds are used. And so that's a, another piece that, um, it, the, the athletics budget in its current format is complicated. and. Uh, there's all these different funding sources. As you can see in this one, we're actually looking to move one of those funding sources into the facilities. And so this is another topic that Don and I will be discussing with the budget and finance subcommittee on Monday as a potential shift to the accounting process uh, to allow for some improved clarity on, on how everything works. This budget allows us to meet our contractual obligations with our coaching staff and our external vendors and continue to promote athletic opportunities for both our male and female students. And, and basically, it, it allows us to maintain what we're doing. Um, and our athletic department is highly respected. It's a source of pride for our community. And the budget that I bring to you today will allow us to continue next year um, with the same goals in mind. So 
So I will pause there. And I'm happy to answer any questions that you might have about it. Uh, I, I'll go, Dane. Just a quick, easy one for you. Um, well, maybe not. We are assuming the gate receipts and boosters will be equivalent to prior years. Given COVID and fall and all of that unknown, um, how comfortable are you with that 48,000 number given everything going on? For this year or for next year, Liz? For next year. For next year, um, I, I'm actually optimistic on that. Uh, I do think that as we continue to move forward, you know, certainly this, nothing's been normal. So when you look at this past fall, we, we certainly did not have some of our big events, you know, traditionally our five football games, our five football home games bring in the biggest amount of gate receipts. We didn't have those, but we did still have events that brought in smaller crowds and we were able to get some of that. Um, after football, the next biggest one that brings in gate receipts is boys basketball. And it remains to be seen right now whether we're going to have fans in attendance at those. I know it was a topic of discussion with the, amongst superintendents yesterday. So, you know, without that this year, um, I, I'm not as optimistic about this current year as I am when I look forward to next year. I think okay. by next year, I think uh, the virus will be at a point where we will be able to safely manage larger crowds than we were this year. Um, and so hopefully we'll be, we'll be back on track in terms of gate receipts. Okay, thanks. Yep. Sean? Um, the uh, sinking fund for the field replacement, does that exist yet? I, I'm still unclear on that because it sounded like the board was to contribute to that every year. It wasn't happening. The fund existed. It didn't exist. Does it? So, yes, the fund does exist. It's on the town side and there's a contribution from the town each year towards the sinking fund. Um, it's actually set up as, as uh, two separate parts. One goes towards the replacement of Tiger Hollow 1 and the other one towards Tiger Hollow 2. And don't quote me on the number, but I believe in total it's roughly $68,000 a year uh, that the town puts into that sinking fund. Um, but the board, addition, the board was supposed to contribute to that as well, weren't we? So there's been some discussion about that. Um, from what we can find or, or can't find in minutes and going back through meetings, there's never been a formal process where that has happened. Um, and so that's actually one of the things that Don and I hope to talk about with the budget subcommittee meeting is a change in our structure that would allow us to consistently make that contribution um, year after year so that we can you know, be in a better spot next time around than we, than we have been in the past when it comes to these big ticket items. And are the tennis courts going to last till 2024? I, I've seen them. They aren't good. Well, have you been up there recently? Not in the last, uh, I don't know, since COVID. Okay. So, so they're actually much better. Um, as I said, the last time that we had a project, um, Dennis DePinto and the, the Parks and Rec budget covered the vast majority of it. We were able to contribute some from the athletic side uh, to make the repairs that were needed. So as of last spring, they were in very good shape, probably the best they've been since I've been here. Um, you know, unfortunately for us, our teams didn't get to compete, but they have been used a lot by the community over the course of this year. And, uh, and they're in pretty good shape right now. Um, you know, as I said, it, it, it's tennis courts in New England. And so every year when they, they're covered with snow and they freeze and they thaw and the, and the cracks expand. So we, you really never know until the snow melts in the spring what you're looking at. Um, which is always tough for us because it's right, you know, it butts right up against the start of our season. And on top of that, if there are issues, you need to wait until it's warm enough to make the repairs. So it, it's constantly a challenge, which is part of the reason why I would look forward to doing this post-tension concrete approach. Um, certainly a more expensive approach. You know, I, I, again, don't quote me on the numbers, but I want to say the last time we did repairs, it was about $80,000. And again, most of that came from the Parks and Rec budget to do the repairs on both the high school courts and the Yanity courts. Um, but, you know, this is significantly more than that, but it's guaranteed to, to last for, for, I believe it's 20 years guaranteed with no cracking. And so that's definitely, in my opinion, the best way to go. And I know uh, Director DePinto over at Parks and Rec feels the same way. Other questions? Rachel? Um, first, thank you so much, Dean. Um, I think your presentation was very transparent and it was very comprehensive of the athletic budget. Um, also going forward, I just wanted to circle back to something that you said, Dean, and 
Jonathan, perhaps, you know, Monday night when we look at the master agenda, would it work, Dean, to maybe think about having pay to play conversation on a future agenda item? Absolutely. Um, as I've said on a couple of different occasions in the past, I'm happy to discuss pay to participate. Um, philosophically, it's something that is a, a challenge and it's, it's always been interesting to me why we single out particular pieces of the overall high school experience and charge fees for that. Um, not to mention when you look at the vast majority of pay to participate structures, they become more and more challenging over time because unless you're constantly increasing your pay to participate rates, you're not gonna keep up with the typical inflation rates from one year to the next. Now we've been at $225 per student per, per sport since I've been here. Um, things that I've thrown out sort of in passing, but I'm happy to dig into in a lot more detail would be things like family caps or you know, some, something that gives the families of our student athletes um, a break as they go through the year. I mean, I know I, I know there are, are parents of student athletes on this call right now. And so if you've got multiple students at the high school playing multiple sports, it's, it's significant. Um, in addition to that, there are all these behind the scenes pieces to pay to participate that are challenging. Um, you know, we do offer a waiver, but that creates for some people an embarrassing situation and, and they, you know, they don't pursue those when maybe they could. Um, in addition, it, you know, it creates a situation for me and my department where you know, we're constantly chasing people um, to, to try to, to rectify any outstanding fees. So there are challenges um, that are created by the pay to participate system. Um, and I know that I've mentioned in the past, but I'll, I'll just mention it again. When I was in Simsbury, they had um, a pay to participate structure in place. And before I left, we kind of put in place a five-year plan to phase it out. Uh, whether or not they've, they've finished that process, I don't know, but I know that was the plan. And so I, I'd be happy to at least have the discussion and see if that's something that we want to talk about here. And if we want to develop a plan, I'd be happy to do that. Thank you, Dean. Did, yep. Did yeah. Jonathan, you talk about that then? We will have the uh, discussion around uh, upcoming, we will, we will, it's on the agenda on uh, Monday night. Okay. Thank you. Um, Okay, Jonathan, I can go. Rachel, you're done? Yeah, you're, you're up. All right, uh, thank you, Dane. Um, I, I don't know if this is the correct spot to ask this question, but um, I know that the SERM turf is falling apart and then you talked about the RHS turf and the replacement. So, and I know RHS students, athletes do use the turf. So has there been any discussion? Is there any conversation? Is it a Joe Moretz question? Is it a town question? Are we talking about replacing it? Because I remember when my child was at Scottsridge, he would literally bring pieces of turf every single, I mean, it's huge. It's literally falling apart. So um, I, I don't know if this is the right spot. I do want to bring it up, but. Yeah, I'm happy to talk about that. In fact, that turf is the oldest of all of them. It's the original carpet that is bordered. You know, I think it's pushing 20 years old at this point. Um, and, and, and it's unique because it is right next to Scottsridge. Obviously the Scottsridge PE classes use it. Um, but it is owned and, and maintained by the town. And so um, the sinking fund process was not established right when that turf was put in. So they've been behind in terms of uh, building up that sinking fund. Back to Sean's question about sinking funds, there is a separate fund, a separate sinking fund for the Scottsridge turf, which again, don't quote me on the numbers, but I think it's roughly 400 and some thousand at this point. And so we've actually done a lot of work over the last couple of months um, and I believe when the town, when, when the Board of Selectmen meets about their budgets over the coming weeks, I believe they're going to present two options that may include um, replacing the, the turf at Scotts Ridge as well. Um, obviously, if you're doing a big project like this, you're talking about the track, the turf at Tiger Hollow. If you were to include the turf at Scotts Ridge, then you, you can stand to have some savings due to economies of scale and some of the expenses of, of mobilizing a project like that. So it has been part of the discussion as we move forward. And at this point, it's going to be up to the Board of Selectmen and Board of Finance as to whether or not they want to include that field as part of this project and part of the, you know, part of the capital process going forward and ultimately probably part of the um, part of the referendum next next spring. Great. Just Thank to clarify, you. The, the Board of Education doesn't have a mechanism to to put money into any sort of sinking fund. Uh, whatever money is left over at the end of each year's budget season uh, is remains with the town and the town could then put those monies into a sinking fund on our behalf. But the Board of Education does not have a mechanism with which to fund such such a fund. Thank you, Dean. You're welcome. Other questions? OK, 
Ken. That's right. Um, it's just, a, a, I guess, more of a comment or a, a, I want to make a point of clarity on uh, uh, Dane. If you if you go back to your comparison of the athletic budgets, um, I, you know, when you when you are looking at the the BOE, the column, the Board of Ed dollars per student, um, I, I think it's important to, to point out that that's that if you actually look at the students that are benefiting from from that money, it's actually fifty five percent of the student body, as you pointed out. So really the, really we're spending about $1,400 per student. That's a, that's a student athlete. So yeah, that's, a, that's a valid point, Ken. And, and I I'm happy to look at that comparison. If you like, I could go back through the, the other Durgay schools and see what their number of athletes is compared to their number of students. Um, well, I know you did it just for comparison here, but I yep. just think it's, a, it's an important point of clarity. Um, to I'll, just to point, point that out. That was yep. all. Ultimately, my goal is that we that we, all of our students would be participating, but but your point Agreed. is well taken. Agreed. And, but are there, you know, like I know you, I know we mentioned, and it was and it was such an important part of um, the the uh, social and emotional wellness. Um, you know, was the training, um, and and I know, you know, that that while not while it's not necessarily a, a organized. lost your, your voice again, Ken. We can feel the passion with his hands. That important. I, uh, well, I think I missed a question in there, Ken, but I, I can tell I'm you, sure. I, I'll just reiterate again that, that having kids back involved doing what they do, I can't tell you how how happy everybody was this week. I mean, when I walked past the gym and, and basketball tryouts are taking place and, you know, the fact that they have to wear masks, you would think people would be miserable, but they weren't. You can see them smiling the behind their masks and, and mm -hmm. um, you know, the challenges that they had, that they're willing to take on just to be back with their teammates and with their coaches and, and working out. And, you know, it's, it's been great. So it was definitely a very positive week for our athletic department. And uh, as we work through the next couple of weeks of preseason and, and hopefully gear up for, for competitions come February 8th, um, you know, I'm excited about what lies ahead for our kids. Get that. Oh, I broke oh, up again. Can I try one more time? Yeah, sure. Okay. Oh, sorry. So, and it, it, it really was was is there a, is there a way that that maybe students who aren't necessarily participating in in, in a, a sport, an organized sport, could benefit from like some of the strength training or or some of the other um, aspects of the programs that you run? Yeah, absolutely. So, in a traditional year, we have our weight room open three days a week for any anyone at the at RHS. Um, this year's been a little bit more challenging because of the limitations on weight rooms and whatnot. We've had to prioritize our in season programs, so that's been a little bit of a challenge to create those opportunities. But we do have those options typically. Um, and the other thing I would add is we've had more and more students involved in terms of some of the other aspects of our program. So. Things like um, you know, kids making hype videos uh, that that we can show on our on our um, on our jumbotrons, and and kids running the clocks during games, and you know, jumping on the on the microphone to announce starting lineups and things like that. Those are things that when I first got here were almost exclusively done by parent volunteers and booster volunteers, and we've been trying to get more and more students involved in that aspect of things. So uh, one of the things that, that um, we're planning on as we work towards the winter is if we end up with no fans in the gym for a basketball game, let's say, um, we, we definitely have the capability to do the live stream as I know a lot of people um, appreciated during the fall. And I've already had a couple of students reach out seeing how they can be involved in that aspect. So um, always looking to expand that side of things as well and include as many students as we can. You don't have to be an athlete to be an athletic supporter. So happy to, to include them as much as possible. One more question, Dan, on, on the on the sinking fund itself. Would you would you recommend that we that you increase your budget for the amount that is expected from the Board of Education for those sinking funds, and then for the Board of Education to set that aside and at the end of the year request that the town make that deposit on our behalf? Otherwise, I don't see where the Board of Education would, would come up with the money. It would have to come from somewhere, and if it's not in your budget. Where, where would it come from? Yeah, I, I don't know that I have an answer for that right off the bat, Jonathan. I would say I would 
my first thought would be to go back through the history of the Board of Education over the last handful of years. And is it traditionally the case where money is flowing back to the town at the end of the year? Perhaps the, when that happens, there's also a request that goes from the board to the town saying, we're, we're sending this amount back. We would like for you to put X amount of dollars towards the, the uh, sinking fund. You know, that would probably be the easiest mechanism, assuming, of course, that we are you know, uh, coming in under budget and, and sending money back to the town every year. But I think that's a discussion for us to have with the budget subcommittee to see what the structure might be um, to accomplish that task. Because I do think it is important. You know, it, the Tiger Hollow, when it was first established and, and put in back in 2000, you know, the, the by the community for the community has always been the phrase. And, and we do live by that. I mean, it's used by everyone. Um, but at the, at the same time, I would say we are probably the group that benefits the most in terms of RHS athletics. And we probably, you know, are when it comes to these big ticket items right now, we're contributing the least. And so it does seem right that we would be pulling our weight when it comes to, um, you know, the, the maintenance and upkeep of that facility. Right. So that's, that's why I'm suggesting if, if we are supposed to contribute more, then we would have to increase the budget to, right. to account for that. Yeah, and one of the questions that we've had, I mean, you know, the original field went in in 2000, they established a sinking fund and it's been contributed to, but as you, as you move forward through the years, you know, the costs of these types of replacements do go up. And so, you know, one of the things that we've talked about a lot with, um, with Rudy and Kevin is trying to project forward a little bit better and making sure that our sinking funds are in place so that, you know, the, so these don't become issues every, you know, 10 to 12 years when this needs to happen. It's, it's, it's ready to go. The money's there and it's an, it's a no brainer. So it is part of the discussion that we've had over the last five or six months. And, and I will say, I'm very, again, just reiterate, very pleased with the collaborative approach that we've had with, with all the members of the town working on this project. Margaret. Hey, Dane. Thanks again for all your great work. Um, my question is actually about that huddle program. I believe last yeah. year there was quite a bit of discussion during budget time around that. But can you remind me, where did we end up on that? I think, you know, as you talked about, I think we were looking at um, multiple sources of funding for it. I wondered if it's in this year's budget. I couldn't remember if there were annual costs for it. So could you refresh my memory a little bit? Yeah, there are annual costs for it. And I'm trying to find the exact line here in uh, the budget book to show you where that's reflected. Um, but it is, it has been built in. In fact, you'll see it's um, on page five of my budget where it says purchase services video production. There's a $30,000 line there. Um, and that does, um, that's almost, that's, that's our budget, that is our contract with Huddle for this year. Um, based on on what we get from them. It's called a, a franchise partnership. And it's worth mentioning that the that relationship and that agreement and what we get out of it, the two cameras, the ability to live stream, those became so important to our community over the course of this fall because whether people didn't feel comfortable going to games or whether we had limitations on capacity and we, we weren't allowed to have the types of crowds that we wanted, um, we found that the viewership for our, our live streams was, was really tremendous and to the point where it seemed like weekly I would get a, an email from grandma and grandpa in Florida saying, can you send me the link so I can watch my granddaughter play? And so it was really a great addition that we had this year um, and something that we will look to continue going forward. I have been in talks with them also because, you know, just the nature of it. I mean, behind the scenes, we get a lot out of that agreement. Our coaches get um, film breakdowns um, that show them tendencies of the other teams, all the different statistics for our players, things that the public doesn't necessarily see, but our coaches are able to use to, to make the experience for our kids in the programs that much better. Um, a lot of our kids do use it to build their own highlight reels um, to, to you know, help themselves connect to college coaches and things of that nature. So there's, there's a lot of benefit behind the scenes that you don't see, um, but the public benefit is certainly the ability to, to watch games live. Um, going forward, I have been in talks with Huddle because you know, we had a football season that didn't exist in its regular capacity. Our basketball season is going to be, um, you know, a modified version of, of what we're used to. And so um, there's, there is the possibility that going forward into next year that that number would decrease because, you know, just a little bit of negotiation with them on what we're getting for, for the price tag. So um, that has been a part of the conversation as well. Thank you. One more quick follow-up. Um, I believe you said that we donated a certain amount to the tennis court repairs. So there was, correct? I, I had money in, in one of my repairs lines. 
um, that once you know was able to to go towards that project. This is going back, I believe that would have been the 1819 budget, Jonathan. Um, that there 1819. Were, I believe so. I, I I could find the data if you need it, but it was you know around that time. I I believe it was the fall of 2019. Um, was when that work was done. So I, I can get the details for you on that, but it was out of a repairs line that um, we had some money left over. And when I was approached, we were able to put it towards that cause. The, the dollar details is not as important to me as the, um, what kind of an approval process had to go through to, to donate money in that manner. Not that it would have necessarily been denied, but who, who got to approve using those funds? Kind of, yes, the, the tennis courts are used by high, our high school students, but they're also the maintenance and upkeep of them is not on on this budget so I'd, I'd be curious to see what kind of approval process is in place for that yeah i'd have to go back and look again i our, our contribution towards that was was relatively minor compared to the the um what the board the uh, sorry parks and rec was right. able to put towards that project so for us i want to say it was truly only a couple thousand dollars um and i believe I, I could check. We, we may have been billed separately for that where, you know, we paid for a, a small piece of it um, and Parks and Rec, you know, funded the rest. But I, I can check on that for you. Okay. Anyone else? Thank you very much. Um, good presentation. Good preparation. Appreciate it all. Thanks, and, thanks uh, Jonathan. Thanks, everyone else. Let's all take a, a little time for lunch. Meet back here at one o'clock. Thank you.
Did everybody finish their lunch or is it just slightly off the side of the screen there? I'm making a fresh coffee. No, I didn't do that. Well, I'm really fresh. I'm sorry. This is fresh. <coughs> Wes, you look like you're hosting a radio show. <laughs> yeah, that? it's f funny how that uh, worked out. <laughs> I'm, I'm just here in my, you know, typical area with, uh, you know, a, a the books and microphone with a pot yeah. filter. I'm currently located in the uh, Ridgefield Public Schools curriculum department. We have one? And, yeah, yeah, believe it. And then I'm going to walk <laughs> to the technology department for the next meeting. So, <laughs> Dual purpose. I love it. Clever. Wes. <laughs> <coughs> kind of looks like a, an homage to Larry King right there. I know, sad. Oh, I, ju I just saw the news. Did he pass this morning? He did. Yes. Yeah. I, I, I saw it come through, but I didn't know if it was last night or this morning. There's a couple people still waiting. Still chewing. I had to change my chair. I got up and could hardly walk <coughs> sitting so long. <laughs> so hopefully this will be. Whose idea was again. this again? Pardon? Whose <laughs> idea was this all day again? Yeah, I, I'm not used to sitting all day. <laughs> I purposefully took myself off there for a minute, Mr. Stetson, Sorry. but it will be good to collect feedback to actually see if uh, the board thinks this is beneficial to have it all in one shot. I think it is. I think so too. <laughs> oh, no, it's great. I was sitting, I was sitting in something that I, I, I shouldn't have sat in. I'm sitting in a comfortable chair. I'm now in a hard chair and it's much better. Oh, sorry, didn't mute. Everyone's hearing my clackety keyboard. keyboard. <laughs> Everybody's back. I'm being told my, my audio is breaking up now. Uh, Jonathan, am I the only one that's hearing you a little bit underwater? Yeah, yeah John, John's getting some, uh, some feedback or, or distortion. Now, still there. Still there. That yeah, you might want to try that. Ah, oh, the wonders of internet connectivity in Ridgefield. I want a sweet setup like Wes has. Yeah. <laughs> Diffuser, everything. Oh yeah, I'm uh, I I'm in the the bunker. Yeah, so. <laughs> I, I was the early adopter of buy two internet connections so one works at all times. <clears throat> I've got a nice load balancing router at home. All of these fancy. fancy people. Very fancy. You got to do what you got to do. <laughs> I, all right, I, I almost didn't come back, but I'm, I'm ah, back. Good. There you go. All right, the gang is all here. Let's jump right in, I think. The curriculum department is up next. It is. So I'm going to transition over to Wes. Um, some of you may know that Dr. Villanueva's last day officially was yesterday. And so given the fact that she now works for the Watertown Public Schools, I felt a little guilty asking her to come do a curriculum presentation on a Saturday, um, but not guilty enough to not ask her to do a pre-recorded curriculum presentation alongside Dr. DeSantis. So. Uh, Wes will put up the video. I'll be prepared as will Dr. DeSantis to answer any questions. Thank you very much, Dr. De Silva. Uh, I'm going to share the video in a moment. I'm just uh, letting people know when in testing this, the volume was a little low, so you might want to turn your volume up as you're hearing it uh, and make sure your mics are muted. If there's any issues, just unmute and say there's, there's, a, there's an issue, but hopefully it should work fine. All right, we are going to begin playing it.
Um, and now we will present this year's proposed curriculum budget. This year, unlike any other year, has pushed every single Ridgefield employee, student, and family to adjust to a new way of thinking about going to school. If any of us were comfy and cozy in our way of doing things, well, that was easily remedied. What was most marvelous and continues to be ultimately is watching adults, children, community members alike take leaps over and over again to explore and take risks with one another. We all somehow in the back of our minds knew that there was support not too far around the corner and forgiveness and the notion of, well, let's just try again floating in the air. So with that, we celebrate a little differently this year on our returns on investment. We can confidently say that we're breaking ground in different ways when we clock 700 hours of hybrid teaching or something like 19,000 mask breaks on any given day or perhaps consuming over 1,200 digital books in district at home or maybe on a phone and not even a single webcam broken. Testament to you, Dr. DeSantis. Oh, I thank you, Dr. Villanueva. At least not yet. So this firmly reminds us that amidst all of what's happening, we have 100% opportunity to continue growing through our curriculum budget. This year's curriculum budget goals are anchored in four practical and very necessary focus areas that will study the district's plan to provide an engaging, relevant, and personalized learning experience for all Ridgefield students. And uh, the 2021 to 22 curriculum budget goals are, the first goal is respond to shifting needs of our students. Goal two is to support and develop high quality instruction and assessment practices during COVID. Goal three, roll out and implement necessary and sustainable tier one and intervention programs to ensure program fidelity. And lastly, goal four, continue ongoing and strategic professional development K through 12 for all educators. So as we move on, this year's proposed curriculum budget is a strategically designed budget with a total of $1,494,095. Although you see a small increase from last year's curriculum budget by about $146,000, in order to try and maintain our current curriculum budget and allocate funds for important and necessary changes to the budget, we have found efficiencies ultimately by decreasing several lines. The RPS curriculum budget impacts the entire RPS community. With the leanest curriculum, in, curriculum team ultimately in all of Derg A, we run an extremely efficient budget. And so portions of the curriculum budget is dedicated to fulfill and comply with any required state or federal mandates through K to 12. Uh, for example, you would see in your budget book uh, things like citizenship courses. Those are items that must be fulfilled by the district. Um, and in addition, the curriculum budget includes salaries. And with that, what is left, the curriculum budget provides professional development for all faculty at any given point in time pre-K to 12. This includes the cost of substitute teachers who cover classes during professional development. Um, it also provides stipends to faculty members who step up time and time again to take on extra responsibilities when we are writing curriculum across all disciplines and all grades. The curriculum budget provides and ensures the necessary resources for our students and faculty to have the best possible learning experience across all disciplines and grades on a daily, daily basis. And this is often overlooked, but the authentic learning opportunities and field experiences Yes, that's right, field trips that occur outside of the walls of our schools during trips and excursions are also part of the curriculum budget. So to look at the curriculum teams compared to other districts, uh, we had made this little research that we were able to get from all the districts that are in our Derg A area. And some areas we were able to, to get clearer data than others. Uh, if we look at the beginning at the top, it says number of curriculum related positions, district slash building level. So if I look at Ridgefield at the very bottom, we have two district level curriculum people. So those could be the administrators. At this time of this recording, it would be uh, the STEM position, the humanities position. And there are six people in buildings that have some form of release time for curriculum. So that could be a department head at, let's say, the high school. So if I look at New Canaan, they have 15 district level people that all their time is released from, from teaching. All they do is curriculum. And then nine building level people that are released in some fashion to do curriculum. Uh, if I look at Westport and Wilton, uh, we have a little B next to there saying that 
all those people are, are in building the way that their structure works, but a lot of those people may have full release time for the entire uh, day. They might be doing other duties or other ways that the district might have uh, did that setup, but there are a lot compared to the, uh, the smaller group that we have in town in Ridgefield. So ultimately, we need to know what our curriculum dollars are going towards this year. And so we directly tied those dollars to the goals stated at the start of this presentation and our targeted investments that connect right into each of our nine schools and their needs. Uh, you're going to see in your budget binders that um, funds have been allocated to, one, purchase ultimately a systematic phonics program. Um, and also amongst COVID, we've, we've seen the importance of keyboarding, so a handwriting and keyboarding program as well, and an updated math curriculum. In addition, um, a commitment to building a curriculum team that can support our schools well. Um, in addition to that, funds will also be put towards necessary intervention resources, um, and along with that comes the professional development for certified and non-certified fac faculty. And along with that comes professional development for certified and non-certified faculty so that we can meet each one of our students where they are and then take them to where they need to be. Outside of sal salaries, efficiencies were found in several lines across the entire district. So if you take a look at this slide here, um, you can see the corresponding lines in your book uh, that there are decreases in every single one of these lines. In a focused manner and directly aligned uh, to our curriculum budget goals, we took those decreases and allocated funds to specifically address district needs in areas where we are growing. This does not include contractual salary increases, but streamlined areas where we see an increase to fulfill our focus areas. So in particular, the Purchase Services Elementary line is where a new systematic phonics program and an updated math program resides. Conference and training district-wide sees an increase as we drastically reduced the high school purchase services line and shifted it into this one. To build our curriculum team's capacity, a new position of the Director of Elementary Education is included, and an increase in the test standardized materials line. It's not actually for so much more standardized materials, but it's allowing us to budget for more world language assessments that are going to provide students with increased opportunities to earn the seal of biliteracy. As for the math textbooks and resources line, you'll notice that there's a 37.14% increase, but this is actually a lot less than what we could have had. We found efficiencies in not moving forward with Math 180 as an intervention tool next year, where we have delegated that to be more of an in-house. The increase in cost that you're seeing here is us continuing with moving forward with our new math programs in the middle school and in the elementary school, getting those resources. So again, Ridgefield Public Schools with an extremely lean curriculum team, um, we have a proposed curriculum budget for the 2021-22 year of 1494095 with a slight increase of $146,022. But again, extremely targeted, extremely focused, and we are looking to service all nine of our schools continually to the best of our ability. Thank you, and if you have any questions, uh, we will be happy to provide additional information. Thank you so much. I want to give a big shout out to uh, Dr. Villanueva, who recorded this uh, with me, and uh, I wish her best luck on her future endeavors. Thank you so much, Allison. And I will be here in person as you're watching this video to answer any questions with Dr. Susie De Silva. Thank you. All right, I hope that worked. Everyone was able to hear it properly okay good and rachel's hand was up first um so i have a couple of questions about um the math and the phonics program so what new math programs will be rolled out next year so, so we are currently rolling out the big ideas math platform at the middle school this started last year and the reason why there's that increase in the math spending slightly, it actually would have been more, is, is we're just finishing out, rolling it out across all, all three grades. Uh, I believe there's a few just continuing contracts with the resources that we're using at the elementary school level, but the big cost was the finishing the uh, big ideas rollout. Rachel, we, oh, sorry, go ahead, Wes. No, that's it. I'm done. Yeah. Rachel, one of the things that Ridgefield did with, with uh, their math program at grades six through eight is so they 
their primary resource is big ideas. But what they did was that rather than purchasing a three-year digital contract, they purchased a year-to-year -year digital contract. So you're going to see an allocation for math, quote unquote, textbooks, primary resource year after year, because we didn't purchase, let's just say a three-year subscription at once. Oftentimes you, when you purchase three years or sometimes six years, you'll save a little bit of money. Um, but my, my prediction, I don't know for sure why the decision was made is that it probably just was budget in this budget year, what they could afford. And so they decided to go year to year. Um, at the math, at the math at the elementary level, uh, the consumables um, have varied and the primary resource has varied. So right now, generally speaking, math and focus is their primary resource, also known as Singapore math. Um, th there's some further discussions in terms of the math primary resource that hopefully will happen in the in future years. So they're, are, so they're using math and focus now at the elementary level, but they're going to be starting big ideas in the elementary level? No, they have big ideas in grades six through eight. They have math and focus, also known as Singapore math, as their, was the planned primary resource for the elementary program. I believe that that's inconsistently used, meaning some teacher made materials, some team made materials. So hopefully that's something that we can we can tighten up in future years. Yeah, I mean, I'd, I'd love for this to come to possibly the curriculum committee, because I think this is one of the concerns where um, there's not a very clear picture, um, from mm -hmm. my point of view anyway, of what math programs we're using across the district and their connection. So going from elementary to middle school, are there particular topics in the math curriculum where our middle school teachers are seeing deficits? Um, or are there certain ways in which math and focus teaches in our elementary school, which is valuable, but is there another source that we could bring in? So, I mean, I'd love to continue this conversation um, in our curriculum. I, I don't, I feel that there are a lot of holes. Um, I would agree, I would agree with yeah. you, Rachel. And I, I, you know, again, I don't know the work that the math research team here did when, when selecting big ideas as their primary resource for middle school. Um, I know from other communities, big ideas in terms of depth of understanding and the way in which they teach to teach conceptually is very similar to math and focus. Um, I believe that many districts that uh, selected, I know this is before Wes's time too, so mm -hmm. be, Many, resource, many school districts that selected big ideas rather than math and focus at that time was because of the digital piece that was offered through big ideas that wasn't necessarily offered through math and focus and the ability to differentiate, meaning personalization for kids. Mm -hmm. um, our cost for big ideas is very low in comparison to other districts and that's because they did not, they elected not to purchase textbooks for each student, but rather just have a set for students who preferred or needed uh, a physical textbook, um, and of course for teachers. Mm -hmm. And then I just have one more. Thank you so much for the explanation, and I look forward to having continuing that conversation. <laughs> um, you know, I heard today that professional development is very important to our administrators, to their faculty. So, with eighty percent of our budget as salaries and employee benefits, and since our main investment is in people. Has there been any thought around possibly developing in-service courses for our teachers and staff and making deductions in the future and conferencing and training, creating a culture where staff chooses the direction of their own professional development and then can share their learning and reflective practices as mentors and instructors to others? So uh, I'll, if I can just jump in on this one. Uh, we kind of already do that. We do have a very slim curriculum budget and we, we send off very few teachers to be, you know, to receive this sort of PD service. And then they come back and they'll disseminate that and then run their own PD throughout the district. This is how we've been functioning since basically I've been in the district now for about 12 years. Uh, most of the time, you know, a lot of these PD programs, you know, they are rather expensive, but we're only sending one or two teachers at a time, teacher leaders. Uh, it will be either, depending on at the high school level, if an elective is created, we'll send them off for that, uh, that course, and then they'll come back. And we normally don't, as long as that teacher stays there in that course pathway, that teacher will train the other teachers. 
Um, so we are doing that. We are doing a lot of that in-house training. Dr. De Silva, may I add on to Dr. DeSantis's comments? You don't even need to add, go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, so I co-chair uh, with the assistant superintendent, the professional development and evaluation committee um, called the PDAC. And for the last several years, um, this year being a little bit different, but for the past several years, um, we have dedicated PD days for teachers uh, in the calendar and we have increased teacher choice and part of that PD has been to solicit from the teachers what um, professional development do you want to lead for your colleagues and we've been very successful in having our own teachers create courses and um, various lengths of professional development sessions throughout um, those days in which our own teachers have signed up. So we are creating that culture of within house, we have expertise and how do we tap into that and um, let our teachers shine and share their experiences. Well, that's great to hear. Thank you, Karen. You're welcome. Rachel, did we answer your question around phonics? Uh, I, I would like to, you know, revisit it, I guess, at a curriculum committee meeting, I think we could probably spend hours. Um, but what, what are we purchasing for phonics? So we did, we did put a placeholder in the budget for a systematic phonics program for all six schools. So it's not that they currently don't teach phonics, but they teach it in varied ways and through different primary resources. And so the goal is for next year to have one consistent uh, systematic phonics program. We put a placeholder in terms of the budget of what what a program could actually cost. They're not all different, right? I mean, they're not that much different from one program to the next. And so obviously the assistant superintendent and the curriculum folks will lead that work. Um, in terms of the rollout for that, we would not be rolling out uh, three grade levels at a time. So right now we're looking at, um, you know, our quotes are looking at K-1 um, for for staff K-1 for staff development and consumables, but likely PD for K-1-2 so that we can start that PD for the following year. And do we know what, which we're using? So we have put a placeholder in for foundations, but you know, that'll be a collaborative process with the assistant superintendent. Um, but we, in terms of the actual allocated monies, it would be aligned to the quote that we received for foundations. Thank you so much. Kathleen, did you have a question or we moved to Tina? Uh, well, I did, but I, it's been answered. Um, okay. So I, Rachel was reading my mind. So Tina, you're up. Yeah. Uh, I, actually, Rachel asked most of my question too. Uh, just clarifying, Dr. De Silva. Uh, so the purchase services for elementary, middle, and high school, that includes the phonics program, right? Or am I reading this completely wrong? Just for clarity. Yeah, no, I'm just gonna make sure that I'm looking at the right spreadsheet just to make sure that I'm aligned here as well. Because the elementary jumped up and that's what I'm assuming because you mentioned that's why. Yeah, the purchase services includes both teacher's college for our six schools, five days and phonics. And so the reason it jumped up, Tina, is that from budget to budget, um, it was still there, but it was not uh, clearly outlined. And so the interest of transparency, I wanted to be sure that someone who looked at the budget could identify um, what we were spending our money on. So that's five days per school. And that includes, it does not include the administrator days because the administrators do also receive PD that's on a separate line. So it's five days for Teachers College, and it also includes the foundation's PD that I described earlier. K-1-2, it allows for K-1-2 PD. Again, if that's, foundations is the one, the placeholder, but that could possibly change, but that is when the new assistant superintendent comes in and works with their team, but that's the placeholder as of now. Thank you. And just to elaborate on Rachel's point, I know um, she's already mentioned there seems to be gaps and you've already identified in math, but I think there are also gaps in how the kids write, in their social studies and science, they're just gaps. You know, when a kid goes from elementary to middle, middle to high, there seems to be some gaps. So I'm glad that you're addressing it. I'm glad that you're on top of it uh, because, you know, we just need our kids to get stronger in. And I'm sure after the year that we've had, it's been tough at every level. So I'm just glad that you're addressing it. You're on top of it. 
Uh, I don't know if there's anything directly in the budget, but if there, I mean, it's just, if there is something or if you're planning in the future, I'm, I'm, I think this is a great opportunity to share this with the community so that you know, they know what you're thinking yeah. about. So I, I think that it does both. I think it's in the budget. It was something that um, Ms. Gatos brought up earlier. And so I think just for a moment of clarity, so in the budget, because it, it's what's complicated about the budget is that it's budget to budget. So you're seeing an elementary director in the budget now, but in fact, what we're looking to hire for next year is a 612 humanities. And what we're looking to hire now is the elementary director. So we made a swap. It, things just fell into place in a different way because Dr. DeSantis transitioned into a new role, allowing us for us to restructure that, that position, which is science, math, which will also include STEM, which is also a part of Dr. DeSantis's new role. Then we will have the 612 humanities position for next year, even though it's in the budget as an elementary director, and that can be confusing. So I just wanna take a moment to clarify that. Um, and then, so 612 humanities, science, math, and STEM would be this year. So we'll hope to fill that position this year. That said, I think um, it's clear, just even from what both um, Rachel and, and you brought up, Tina, that there are some gaps and it's even clear from the NEOSC report, right? And what the NEOSC actually brings up the six to 12, but it's, it's never six through 12, it's pre-K or K through 12. And so where are there gaps? There's, there's gaps in a formal curriculum. And one of the challenges of our, of our special areas, quite frankly, is our teachers are working very hard and sometimes have the opportunity to collaborate and create curriculum themselves and sometimes don't. But there isn't that K-12 formal memorialized curriculum in art, in physical education, in music, in health doesn't mean that the that there isn't a curriculum being taught. It just means that there is not that systematic view. And so when it comes to vertical alignment K-12 across content areas, vertical articulation, uh, curriculum coordination, what's happening in one room. So if you're having social studies, how are we connecting that to, to English? Is there a class that can come together so that they could be teaching it at an appropriate time together, let's say for freshmen, so kids can make those connections. Um, the curriculum revision process. I know that Kathleen and I think Nora and Rachel are on the curriculum committee where we talked about whether a responsive curriculum model where we're coming back and oftentimes discussing that, the consistency across schools and departments. So ensuring that a child that comes from school A going to school to going to middle school B and a child coming from an elementary school B going to that same middle school have finished at around the same time if there's a scope and sequence, right? Um, the parent communication, making sure families are involved, just the content expertise in general. And um, I think this is a real opportunity for us as things shift to start looking at those curriculum areas. A long way to get, get to it, but the reality is it is a budget connection, even though it's a bigger discussion than that Rachel has brought up in terms of coming to the curriculum committee. Um, but it, there is a budget connection here and that's really the, says elementary director, but it's really 612 humanities. Thank you. It really helps clarify because there are questions, right? We're adding, um, I think the bigger question will be, we, and I'll go back to art because it is a big topic right now, right? The, the, uh, the lack of, in, at this point in time, there is no reintroduction of the three art teachers, but we're talking about adding these. So I think it's great that you're explaining the reasoning behind it and why it's so important because it really is not about six to 12. It is from K to 12. So thank you for explaining that. It, it's really important that a community gets it. And I, I'm not saying it's an, we're comparing. I'm just trying to explain, you know, if a parent is seeing like a quick snapshot and if they've not been invested in the budget process, it, or if it's just a community member, if you're not part of the RPS, you'll be like, that's where I'm going from. It's just going back because in the end, this is a budget that the town votes on. So that's my bigger uh, and, point. And so when, if we were to go back, and I know everyone included this in part of their presentation, some way or some form, and you look at the vision of the graduate, the intent there is to look to the end before you begin, right? So you know what the outcome is that you're hoping to achieve, and then each of us plays a role in that outcome. And so as art, as an example, because it is a topic that's what's challenging about that is that when you have a, a formalized curriculum, you can identify what you're expecting to achieve by the end of the year. And then you say, okay, what's the work that needs to happen to achieve that? And then there's all of the other things that are part of a program that are just not curriculum driven, right? But are all the other benefits that enhance a, a child's experience in the school related to art, music, or anything else for that matter. Getting, getting that heavy lifting done with people that are obviously the content folks, right? I'm, 
I'm not going to be a content expert in any, anything, everything, and nor is anyone else, but getting the teachers involved, getting content experts to come in and share out what they've experienced, looking at best practices in communities nearby and communities far is a far is a, is a critical piece to this, um, which has just added a level of challenge that, that I've definitely heard from parents through my entry plan process. And even in the most unique year, like we're experiencing now, it's clear that there, that consistency, even understanding what's our math program? How does this fit into the next math program? Mm -hmm. And how does that fit into high school? Where does that all come together? You need people to do that heavy lifting. It, it's just the truth. And you, you heard Wes and Allison share that out in their presentation. We're incredibly lean in that area. And, and yes, we can compare or not compare, but if we just compare ourselves to ourselves, it's evident that we're lean. Thank you. Nora. Uh, so not to beat a dead horse, but I understand like the absolute desire for that position and whether it you call it 612 Humanities or elementary director, I, I totally get that that would be desirable. Um, my question is just what the rationale is in this coming year, given what we are facing um, given what kids of all ages are going to be coming back to in the fall, uh, so many unknowns, as well as just an attempt to re-enter into normalcy, how do we justify um, an administrative position over three teachers in the trenches? Yeah. With and so, Nora, the interesting part of what you just asked me is probably the reason I would be pushing it most is because we do have to provide access to kids when they arrive. There is going to be a significant amount of curriculum compacting in differentiation that's going to need to happen for kids through MTSS or also known as SRBI. We're going to need to be prepared for that because not every child's access point in a typical year, as you know, in a typical year, kids' access points are different, right? Where their entry levels are, are unique. And our teachers already have to come to the table with a lot of tools, but it's not just the teaching tools. It's just not that instructional tools. It's the assessment. It's the, the pre-assessment, the formative assessment. It's understanding, okay, if, if a child did not access blank amount of curriculum and this child was able to access that, what's going to happen here? Or generally speaking, what do we need to do in this curriculum to compact it in a way that we can meet most of our kids' needs and the kids that we can't meet would meet in that compacted curriculum, what is that work going to look like? So I have to tell you that in any year that I would hope that I had boots on the ground for curriculum, it's this coming year. And, and I'm gonna be really transparent. We still don't have enough people, even with one. It, there, the reality is, is that a science, math, STEM, a 612 humanities and an elementary director that works across every single content area and has to support the 612 piece, right? We have to ensure that that person is communicating with these people um, and all of the people underneath them, right? Those department chairs, you know, they're uh, part-time, right? They teach part-time and our leaders part-time, all of that communication, SRBI, creating structures, bringing in professional development. These are not small tasks. Um, and you know, you can have a great assistant superintendent, you can have great people in these roles, and it's it's not at all to suggest that Dr. Santos, Dr. Villanueva, Susie, whomever, haven't been really carrying their weight and the weight of many others. Um, but it's a lot to it's a lot to to do. It's world language, it's health, it's physical education, it's art, music, PE. There think about the content areas that a child experiences and and you need leadership and you need content expertise, which a lot of that we can get with our teachers, but we do need that. We do need the leadership without a doubt. Other questions? No more on curriculum? Okay, thank you so much. Thanks, you so thank you, thank you. I don't, you can't go anywhere. Oh, yep. oh, I was just going to get up and, oh, okay. Uh, yeah, as you notice, Susie really took the lead on that one because, uh, as you know, throughout this past year, I've been transitioning into more of a technology role. Uh, let me just move out of the curriculum department. So as, into... as Wes moves out of the curriculum department, just for the public, mm -hmm. this is where there's a little bit of a bump in the uh, digital book or the, manu the physical book that you're seeing where we're a little bit out of order. Mm -hmm. And so now Wes has changed his background. 
I'm now in the uh, technology department. So I just want to make sure. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, am, I, am I ready to present now? You are, is Dave Moran joining you? Uh, he yeah. should be being let in soon. He has been watching. So we'll let him in. So, so uh, Dave Moran will be joining me. I'll be doing the bulk of the presentation, but he'll be answering any questions that I might not be able to uh, answer about the backend networking or anything of that, that subject matter. So, all right, hopefully uh, we'll get on. He's in. Oh, there he is. I'm in. Hi, folks. <laughs> All right. So uh, there we go. I think, Dave, you're watching the YouTube video. I can I hear it. Off of it. I just turned there it off. There we go. <laughs> Sorry, folks. No problemo. All righty. So uh, I'm going to present my screen, and uh, we'll get started. Okay, there we go. All right, so uh, I wanna welcome everyone to the uh, Richfield Public Schools Technology Department. This will be our technology budget for the 2021-22 year. I'd uh, like to start off with some starting thoughts. So first, spring 2020 has forced technology to from a pillar of education to the main conveyance of education. Uh, and to be honest, I feel that this is an inappropriate position for technology to be in. However, it is 100% necessary. So all of our thoughts going forward are going to be, we're doing this for now and hoping a return to normalcy and us having a deeper conversation on the appropriate level of technology in the classroom. However, during the spring and now that we're in this hybrid model, as we move into the next spring, we have found some uh, stress tests on the technology spectrum across the district, whether it's services, PD, physical infrastructure, teacher devices, and so on and so forth. So my current vision of what we're seeing in the near future is to get us through that, to bring us back to normalcy, and then we're going to start beginning on what I like to call vision building. What does technology look like a year and a half from now? What are the long-term decisions that the district wants to make with technology? And that's what I uh, would like to get to in the not too distant future, but not for this current budget cycle. Uh, some other thoughts I'd like to, uh, we talked a little bit earlier about uh, a la carte PD for teachers. And I'd like to say that we have really knocked it out of the park here in Ridgefield. Not only did we start earlier than everyone else, but we had a successful, uh, I think, uh, superior hybrid classroom experience than most school systems in our, not, not even our DERG, but in the state and, and even in the tri-state area after I've seen what other schools have done uh, with very relatively low technological issues at also a very competitive price. We were able to buy uh, very good webcams at a very good price very early on. We were able to get those things in the district, uh, get the teachers trained on it. And this is the really great part about our a la carte training is everything was digital. Because of social distancing, we can't have the teachers in large gatherings. We were able to do everything digitally. And uh, I just wanna say a big thank you to all the teachers who helped, but to say that our tech crew went above and beyond the call of duty is an understatement. Uh, so it's just where I wanted to start with my starting thoughts. Now, getting into the actual tech department structure itself, I feel in the, uh, the guise of transparency, I'd like to go over the technology department org chart because things have changed dramatically. Things will be changing slightly as we go into the, the further year. And I think people just need to understand why the, tech, the department currently looks the way it does and who does what. So if you look at this org chart, I'm gonna start from the uh, left side and move to the right. Uh, directly underneath me is the uh, tech integrators. They're actually school teachers. We have two tech integrators in the district. One covers basically all eight schools that are six to, or I'm sorry, uh, K to eight. And what does a tech integrator do? They do teacher training. They do valuations of services, items, technologies in the classroom. Uh, they even teach uh, they could teach uh, courses by the 
a teacher asking them to come in and teach their kids how to do certain dig digital citizenship things. They do a whole bunch of things. The second tech integrator does that half of, of their um, of their, their time allocation at the high school level. And the other half is assistive technology for special ed, which of course could lead into all sorts of, again, finding services, digital products, physical technology that can help that student with uh, the needs that they have. If we look over to the other side, it's broken down underneath the IT department, uh, which is supervised by Dave Moran. First, we have the singular network administrator who does the entire district. We're talking access points, fiber getting channeled through the ground, uh, servers within the buildings, that entire uh, thing. We just had uh, a, a relay of fiber into uh, Scotland Elementary yet again to, uh, to fix that. Then we have what I feel is the lifeblood of our technology and that is our building technicians. Within a month on average, we are between 600 and 700 help tickets. And that's corrected for multiple tickets for the same thing. So if internet goes down in a hallway and we get like all teachers put in a help desk ticket, that coordinator puts it into one and then that, that help desk uh, 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 technician goes out there and fixes the issue. So there's a lot of things going on. We have four building techs that was five. We did change the, the fifth one into an entry level position where that person focuses mostly on Chromebooks. Uh, that could, of course, grow them into a, a full tech position as time goes on, but that's something we'll cross the bridge when we get there. And then the app specialist, which is a technician, but for all of the digital services, they focus entirely on digital services. And last but not least, uh, you kind of heard a little bit about this from the high school with their data specialist that is in-house is our two district data specialists, one that focuses entirely on, on power school, state reporting, a lot of uh, uh, all report card functionality across the district and the other one which does all of the other data metrics stuff like NWEA other services that we have as well as the finances for the technology department. So if we look at the overall budget from last year to this upcoming year we actually see a small negative difference and there were some efficiencies found there has been a position move that went into the high school and uh, we also feel that there's gonna be a change in, if you didn't notice in the last org chart that I just showed, uh, there is a secretary on the actual sheet. This is the registrar secretary, and that is going to be moving underneath the business office probably next year. Again, during this restructuring from when we changed the old director of technology to this new director of educational technology, we're looking at focusing the department rather than having it be covered with all of these other kind of tasks that were not appropriate for the technology department. So let's look at some of the changes that you'll see in the budget. The first is an increase in spending for hardware devices. Uh, this was classroom technology, student devices, teacher devices, and I'll get to this in a little bit. Uh, a transition away from leasing devices to purchasing devices. This is one of those times where back when we started leasing, the devices that were available under these lease agreements were pretty decent. Now that we've had the lease agreement for a long time and we just keep having these older devices and they keep getting older and we keep fixing them, we just we keep paying money to maintain older devices. Whereas if we buy new devices, with, let's say a protection plan and a warranty, it's only for a few years, but then that device is also aging out when we would start slowly replacing it with new devices again. And we feel that that might actually be a cost savings while keeping us with up-to-date technology. Uh, you'll also notice a small increase in services. This is in two areas. One is for the cybersecurity increase that we, we have with some of the services uh, and also contract uh, obligations. One is that uh, I believe on the line item is connected to our phone service. And that is a longstanding contract that we have. Uh, we are decreasing spending in digital services. There are just some digital services that we looked at. We did a full audit of all the uses of certain digital services, and we were able to cut a lot of them out because they were either used very rarely, or we found alternatives that were either cheaper or just maybe even free. Uh, and of course, the reallocation of personnel, which I explained a little bit earlier with the org chart. 
And this brings me to my little triangle of, of things that need to happen in my mind, or actually in, in uh, I believe that the district's mind uh, for the, the next coming year. And this is where I was saying, I wanna start vision building after we have these three big conversations. Uh, at the very top of this pyramid is I believe the main budget driver for the technology department. Uh, the first one at the very top is teacher Chromebooks that are aging out. These Chromebooks were bought almost six years ago. And when they were bought, they, you know, they weren't the best Chromebooks, but they were pretty decent and they're beginning to age out. If you want an example, the Chromebook that Dane was using earlier today was a teacher Chromebook. So we're having lots of issues with these devices. And the other issue is Google is going to start slowly pushing Chromebooks off the product shelf. And this, the teacher Chromebooks and some of the student Chromebooks will start losing service support starting even in June and then out into uh, early 2022. So you'll open it up and then it'll just say like, this Chromebook is no longer supported for Google Meet. So we're looking into newer Chromebooks, maybe even other computing platforms that might give us cost savings in other areas or just better abilities for our teachers to be educators. The other is the continued rollout of the ViewSonic boards and other classroom upgrades. Uh, some of the smart boards in these classrooms are over 10 years old and they are degrading at an accelerated rate because now they're used throughout the entire school day for distance learning. And we're, we're noticing projectors are burning out quicker. Uh, boards are just falling apart quicker because now they're, they're just getting a lot more mileage put on them. If we replace them with a ViewSonic board, these are much more robust. They don't need bulbs. They don't need a lot more upkeep maintenance. They're more, they, they just last longer. And last but not least is something we've been starting in the summertime for distance and mixed learning is the upgraded and maintenance of the network services and hardware. This also uh, kind of tucks into capital budget at times. Uh, for supplying internet to, let's say, Tiger Hollow or repairing the fiber connection between Barlow Mountain and Scotland. Uh, the next on that little go clockwise is working with building admins to streamline new technology initiatives. This may be different types of computing platform rollout to teachers or students, depending on what course offerings that we might want to create a little bit further down the road. Uh, possible efficiencies, uh, again, looking at those other digital services or just other services that we, we might not need or roll into other services that might be uh, better for us and uh, improve technology stewardship. We have actually over mm, 10 year old use, used uh, technology in the district, which we are recycling next week, uh, over 1700 items of technology that will be uh, properly recycled. So good for the environment. And last but not least, and the uh, last little triangle is uh, we're going to have to start connecting with the community and understand how we want to move forward as we near the end of COVID-19. What does one-to-one -one look like in our schools when we're back to normal? What do digital services look like? What are expectations of an educator and a student going to look like? What are some of the, what are some of the forward thinking we wanna do in course offerings in these in, in K through 12? Uh, and that's kind of like, I, I'm hoping, fingers crossed that we can have those conversations starting this summer, but, um, yeah, I think that is it. And I am welcoming any questions. Sean, you're up. Uh, thank you, Wes. Um, once again, thanks for stepping up to the role you're in now. I, I think you're uh, the right person at the right time, given what we went through and, and the help that you provided to get where we are. And I thank think you. we all appreciate that. Um, any thoughts? So, you know, one-to-one -one was, was interesting and I know we're moving from lease to purchase, which I think ultimately is a good idea. Any thought, because we do have some parents with means, we have some parents that don't have means of giving, you know, here's four recommended Chromebooks. If you want to buy one, you are participating in helping, helping keep your, your taxes down. Just, you know, it's an easy thing to, to do. And, there's a lot of parents like me that would prefer to have a you know $200 expenditure on our end uh, to help keep the town's taxes down and something that my you know, I'm, I'm less worried about a, a school asset. It's my asset and I can uh, control that part of things better. 
Well, we are doing that to an extent. A student can use their own device if they want to, as long as they can connect, as long as they can run the Chrome browser. You can use a MacBook, you can use a Windows machine. We have a few kids running around with the Linux boxes, you know. You know. But, we, but we're uh, not actively encouraging it. We're and not actively encouraging When I tried to do it, I got yelled at and had to go to the old superintendent to get a dispensation to even do it. So, uh, so the previous tech director. <laughs> so we are, we are, um, we are very accepting now, and we would like anyone to use any platform that they feel comfortable with. Our only guys is that you need something that runs the normal Chrome browser, and that's something we put on our our website, our reopening website. Um, and again, this is where it comes down to: every kid should have access to a district device. So even if a kid has their own MacBook, if that MacBook is not working that day, we still need to be able to grab one out of a box somewhere and just hand it to that kid for that day. So is it gonna save us money over the long? Maybe a little bit, maybe when we buy extras or we buy so many, we know that if we send a survey out that we don't have to give it to so many, but I just don't know where that kind of cost savings is going to be. Again, it's like, you know, the bus needs to go by the house every day, even though the kid only takes the bus once a week. Um, Again, I'm just thinking out loud, yeah. you know, if we had it, you know, a dozen or two dozen loaners while your MacBook is in for repairs, um, you know, most of these yeah. things are, are pretty quickly serviceable now. And most of them um, are pretty robust and reliable. So it's less of an issue than I think it was a few years ago. Just something to consider is, you know, a way to, to try and keep the tech budget down. Absolutely. Your turn. Yes. You. Okay. No, and I, absolutely. And that was something basically this past summer, uh, we just kind of made that blanket statement. We said, yeah. it, you know, come as you want with any device you want. Uh, our, our district minimum point of entry is the Chrome browser. That's right. all we ask is a, is a device that has a webcam, a microphone, Chrome browser, and you can log in. Um, and, and we do, we have a lot of students who have thankfully, especially when we were really tight on Chromebooks because just no one could buy them because everyone in the country was buying them. Uh, we had great families step up and say, no, I got my, my kid a computer and they just would bring it to the, the BOE and I was able to give it to someone who needed it. And it, mm -hmm. you know, it was great. And uh, just a generic open-ended question. Um, what did we learn during COVID that we can carry forward? What, what's the, the big takeaway that um, will propel us forward? You know, I, I think we know what reopening looks like now, but what does the next step look like? Are we gonna do surveys for the parents on what worked, what didn't for, for our end? You know, we have a client end and, and a server end and, um, you know, you're looking at your side of it. We're looking at our side of the pipe, but uh, are we going to be able to establish a working model of maybe some progression, something that's even better than what we used to do? Oh, absolutely. I mean, I feel we already have. It's like what you just said before, we, we had a very draconian policy of not letting people use their own technology. And now we, we welcome it. Uh, we have better pathways for parents to get in contact with help desk. Um, we have, you know, we have definitely, well, our tech department has learned how to troubleshoot people's home networks. <laughs> so we, we, we've definitely extended those services. We, and, you know, we've also learned a lot how we can function as a district. I said in my presentation, um, we love the way that we're doing PD now. And I think we're still going to have in-person PD as always, but because of social distancing, I can't go and see 30 teachers like I used to and train them all how to use a smart board but I can make a video and have them go a la carte. And then when they still have issues, I can have socially distanced one-on-one -on -one meetings with them because 30 teachers watched it and maybe five teachers need more help versus, and, and everyone's time is maximized. And those are some of the efficiencies that, you know, I like to call them silver linings of all of this that have come apparent. All right, and just one last uh, follow-up. Um, when we had a presentation to the board, uh, pre-COVID, it could have been any time. Um, we had a lot of technology debt. We had a lot of, of things that needed to be upgraded that were past serviceable life, past serviceable sport. Um, I know we did a lot of that work over the summer. How do you feel we're at? What, what's the scorecard? Uh, yeah. uh, so the, the you know truthful answer is the middle schools were completely removed of technology. There were some decisions made in previous previous administrations that I, I would not agree with in the sense of they didn't have touch technology. So um, thankfully, you know, Susie was very proactive in making sure that we were able to get the touch technology into the middle schools immediately. 
the problem that we're running into now is we have a lot of aging out technology. We are removing 1,700 computers from the district this week because they are 10 years old or older. Um, and the teacher Chromebooks, there was never really a path to upgrade them. So we're kind of sitting on that, that all the teacher Chromebooks can barely do two things at once right now. And it's just by the sheer, by their sheer will, the teachers have been powering through it and just like, you know, the poor tech people kind of running around with uh, duct tape and bubble gum. But, you know, that's gonna, you know, I kind of put that at the very top of my pyramid. If we can only do one thing in the next six months, it's get the teachers better machines. They just need it. And to be honest, I wanna support the teachers because they've really taken it to the next level. They're, they've all become content creators. Mm -hmm. It's also made us start thinking about other computing platforms. This is something that we can get into more in depth in a, at a later board meeting that we're probably gonna hold in March or whenever, um, whenever Susie and I can figure it out. Uh, I think um, it's on the agenda in April, maybe? April, and okay. End of March or early April, yeah. Um, and, uh, but yeah, that, that's one of those things. So a great example is, okay, we get a Chromebook, but now we're spending money for services so a teacher can read PDFs and edit video. Maybe we should have just got a computer that could have done that already. So those are all the big questions that we're, we're mulling through right now. So the only other piece that I'd add to, to what Dr. Sanchez just said, and I think it'll come later, <laughs> there is the device conversation, <laughs> then there's the screen time conversation, mm -hmm. then there's the, you know, what happens when kids come back to typical school. But I also think there's a bigger conversation of how does all of this technology fit into the curriculum? Where does it fit in in a natural place? And where does it not necessarily fit into a, a natural place? But we believe that we should be pushing kids in a very different way. Um, and so that we're not responding and that we're being forward thinking to use those words or proactive as we move ahead. Because I, I certainly think, and actually just to, I'll give you a little shout out there, Wes, is EdTech magazine actually uh, interviewed Wes this past week because of the work that he's done in Ridgefield and we didn't go in and tout it but someone else did and it's really a testament to what happened here because really what happened here is we responded right we had to respond to and we did it really really well um, but we shouldn't be in that position right we should be in the position where we're we're ahead of the game and this is like no big deal to us because we're we can shift like this and we can shift in a really um meaningful way. And so we've done a lot of great work and, and Wes is one that we should be thanking, obviously, and congratulating him for because he did it very quickly. But at the same time, I think that his work, the heavy lifting will come in the year ahead once this foundation's built with the technology and the technology needs, but understanding where that's going to go uh, across curriculum areas. And then again, just in the on the educational technology side. Thank you. So, so next to saw a few more hands. Okay. Um, go ahead, I'll, I'll go. So first of all, Wes, thank you for getting us to this point. Thank you for doing an audit on all of the digital licensing, all the software licensing. That was something that we asked for last year, kind of with everything just didn't really happen. So I appreciate that um, as someone who is relatively involved in this in my real life. Um, it was it was a passion point for me, and I'm glad I'm glad that you're at the helm. For this. Um, one question, it's a very tactical one. Um, I, I don't know if I'm reading the line items correctly, but it's SEC technology, which I think is security technology. Looks yes, like that... it actually decreased this year, yet you talked about the investments there. You know, obviously schools, as we do this digital transformation, are becoming more of a target. Um, and, you know, it becomes a, a game at times. Um, and so I'm wondering what your thought is on that in terms of our security posture. We don't have to get into the details of it, but the investment in that security posture, especially as we consider the future innovations of ed tech. Yeah. So uh, in some of these meetings, you probably remember uh, uh, Dave Mazaleski. Yeah, so yeah. he is still part of the district as a consultant. You know, we have a few hours with him every, every month. Uh, Dave Moran and I will meet with, actually, I think we're meeting with him next week on these issues. Uh, you're absolutely right. One of the biggest issues we're having is security. With, I, I believe earlier you talked about uh, efficacy of using Google Meet. Yeah. Um, and you know the state did relax its 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 lines on that, but we also had issues where people, you know, bad actors found out a way to get through the phone yeah, call do. system. They always do. Uh, so Dave Mazaleski is always finding 
services for us to find to encrypt and end encryption. We're looking at end to end encryption uh, emails, especially when we're transferring sensitive do, uh, student data. Right. And because of this, we just, there's no physical way to do it. I can't physically go get a file by a student and, and give it to someone else. We have to send it digitally. Um, so those are, those are needed services. Um, it's always that war between convenience yeah. and security because when we send these encoded emails, especially if you send it to someone who doesn't know how to unencode, it's then I'm on the phone with them for 10 minutes. How do I get the plug in? It's not working right. I, I see everyone shaking their head. They've been through this. Um, so yeah, you're absolutely right. We're, we're, it's just, you know, I would say we're working on it. I don't want to tell you all the things we're doing just because- Oh no, yeah, that's not appropriate for this meeting, but yeah. I'm just curious at the investment level, do you think it's appropriate for next year to, to drop that line item? I, I just wanted to clarify, mm -hmm. hang on. I just want to clarify the line item. Are we talking SEC technology? Yes. I think yes. that's secretary technology. Oh. Right. I, I want to just be yeah. sure that's secure. Yeah, the I was- Security okay. line? No. Yeah. I yeah. was looking at SVC, the one that went up 10,000. That was the oh, one that that's for security. Right. Okay, then, then right. you've yeah. clarified. Sorry. Yeah. That's, thank you for that clarification. Yes. I apologize. Good. But a good conversation nonetheless, because that line went up. <laughs> so, yes, yeah. that one did go up. Yeah. And that one, we, we like I said, encryption, <laughs> to certain, certain security services we wanted. So, yes, thank you. Okay. Who's next? Just while, just so that we well, just one <laughs> other piece to Liz's um, point, just Liz on the professional technical service line, there's a $10,000 increase that is for an ongoing cybersecurity audit that we'll, in, and we intend to do each spring. Okay, just yes. so you know that that's there. That's a good idea. Um, Did just, you have a follow up? Uh, just one, one question. Um, there's a big batch of CARES Act funding coming again. They just signed. Uh, mm -hmm. I, I presume we're on top of that and we're going to take full advantage. So we're definitely on top of it. Mm -hmm. It's it's expected to be about double of what we received in the fall, which is still not a lot, but it's something. Um, so it's a, probably a little bit under $300,000 around there if it's exactly what they're saying, but they are basing it on Title I monies. The right. good news with that with those funds, just as an aside, is it's also going to include other buckets in which we can use it for, which will include intervention for students if we felt that that was necessary. So I know we've had some of the conversations around staffing and contingency and where do we devote the money? And I think we have a little bit of a longer time in which to spend it. Originally, they were saying somewhere around December. Now they're saying September. But it would allow us, um, if it made sense to do so, to offer some summer opportunities for kids if we're physically able in a health and safety way to get kids back in to do some work. So that's just an added piece. Thank you. Any more on technology? Thank you very much, Wes. Great, great presentation. All right. Thank you so much, everyone. Uh, have a great day and uh, um, I'll be seeing you around. <laughs> and congratulations on the interview. Oh, thank you. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> All right. Bye. Who's it? General Services and Transportation. That would be me. Let me share my screen for General Services. I have the honor of presenting the General Services budget. So in the budget book, we're again out of order. Yeah, we're back, back yep. to the original order. Dawn, did you? Okay, there you go. There it goes. Sorry, I was a little slow. So this is the general services proposed budget. Uh, the general services encompasses three departments that support the staff administration and board of education in their quest to ensure the district as a whole is successful in the district's mission and vision. Uh, as you have heard from many of the other presentations, uh, all of our budgets try to link back to the mission and vision, mission statement and the vision of the graduate. The general services budget includes three, as I had said, three different departments um, the departments are responsible for district-wide administration of the school system and the Board of Education. The superintendent of schools is in this 
general services budget, personnel department, and the business office. It is through our different roles and respective department responsibilities that general service provides the resources and support staff needed for the schools and departments to meet the district's mission and the vision of the graduate. So what does each of these departments uh, perform within this budget? The superintendent of schools is the top executive who implements the Board of Education's vision and mission and works with the school leaders to support the needs of the students and the, meet the district's goals. Personnel department, they handle the recruitment, hiring, evaluation, certification, mentoring, negotiations, substitutes, fingerprinting, and all of the FMLA process for all staff. Business services handles purchasing, payroll, general ledger, accounts payable, employee benefits, workers' compensation, unemployment, liability insurance coverage, child nutrition programs, transportation, and student registration. The general service budget reflects a lot of other areas um, besides just our normal department um, resources. It reflects legal expenses. It also carries the district's liability insurance and the cost of employee fringe benefits and added in addition to recruitment, um, the Ridgefield High School school lunch and membership expenses for the district. Fringe benefits consists of health, dental, life, disability, the town pensions, as well as other post-employee ben benefits, also known as OPEB. Um, just to give you an idea of what employee fr fringe benefits uh, encompasses. Also included are Social Security, Medicare, workers' compensation, and unemployment. This is an idea of what our budget um, increase is proposed at this time. Our salaries are up $30,155. The employee benefits, that's the encompassing of all employee benefits is up $1,272,210. Liability insurance is currently proposed at an increase of $19,792. Support services, is, has an increase of 47,044. Currently supplies and district memberships do not have any increase um, in our budget whatsoever. Overall budget increase is 6.38%. So what does some of that encompass? Well, part of what our budget has are numerous areas that are estimated as the actual expense we won't know until much further into the budget process. Town OPEB is one of those areas. Um, it's currently estimated at 15,000, an increase of 15,696. That's an 8% increase. I believe that we have um, been informed by the town what the Board of Education's expense is for OPEB. So that will be adjusted in the next round of adjustments that we um, would have to make. Health benefits is estimated at a 7% increase, and that's 1,097,801. $1, Workers' compensation is an estimated 8% increase. That's $63,376. Unemployment compensation is an estimated 8% increase for $4,800 increase. And liability insurance at an 8% increase of 19,792. So some of the major drivers um, on a year to year comparison for our overall increase of $1,369,200 or our 6.38% increase, obviously the largest is health benefits. Our health benefits at our 7% increase is a million dollars. We don't necessarily know what our actual increase or what our percent increase is going to be until sometime April. And it's usually when the last things that we can adjust in our budget um, come time for uh, the referendum. Workers' compensation, as I had said, um, clearly states that it's 8% increase. Payroll taxes is about 44,000 or 2.5. 
the school lunch program is one of the areas that has been increased with an anticipation that with uh, once we come out of COVID or are, are slowly moving out of COVID, there's going to be a need for additional uh, free and reduced lunch coverage at the high school. Uh, so we've increased that budget $42,950 from what we normally would carry in that um, line. Non-certified town pension has a 2.44% increase of 23,100. And our, as, as I said in our, my other slide, our salary increase is 30,000. Liability insurance, again, is 19,000. And our all other in is that 47,967. Some of the idea, uh, some of the areas on um, the all other that gave that increase uh, of the 47,000, two of the areas, or one of the areas in that area is um, under our support services. We have um, some recruiting uh, increase that we needed to implement in order to bring in the best talent that we could for our district. So here's another look at the overall, uh, our overall budget and what is the percent of that 1.3 million increase in our general services. Obviously it's clear to see that health benefits takes most of the increase in our area. We have the school lunch program with our anticipation of the free and reduced lunch payroll taxes, workers' comp, and then we have the other smaller ones, town pension, salaries, liability, and then the small amount of all other. Thank you. Any questions? Kathleen, you want to start us up? Yeah, just uh, thank you. First of all, Dom, for that. And um, every year, it's been, you know, health benefits, if we look at that. But usually we then we begin to look at, uh, have they been shopped around? Have they been giving, negotiating with that, with, uh, you know, um, uh, where savings might happen? And I know we never know the final number for going on, but um, I know that's always been something we've been able to play with. Since yes, um, not necessarily play with, but we, we, they give us an estimate where they think the market's going at the time. The underwriters haven't completed all of their um, analysis of where the um, insurance company would come in with the increase. Obviously, our um, our representatives Brown and Brown do uh, a review of all of the carriers that are out there and solicit one give us the best uh, return on our money, as well as give us uh, maintain our, our current services um, for the employees for insurance. Um, and it, at this point in time, they feel that staying with our current carriers, which is Anthem, um, is the way to go. And that Anthem is working with them um, to try to give us the best return and the best rate that they can um, going forward. Obviously, this past year has been an interesting year. Um, and looking at the, um, the claims experience is uh, something that they're taking into consideration, but they also have to take into consideration that it wasn't a, a normal past year. Um, and that uh, the market in general and where the expenses are going um, will come into play, but they tend to don't have that in detail until well into the first quarter of the, the calendar year. Yeah, thank you, thank you. I just know that's always been the big thing. Sorry. It is you said that the 7% came from Brown and Brown? Brown and Brown, yes, it's a, just a starting point. Um, when we start our, our budget off back, uh, we actually put our budget together to come up with these estimates. I wanna say we start around October, November in order to bring it to you in time for your deliberations. Um, and we will adjust that as we get further into it and further information comes down from them as to where our rate will come in. And what about the 8%? Did that, did that cut, all the, a lot of other items were budgeted an 8% increase? Where would that number come from? Typically, we budget at 8% as we go um, at looking at the trend and looking at where our expenses may come in. Um, workers comp comes in based on salary. Uh, we do a workers comp audit. Once the audit has, has come, been completed, that kind of tells us what our expense is going to be for that. Liability insurance tends to follow a calendar year uh, process as opposed to a fiscal year process. So when we receive information, and just so um, we're, we're um, the town is on the same uh, li carries liability carrier that we have, 
So they're in the same boat waiting for the liability carriers to tell us what our increases may be for next year. And that will be adjusted as the information comes through as well. A lot of those areas we just, when we start the budget process, the information is just not available as to what that increase is going to be. Tina? Thank you, John. Just um, trying to understand this, and I'm new to this, so I apologize if this question is redundant. But the school lunch program, you mentioned that you're expecting an increase at the free and reduced lunches at the high school. And can you explain the reasoning behind that? And following up, can you explain what all other, I know you mentioned recruiting in the all other uh, line item, what that means, what what, ex, what other stuff does it include? Like all other, what all other stuff does it include? Sure, sure. Um, first, I'll start with the free and reduced lunch. We only budget for the high school's free and reduced lunch because they are not on our national school lunch program. So any free and reduced lunch expense at the high school is covered by uh, the general fund budget. Um, given that with the shift in um, the various uh, families' needs and, and, and the position that they're in and um, maybe not be working or looking for work or laid off or whatever their case may be, um, it looks as if there is an anticipation or we are anticipating an increase in the use of those going on to the program for free and reduced lunch or being eligible for free and reduced lunch coming into next year. And so that's why we've increased that line itself. Uh, looking at the all other, when that particular slide where we had all other, I gave um, specific, you can look at my, uh, the budget and you can see specifically the health benefit. You can see specifically um, the pension line and that all other falls into areas which would be um, in that particular uh, account that was there was um, OPEB is in there. Which is only which is a fifteen thousand dollar increase um, that will be coming down a little bit because we did get the final number from that. It'll come down about seven thousand dollars. The other ones are small. It's like six thousand dollars for certified teachers' life. Um, it, there's eight thousand for long-term disability. Uh, Short-term disability is in there with uh, six thousand. So it's smaller areas like that that are still parts of employee benefits but not big enough in order to put it out there as a main driver for the budget. Thank you. Nora, yeah, you, Nora, you go ahead. Thanks, thanks, Don, and thanks for explaining the school lunch program. That was one of my questions, but, but real quick, um, I'm just wondering um, if you could clarify the recruiting services and just why the why the, the really big increase um, looking, back, looking back over the last three years and just why um, it increased the $6,000 and what we can do to uh, get people to come to us instead of us coming to them. Don, would you like me to answer this? Certainly, thank you. Sure, um, so we have an online application um, process uh, which is actually funded through the technology department. Um, we now, um, in a recommendation from Dr. De Silva, because she's had great success with a online system to recruit into New York. Um, it's called the OLAS. And so we have joined that so that when I post positions, I'm posting in Connecticut through our website and through um, uh, educational sites in, in uh, Connecticut. But now we are also posting into Westchester County to recruit a further area. So it's still, we're not paying a recruiter. It's an online application system to get our posting out there and to receive applications. Thanks, Kara. I'll about to jump in and do the same. Okay. And it's been a great, just Nora, as an aside, it's been a great benefit. I believe you were actually, I think you were part of the interviews for um, some of our positions this past spring where we, we were able to interview some great people um, that were coming out of Westchester schools where it's not that far away. Um, but they don't necessarily look on to our uh, CT REAP type of system or Apple Track. So this is just another, it's another avenue in, especially since we're not doing a lot of that um, recruitment through like newspapers or things like this. So it's just another service. So is that like a one-time? No, it's an, it's an ongoing, that's an ongoing service. Annual. It's an annual fee. All right. 
Hi, um, Dawn, on page two towards the top, you've got arbitration and legal general. Mm -hmm. I just wondered, um, I'm assuming some of that has to do with, we've got, what is it, four or five collective bargaining, four. Wow. Um, and I know that that's obviously more than we had, we had last year. I just wondered from the line standpoint, if we felt that that was adequate based on that, the number of, uh, you know, collective bargaining. I believe it is. Um, our, our general, uh, we base our, our legal based on trend. And in the past, that's kind of where we have fallen with the expenses. Um, I know that uh, the personnel department, Karen in particular, has done an exceptional job working with the unions to keep negotiations um, at a minimum out of the legal hands and, and mostly with um, discussions between the unions and us so that we don't run up the legal fees and we use the legal for what we need it to use it for. Um, but I think we are okay with that number at this point. Karen, I don't know if you feel any different. Um, yeah, so there's, there's and, and Don, um, maybe you can help assist me too. So part of our legal is for negotiations, but part of that general legal is just for more um, general uh, questions that arise that we need to uh, consult our attorneys for outside of the negotiations process. So I do believe that there's funds in some multiple places to help cover that. And that does not that that does not cover the line for um, legal having to do with settlements or things on with special education, correct? No, correct. Thank you. Anyone else? Should we move move into transportation here? Okay. Let me see if I can successfully share my screen again. go. Uh, I have Rick Bupinacci, our um, transportation director with me as well to um, go over the transportation and budget proposed budget for next year. I want to start off by saying that this past year we had um, created a, a, a consulting contract with our uh, vendor Edulog who is our routing software uh, company. We asked them to do an operational assessment, a data assessment, and an efficiency assessment. They started that process last year um, and had done a lot of work in a remote fashion, getting, gathering the detail, looking at our software, getting into our software, and looking at how we were using it, utilizing it. Um, and they were able to only go so far before they were uh, required to come out and start to look at our roads and do an online assessment of our routing. Um, and COVID came in and kind of put a stop to that. So we weren't able to complete our, uh, our study um, so that we, we, our goal was to have it done so that we would have that so that coming into next year's budget, we would have a better idea. Um, efficiency wise, are we efficient? Do we have efficiencies that we can find? How is our software working? Are we utilizing it um, correctly? Um, and we weren't able to complete that. So we're gonna continue to work on that once COVID or their restrictions for travel lifts and they can get out here. Um, anyone who's driven around our roads kind of knows that they're very narrow. There are some quite, quite a few hills. There's a lot of navigation that certain buses need to do. We, need, we have a lot of smaller buses in order to get to, through some areas. Um, they have to look at sight lines. They have to look at um, turning radius. They have to look at uh, students need to get on the bus on the right side of the road. So they have to look at the, the, the process, the whole logistics of the routing system, picking up students, getting them from one location to another, get to the school. And it all has to be done within a certain amount of time as pick up from home to the school and then school to the home. And then between the four, four waves that we have, is very tight. Um, so I just wanted to, to give everyone an update. We had started that process, but we weren't able to finish it. And in, in that um, note, we proposed our budget going forward based on our current um, status, where we are with our the number of buses that we have. 
the number of buses that we need and the students that we currently have routed and we anticipate routing next year. Now, at the beginning of every year, um, we do have new students that join us. So uh, transportation routing is a continual basis um, as we add stops, um, take away stops, um, reroute, change buses. Um, it, we have parent requests for certain um, transportation that we try to accommodate to the best that we can. Um, and then given that, let me get into our transportation process. So transportation. This slide here talks specifically about first student and the contract that we have with first student. Our contractual rate, rate with first student indicates that we have a 2.5% increase going into next year. Um, the contract itself is a five-year contract and next year will be the fourth year of a five-year contract. The contract currently expires June 30th, 2023. First student provides transportation for AM, PM student pickup and drop-offs, in-district special education, some of our out-district, out out-of-district special education, and in-district summer uh, special education or our ESY program. Um, they also provide uh, some transportation to our pre-K for um, some special needs students. Ongoing, we have weekly, monthly, annual, um, lately daily reviews of uh, the look with local management at the busing company. We have quarterly detailed inspections of our vehicles. We maintain monthly driver training and safety meetings. We have annual state inspections of all of our vehicles prior to the start of any fiscal year, or any busing, any busing um, service. And we have weekly, they currently are doing weekly and monthly disinfecting the buses, especially with the COVID concern. In addition, First Student is doing a lot of driver training classes at this time in order to um, train the new drivers that are coming on and also so that they have substitute drivers for when drivers are out, whether they're quarantining or out for other reasons. A little bit of background um, with our transportation. The, well, this is an approximate number of students. Our AM, PM, we are approximately transporting or have the ability to transport 4,439 students. Um, we currently have the summer program, the SY program, which is approximately 60 student in town students. We have um, the special ed in town on a daily basis, which is approximately 60 students as well. We have 15 out of district special education programs where we transport 20, approximately 29 students. And we also, per student, covers transportation for St. Mary's and Ridgeville Academy. St. Mary's is an expense that, um, is part of our budget. Ridgefield Academy is also part of our budget, but is part of our budget as a stipend. You'll see when we get into the numbers that the non-public transportation is down a little bit and it's down mainly because the um, enrollment of Ridgefield students at Ridgefield Academy, Academy is down or anticipated to be down for next year. Our transportation providers, we have First Student, which is our main provider. We have 30 buses and 19 vans and nine vans for summer school. And when I say vans, we have vans, but we also have the mini buses and we consider mini buses a van. Um, in addition to the district, we use a, the first student, um, we use a number of private transportation for various special education needs. And our goal is to use first student first whenever possible. Um, however, some situations uh, require us to go to other providers for certain, um, whether the first student doesn't have the ability, they don't have the time, they're already tied up uh, transporting our normal students, um, or there's a special needs student that they can't accommodate and another uh, service can. We also work with um, the re regional educational service con centers so that we could work it see what other transportation, district transportations are, are um, using and transporting to areas that our current students are going to so that we can share rides and share expenses. So here's the a proposed budget for next year. Um, our, our AM, PM, our, just so, uh, let me back up just a little bit. 
when we create the, the transportation budget, it's by hours and different hours, different buses, different size buses, and different hours cost different amounts. So where if I'm looking at the AMPM, you're not looking at a 1.52% increase when I had just told you that the average contract increase was 2.5. It breaks out based on which buses we need and how long those buses run. So the AMPM, we're anticipating a $55,000 increase on that line. Um, summer special education, we're, look, we're anticipating a $41,000 increase on that line. Voc the vocational technical, we're looking anticipating a $1,000 increase on that line. Special ed in town, we're anticipating approximately $36,000 increase. Special ed out of town, we're anticipating 102 approximately increase. And as I had said, non-public transportation, we're anticipating a decrease on that line, mainly because we have fewer students uh, being transported or that we have to cover the cost of for Ridgefield Academy. Our magnet school, we always have um, a half a bus or a bus that goes to the magnet school that we offer, and that's a $5,800 increase to that line. And at this point in time, when we had created this budget, fuel, we anticipated a $10,000 increase, increase in fuel. The town um, purchases and maintains the diesel that our buses use. So we do get the actual cost of fuel from the town. And I believe that number will be coming from the town shortly. So I, that amount could be adjusted um, in our budget eventually. So with our normal transportation line, which I just went over, we also have transportation and athletics. So overall transportation for athletics was up to $2,822 in anticipated area. And we also have transportation for um, the Ridgefield High School. The transportation for Ridgefield High School is mainly for um, educational outings for various classes. And we estimate that there's gonna be an increase of $1,800 um, for the, the high school. So overall, our entire, and if we go back to my um, elements of accounting code 101, um, we're looking at the object 5.1, and 5.1 is all transportation you'll see that the total transportation increase across the entire district's budget as an increase of $233,073, $233, or a 3.84% increase overall. Uh, so any questions? Who wants to start us off? Tina, I saw your hand first. Is there anybody who wants to go? I always seem to start this. Uh, okay, um, thank you, Don. Uh, I understand transportation is really complex, so I don't, and I'm really new to this, so I want to understand. So if if it's a if it's a if it's not the smartest question, uh, just let me know. It's fine. So I know transportation is tough, but this is is this, uh, and I saw and I just saw that we are in the fourth year of our five year contract as we look forward to the next in one more year. I think this is as a board, I think we should look at our policies, our busing policy, what we're doing, but also it goes back to the strategic plan that I've been mentioning, said it all, you know, the later school times, the four tier that we provide. If we can, what will happen if we go back to three tiers? Will it save us money? Uh, so that's one thing I do wanna bring forward. Uh, the second part that I do wanna mention, and again, it may be in the budget, but again, you can explain this to me. Uh, this year we've had, we've given the parents the, uh, option of opting out and driving their kids to school. Yet we are providing buses. Are we assuming that all these buses are full? And if you're not, we're not. So we have we cut down, is there any savings projected in that? Uh, just a question, because I, I didn't understand that, you know, because I opted out, I'm driving my child. And as we again, look forward to a non COVID year per se, are we gonna look at that? Should we be looking at that, you know, giving the option for children uh, if parents wanna drive them? Because I and I've, I know board members have said it, parents have said it, they're always, and I get that we always need to provide a seat for a child on the bus. However, is there a chance that we can look at our broader policy and it, will it help our budget process? If we look at our broader policy and give as we move into any, I would say any level, elementary, middle, or high, if parents want to drive their children to school. 
So I know there are multiple tiers and it's not very clear, but I'm hoping you get what I'm trying to get to this. I do, and Tina, absolutely. There's always um, ways to look at transportation and, and it is an extremely complex uh, process to go through. The logistics is very involved. Um, one of the areas that makes it very difficult is our busing system. While there may be very few at the high school level, by the time it gets to the elementary level, those buses run those same routes or similar routes. And where there may be only a few students at one tier, by the time you get to the end of the tiers, it, it, they're packed, they're full, especially on home, not so much uh, driving in or a lot of times it's picking up that our, the parents aren't, aren't necessarily picking up, they bring them in in the morning, but they go to uh, the Boys and Girls Club or they go to uh, some other recreation or, or some other uh, form where they stay for after school sports or whatever the case may be. Um, so it's, it's looking at, we have to accommodate for all four tiers. Um, we also, uh, the, one of the areas of the efficiency study is looking at the uh, various areas of town and, and what our tiers are. One of the areas that we definitely can look at is what will happen if we go back to three tiers as opposed to the four. Um, I believe there has been some studies in the past done. Now, um, they were done a while ago. Um, so definitely a, a review, a more current review would be a, a good thing to have. And definitely an area that we can work on going forward. One of the things that we ran into in the past, in my opinion, was that we would have various organizations do efficiency studies. And what they would do is they look at Google map, but unless you're down here riding our roads and driving our roads with a bus and seeing the difficult maneuverability that the drivers have to go through on some of the roads, taking the turns, the turn radius of the bus, it, it's not as simple as looking at a Google map and saying, oh, you can just take that road to that road to that road. You can't do that with a normal bus, you, even with the minibuses, that's very difficult to do. So there is some variation to the logistics of, of the routing that has to be taken into consideration on site. Um, but yeah, absolutely. One of the things that we will always move forward with is more efficiency studies on routing and the busing and um, bringing in as much as we can to review all that. So uh, Tina, just in, and maybe Dawn, you can speak to this a little bit because there was another part of your question which you asked around uh, parents opting out and whether or not we can um, reallocate the busing so that we wouldn't need to, um, besides what Dawn just said is that they may be passing through that street anyway, so it's not necessarily that kid. But in addition to that, we have to have a bus available. So let's just say that route wise, it was possible it was possible we'd actually save money by not picking up 10 children whose parents have elected to drive them to school, have even signed a paper saying, I'm gonna to drive to school all year. If any one of those parents changed their mind, then we would, uh, we would be required to give them a bus and we would need to have a bus available to us, which is the other part of the, the challenge. It's not just, okay, we're, we reduce our fleet from 100 buses to 99, but then if we need that 100th bus, we need to be able to access that. And so, um, that's the the complicated layer. You know, it's it's no different than the theory of suspending a child from a school bus. In theory, you can't really do that unless you're going to because you're suspending them from school, right? Because you so you have to be able to offer a child transportation. Um, and so, however way, you know, we we navigate this in terms of finding efficiencies. And if I remember, Dawn, early in the spring during the transition between Dr. Patty Foot and myself, when Edgelog was completing this study, at that point transitioning from four tiers to three tiers was not a cost savings at all, at all. That's what they were at least saying to us based on the work that they've done previously, if my memory is serving me correctly. Um, certainly it's something that we can ask them to revisit. And I think it's worth our time and having them come on site and work with Rick and Dawn to see if there are efficiencies. Um, but it's just important to remember that challenge of having to provide busing, even for the families who say, 100%, I'm never gonna take it, I promise. So I think everybody, uh, Liz, you're next. I'll uh, just say something real quick. I think everybody in the community feels the same frustration when they day after day see a bus drive down their street with one little head at the, on the back seat and that's it. Um, maybe for the board, it would be helpful. I don't know if Dr. DeSilva, if you could provide us the link to the relevant statutes so that we can look over and, and see if there's anything 
um, that either helps us understand the why or helps us find a, a reason to a way around it. Sorry, Liz, you, we you can definitely work on getting that link or the, the statutes and the, the requirements that we're held to. Um, definitely, we'll work yeah, that'd be great. Sorry, yeah. Jonathan. Sure, that no problem. Oh, go ahead. Okay, no, so I said this last year and I'll say it again. We're sitting here a year later, we've got declining enrollment. Yet our transportation, we have no data on optimization of routes still. And we can say that they have to drive the roads all day long. Look, our roads haven't changed for the last hundred years. We could create a database with the complexity, the narrowness and everything else by the time that Edulog maybe comes back and does this, right? Yes, they can't go drive around it on Google Maps, but they can see where something's paved or not. Waze can do it. The data's there. Waze is owned by Google. We're a Google shop, we talked about that. So I'm gonna say the same thing I said last year. The fact that our transportation is not optimized it, and we never look at the data despite several other school districts in nearby states and communities finding millions of dollars in savings, even with their current routes is just flatly unacceptable. It's unacceptable. It's, it, and I know that you see it was an aberration. So I'm willing to give grace on that front. But the fact that the answer is always, sorry, well, maybe next year we'll have that data for you. Maybe next year is it's just flatly unacceptable. Our declining enrollment should be driving. The only thing that should be of, of rising here is potentially special ed costs and or something else. And we should be looking to offset that with route optimization. I said it last year and I'll say it again. There are ways to use data to do this. Data and technology is out there. We use it in our other work lives to get down to an eighth of an inch measurement through artificial intelligence. Yet we're saying year after year, we can't, I'm well, sorry, our roads changed. Sorry. It's just, I, I, this is an area of continual spend without any recognition of the lack of value for that spend that we're getting. And yes, we have a contract. That contract is based on ours. I've read it. They, it is based on hours. So we should have less hours when we have almost 100 less people riding the buses, even if every person has a seat. So I'm going to say this is an area that I, I cannot support this increase. It is not based on any data. You've done no analysis from year over year. And the answer is, sorry, they couldn't come out instead of looking at this opportunity as an area of direct cost savings that doesn't hit the classroom. So I'm just gonna say that and leave it there. I said the same thing last year and I'm just gonna say it every year that this is an unacceptable increase in the budget. Could you, I'm sorry, just while you're on that, you did mention that other district uh, last year. Can you send a link to that study that showed it? Yeah, it was a district, district in Boston that used a technology to save millions of dollars on their budget. And even if we could save 200,000 using some kind of data analysis technique, yeah. If you could send that, I, I, sent, I, I think I sent it last year, but I can send it again. May I just, um, Jonathan, EduLog did, does have two presentations in their initial stages that they did complete. It may be worth either having EduLog present on the work that they've done thus far and or just sharing those initial pieces, um, Liz, so you can see the work that has been done, done thus far and then certainly remaining questions then perhaps those get completed afterwards. So we can certainly, yeah, because there was a I report to take. That. But I'll say Dr. DeSova, that Edulog has been the company that we keep using and using and they never provide any insight or cost savings. So at some point we should maybe be looking at a different partner to take a look at our stuff, right? Yeah, and that, and that certainly is, if that's where this board, the direction that this board wants to go in, I, I know that they completed a report just before I got here, it was probably March or April. It may be worth looking at that if at minimum, just in terms of fact finding, and then we can go from there. Okay, was that a question or just a come up? Other questions? It does, most of the Liz, your point is is valid. The even the AMPM is up a little bit, but the, am I correct in saying that most of the increase for this year is in Non a non AM PM portions that, of the of the that is, that is correct, Jonathan. Yes, and and I can add some flavor to that, and I'll get into it more when Tony and I present. We have students who are more and more attending one off schools for IEP purposes, which just kills the efficiency of special transportation costs in terms of out of district placements. 
Um, and so, and not only are they individually attending, they're also attending farther distance geographically um, than they used to. And so based on what we know right now of where they attend, um, that's where that increase in that number comes from. The number of schools that we're sending kids to privately in terms of the variety has increased every year. So it's not the same 10, 12 schools. It continues to become more and more diverse. Yeah, but my point is just that we should be offsetting that with optimization in the AM PAM. Oh, right? I, I, that's, I'm, that's I'm not, I'm not speaking to nothing to optimize that despite so increasing enrollment. So I was just answering why the yeah, yeah. no, why I get increase it. there with you. Liz, I'm going out of living thinking that perhaps well, what you're talking about I'm is called a, a, a dynamic routing as opposed to static routing. And I don't know if there's a way for us to require our students to tell us the night before that they're going to need a bus or by a certain time in the morning that they're going to need a bus so that we would alter the route for any given day. Is that something that's... I'm not actually referring to dynamic routing on a day-to-day -day basis. Okay. But we can, I, I don't want to solution it here, but I think there is opportunities here to leverage our data more effectively. Anyone else, Kathleen, I didn't mean to cut you off there. Oh, that's okay. I mean, mine is another, it's a bigger issue. It's almost legislative in terms of the statute. I mean, a bus is going around town with one and two students in terms of uh, the environmental impact is astronomical. And, um, in some ways, if we could use that as another leverage as we work on the legislative end, I just think that's just such an important part of our day, our lives, our children's lives. So I, I, that, that just appalls me. <laughs> yeah, I, under, I understand that, Kathleen. The only piece that I would push back on is if a child needed a bus tomorrow because their life changed, I wanna be able to provide that bus. And so that's the, it's the it's sure it's the requirement that we have to fulfill in terms of the law but on the, on the flip side of that the piece that i want us all to remember is that life changes for people every single day whether that's all of a sudden i had to go to work earlier or you know whatever my life my life dynamic is and so yes there happens to be a requirement that we provide a bus for a child regardless, but I'd like to be able to do that, right? We wanna be able to be sure that our kids could come to school and their families aren't forced to beg their neighbor to, to bring them if they didn't have, if they had committed one way and have shifted. I don't know if there'd be savings or not savings and I'm not suggesting that, but I just wanna keep that in mind um, that we wanna be able to, we wanna be sure that our kids can come to school and they can get there safely. Anyone else? Should we wrap up take, uh, transportation and take a 10 minute break? Everybody, everybody's nodding, yes. Okay, it is 2.45, three o'clock back, back here for the rest. Thanks. All right, Rick, you are. <laughs>
Hey, Tony. Long time no see.
Okay, three o'clock. Looks like the gang is all here. And we are right on time, somehow. Am I, am I good to go? As far as I'm concerned, you are good to go. Okay. All right, so I'm gonna share my screen. Thanks everyone for being so considerate and letting Tony and I get to start on time. We don't deserve the credit for that, but glad we got there. Hopefully everyone's got their energy up. Okay. Susie, can you see my screen okay? Let me put it into presentation mode. Just not in, there you go. Yeah, here we go. All right. So good afternoon, everyone. Uh, Tony and I are very happy to be able to present to you our proposed budget for the special education and pupil personnel departments, which combined make the special services department for the Richfield Public Schools. I'm Liz Hanway. I'm the assistant superintendent of special services. And with me is my partner in crime. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. It's Anthony Shaw. I'm the assistant director of special ed for the Richfield Schools. Good to see everyone. So I'm gonna start us off with just a graphic of the vision of the graduate. Um, I think that uh, Tony and I like to say that with the vision of the graduate, the rest of the gen ed world get, got caught up with where special ed has had to be since the 1960s, which is um, all of these things. We do this for all our students, but especially those who uh, have some kind of difference in any way that that um, presents itself, that um, the adults and the teams who support these kids and the kids themselves um, have to display all of these skills. Um, and I think resilience among uh, the highest of them for sure. Okay, so I, I wanna set the stage. What we're not gonna do today actually, which we have done in years past, is give you an overview of our programming, um, partially because we wanna be efficient with everybody's time, but also because we think we've talked a lot about that. Um, if board members were interested, especially newer ones, we could always share with you our um, presentations that we've done to the board. We've done at least two overall presentations about our program, our entire district. We've also done uh, a pre-K specific program. We did a RISE uh, specific presentation um, in the last couple of years. So we'd be happy to share those or if at a future board meeting, um, talk more about uh, specific programs if need be. Monday night, actually, we are gonna be speaking about our preschool program and some considerations for shifts that we're interested in making for next school year. But instead of doing that as a starting point, we thought we'd start similar to where we did last year, which is lay out um, our department, specifically my and Tony's beliefs as it relates to supporting kids with learning differences. And I'll just briefly review them, but knowing that this is kind of uh, at the heart of uh, what, what we do and, and how we support the adults who support our kids. Um, first, that we believe that children with exceptionalities require robust, highly engaging and specialized programming. That our special services programs have to be dynamic and flexible because our student population is ever changing. And that's not just in number, but also in presentation. That uh, we believe collaboration with families and communi community partners is integral to student success. It takes a village is never more true than as it relates to students with learning differences. Um, we believe that our most highly qualified um, only the most highly qualified and trained educators and service providers um, will be able to meet our students' needs. And so we make a high level of investment in ensuring that those individuals either hired are most highly qualified or, uh, and in addition to that, we provide the most specialized training that we can find within our means um, to meet our students' needs. We believe that students, our students are general education students first and they are integral members of their classroom and school communities and they are students with special services um, second. And then lastly, we, we want to point out that our paraeducators are valued partners in supporting our students. We, they are the only group that we call out here because um, we cannot function in terms of the day-to-day -day without them. And, and we want to make sure that the community knows how much we believe that they're important to our work. All right, so a reminder to everyone, uh, I believe we've mentioned it in, in uh, a budget year past, and I think actually even uh, Vice Principal, or, uh, Veterans Park uh, Principal Ellen Tuckner mentioned it this morning as uh, something that we all hope to accomplish eventually. Um, but this slide indicates our, our long-term thinking uh, on our services continuum. Um, though no, it, it's not in our proposed budget this year, 
Uh, this is an area of identified growth for the next years to come, beginning with the next year budget. Uh, so in 22-23, we plan to propose a grades two to five co-teach model uh, that is not currently in place. And that's based on our student needs and how those needs are addressed in what we call our learning centers. Um, Co-Todd is a special ed teacher uh, who works alongside a gen ed teacher uh, to service students with IEP goals in the general education setting alongside their non-disabled peers. Uh, we currently have this model at our secondary level uh, across multiple content areas, so in our middle schools and our high school. It, it broadens our continuum of services uh, so that we're able to more flexibly program for students with IEPs in more settings that suit their individual needs. Uh, Co-taught or co-teaching, some call it ICT, uh, can take many forms based on the uh, specific lesson, the content of the lesson, and the needs of the students. Uh, and this will require professional development for teachers uh, required, um, or that we acquire to fill that role, as well as for our ongoing staff uh, to, further, uh, to further strengthen our current co taught model at the secondary level. Uh, we also aim to annually reassess our co taught offerings um, across content areas at the secondary level. You'll see in a few slides as we talk about prevalence rates and um, trajectories around prevalence rates in the next five to 10 years that. Um, our thinking around a co-teaching model is first and foremost about the uh, quality of experience that students have and the ability for educators to meet their needs. But secondarily, we do believe that um, economically, it, it is a more sustainable long-term model given the rate of prevalence that seems to be trending in the entire state of Connecticut. Okay. So this is a handy graphic that delineates the two major branches within Dr. Hanley's overall department, pupil personnel there at the, at the bottom uh, half, and special education, which I assist her in directing. Um, uh, and all, and this was at some point of debate <laughs> earlier today, um, over 250 staff members uh, comprise both departments across our schools and programs in the district. Um, so uh, a large part of that actually instructional paraeducators that Dr. Hanley mentioned before uh, comprises almost half of that department. So uh, they are really are the uh, the boots on the ground as it were, and, and the, the uh, a lot of the energy within that machine that keeps it running. So a, a huge shout out to those folks. Um, special ed um, along the top there, uh, which evaluates, identifies and services our students with disabilities, consists of special ed teachers, related service providers, including our speech and language pathologists, occupational therapists, physical therapists, our board certified behavior analysts known as BCBAs, and also includes our clerical instructional paraeducators, which I mentioned, many of whom work all the way through July and a part of August for our extended school year program. Uh, so again, back to pupil personnel there along the bottom, consists of staff who work for our broader, or work with our broader population, um, which includes uh, psychologists uh, and social workers, our transition coordinator, uh, who focuses on our uh, students at the secondary going to post-secondary level, our school counselors, our nurses, our nurse coordinator, and our medical advisor, Dr. Ahern, um, our tutors for homebound and hospitalized students and our English learner coordinator and tutors. You see a little asterisk there around English language tutors. Um, last year in the budget, as the budget process went on, there was consideration around eliminating the English language tutors and uh, shifting that service provision to interventionists in the building. That is not part of the budget this year. That was a consideration last year and something that we um, you know, keep as a consideration, but we also think it's important for the uh, new assistant superintendent to come on board and to weigh into that conversation as it would affect uh, her department and her budget. This is a fairly straightforward slide. <laughs> Essentially, uh, our, our budget narrative this year is, is, is very straightforward. Um, our numbers of identified students uh, requiring special services remain relatively constant. Uh, which we'll quantify in, in some later slides. Um, it's notable that uh, COVID hasn't had a noticeable direct impact on our prevalence numbers at this point. Um, for example, our move-ins, uh, uh, folks that have moved into district uh, who have kids with IEPs is similar to last year. Uh, and our students with IEPs being withdrawn for homeschooling or private school is also similar to last year. Uh, but chiefly, we wanna continue the excellent work of all of our staff with a similar budget so they can properly service their students. Um, in the budget area uh, that we've determined with the highest degree of variability is uh, tuition for our students placed in private special education programs. We had a, a, a pretty big ask in terms of an increase last school year. 
Um, the year before we did add three school psychologists, but last year, not only did we add the social worker, but we, we beefed up um, a number of smaller lines, whether it be our high school student services, um, some of our extended school year, our professional development, our protocols for providing testing. And that um, proved to be a, a, a great um, move for us for this year for this budget. And we believe given that our uh, prevalence rates in our population is relatively stable as of right now, that that's a big reason why, um, why our proposal for next year is, is to remain the same. So we're, so we're appreciative to the board that they supported that last year. All right. Additionally, our, our pupil personnel service numbers have remained uh, relatively stable since last year as well. Specifically, students requiring a Section 504 plan, our English language, excuse me, our English learners, uh, th those requiring homebound or hospitalized instruction, and our school counselor caseloads are very similar to last year. Um, there was an error actually in last year's budget presentation. If you were to look back in our section 504 numbers, we inverted a five and a four, which is a pretty big error. It made it look like we were many more students in section 504 than, than we were. So I believe the number for last year was um, maybe 15 or 18 students more than it is this year, which is not a measurable difference across nine schools. So if you were to look back to last year's budget presentation to now, um, we just wanna make sure that, that it's clear that, um, that that error was there. But as far as Tony mentioned the other areas, um, our English language learners are relatively the same. Um, homebound and hospitalized instruction uh, is relatively the same. And our school counselor average has gone down from 197 to 190, which is expected given the um, shift in, in population specifically at the secondary level. Okay, so the big picture is that we have no increased request within the pupil personnel budget. Like I said, we made some shifts last school year um, that we believe have really proved to be appropriate. And given our population being stable, we think it continues to be appropriate. We don't have any recommendations for reduction with that said, especially going into a post COVID year. Um, you know, we don't necessarily think that there's anything there that we can recommend for reduction. We do have an $110,687 difference between the 2021 and 21, 22 proposed pupil personnel budgets. And all of that 110,687 is due to um, staffing contractual increases. So the main budget drivers within the pupil personnel budget, if you were to look line by line um, are as follows. The biggest one is the evaluations, aside from staffing, I should, excuse me, aside from people, the main budget drivers are evaluations and consultations for private evaluators. And this is mostly uh, psychiatrics um, and neuropsychological evaluations, mostly. There are one other one-offs there. Um, we do have an increase in what we call forensic risk assessments, which are students who have at-risk behaviors that we need to determine their safety level. And so there has been a slight increase in those. Um, anybody who's gone for anything specialized in their lives and in their health and medical lives knows that specialization is expensive. And so these evaluations are expensive. Um, the next budget driver is our testing materials for our in-district evaluators, and that's namely our psychologists. The standardized tools that they use um, are quite expensive, and so we budget about $20,000 for those. Um, our homebound and hospitalized tutoring, this is for students who are medically unavailable to attend school. We are responsible after 10 days of being out of school for their education, which usually takes place through one-on-one uh, -on -one tutoring. And then medical supplies, um, which is about $16,500. Um, nursing and the health offices fall under the pupil personnel budget. And that also includes for St. Mary's and Ridgefield Academy. Okay. Uh, this is more explicit listing of the services continuum that our special education department provides to uh, eligible students um, age three to 22. And, and that age group is um, what's delineated in the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act. Um, this includes hearing and vision services, which we contract, and counseling and social skills, which are implemented by our psychologists and social workers. So the, you'll see here it says three to 22 years old. We did share with the board last, the end of last school year into last summer and into the fall that there has been um, a ruling from 
a local court, which I think now might be in an appellate court. I'm not exactly sure where it is in the legal process in which in Connecticut, we are required now to not necessarily service students till the June after their 21st birthday, which is what it had been. And now up until their 22nd birthday. Um, so depending on when that student turns 22, that could mean anything from a day, a few weeks, a, few, a month, a few months to almost a full year. It really depends on where their birthday falls. Um, so for this school year, uh, again, this change came post budget. Our budget was already finalized when this happened. I believe it came down in the end of May or June. Um, last school year or last year, um, as of the, so far this school year, we spent $200,000 in student programming because of the change from June of their 21st year to their 22nd birthday. Okay. Sorry that this is fuzzy. I don't know why this is fuzzy, but. Uh, this is a, uh, a prevalence chart and um, the, the chart, it, um, the prevalence rate rather is a percentage of students uh, con uh, constituting our whole student population that have been identified and are serviced under an IEP. Uh, with that percentage of our, um, it's compared with the percentage of our district reference group and then that of the state of Connecticut. I'm not sure everybody can see it. I see some of our grid kind of lined up on the right side, but um, I hope most of you can see the, the chart as it goes all the way to the right. Um, Ridgefield continues to track alongside Durgay uh, since about the 17, 18 school year. You should be able to see that. Um, along that column um, with 17, 18 at the bottom. That we had a, a few years where we were, uh, had a, quite a bit of a gap um, below the uh, Durgay and especially the state average, uh, but we've started to close the gap and continue to, to track right with it. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, this is, this trend continues to increase at the state, at the Durg and at the Ridgefield level. Um, there's no indication right now of this trend slowing. One big, people ask often what's causing the consistent increase of prevalence of students with disabilities in special education within the public schools. So I think there's a, a number of factors coming together at once. One, um, the quality of early intervention birth to three services continues to improve and parents can um, learn more about it. And so um, the more referrals that go into birth to three, the more referrals that go into the public school district, the earlier that students are identified within the public school system rather than later, the higher likelihood that your prevalence rates are gonna increase. So that's one factor. Another factor is the um, explosion of rates of autism in the entire country. Right now, CDC reports one in 43 kids um, is diagnosed with autism, one in 34 boys and one in 144 girls. Um, all research right now shows that this is genetic. So in a, a family who has a child diagnosed with autism, they have a up to 20% chance that another child born subsequently may also be diagnosed with autism. So the rates of autism are skyrocketing and that's absolutely playing a factor here. Um, I think another piece of playing a factor here is just the quality of public school special education services that families are staying within the public schools, they're moving to and coming to public schools. And that's been the case for a while, especially where we live in the Northeast, um, high quality education, but specifically within special education as well. And there are many, many, many other factors that are very nuanced that I'm not gonna claim to understand the weight of, but those are just a few. Okay, uh, this slide breaks down uh, the Dorgay prevalence rate from our most recent data analysis from the state, um, which is last school year, the 1920 year, I believe. Um, you can see that Ridgefield falls pretty squarely along the mean. Um, I wanna add that uh, we're in regular communication with many of our Durgay SPED uh, department leader colleagues in regards to evidence-based practices, new trends, and other collaborative endeavors. And so uh, this, this often comes up and, and as Dr. Hanway was saying previously, um, all, all districts, I, I think, uh, struggle with this from time to time. And, how their prevalence rates uh, stagnate or jump. Um, so it's, it's, it's good to uh, maintain that communication with our, our colleagues in close by districts. We do, um, I'd like to actually give a shout out to the two secretaries that work in our office, Patty McCarthy and Kathy Carnaza, because um, monthly they do data crunching on our referral rates, our referral to eligibility rates, 
Um, to the degree that we can get that information from our, our DER colleagues or even non-DER colleagues, we try to get it, but it's not required to be reported to the state, so it's not publicly available. Um, but, but we do a very uh, macro level analysis of um, our prevalence in population across disabilities, across schools, programs, um, just to see if we see trends popping up and try to understand, is there some environmental factor within the community? Is there some environmental factor within that school, within that grade that's affecting that change that um, we could somehow support better? Um, so thank you to Patty and, and um, Kathy because they do a tremendous amount of data collection, data analysis work for us on a monthly basis. So as far as the big picture within special education, um, our request for our overall special education budget is again, to maintain the same funding levels as this year's budget, just like within pupil personnel. We are um, making a recommendation to reduce our professional ed services line by $100,000 because we are ready to, um, to eliminate our formal contract with the Center for Children with Special Needs and to reallocate these monies for another RISE special education teacher at Richfield High School. So on the CCSN, the Center for Children with Special Needs front, um, we've worked alongside them for the last uh, two and a half years to execute this change. Um, and they are in full support. They believe that we are ready, not only from a staffing level, but from a programmatic level. Um, and we believe we are as well. Um, and then as far as the need for the special education teacher at the high school, the, um, the specific nuance that we have happening there is we have a proportionate of eighth graders coming up um, with specific needs combined with no students graduating out of the high school that um, would create a circumstance if we don't create a third cohort of two cohorts that we just don't believe are uh, appropriately sized. They'd be way too big for the RISE special education teacher uh, in specific as well as the staff to do the level of collaboration and the level of specialization that um, those students and those families um, have a right to for their IEPs. So we believe a third cohort is appropriate for this coming school year. We don't know how long they're gonna need a third cohort for. It may just be for a period of time until this bubble moves on and either we don't need the position or we can reallocate it elsewhere. We'll have to see in coming years. So the difference between this current budget and the proposed budget for next year is $63,291. And that is all due to staffing contractual increases. So why is, again, why is there no predicted change to the special ed budget? Um, our, again, our population with disabilities is almost the same as it was as of 1920, as of right now. And we've analyzed that down all the way to the specific disabilities identified within district, number of kids with dyslexia, number of kids with intellectual disabilities, emotional. We've gone across our rise population, our preschool to see, are, are we missing anything? Um, and the other piece is as of today, as of right now, COVID has not had an immediate, immediate um, impact on our population that would be an, measurable enough for, to warrant us making a prediction for uh, an increase in funding for next school year. I, I'm not gonna make a prediction into next school year though. I think we know that after COVID's over, there's going to be a multi-year impact on kids. Um, but at, as of right now, um, we don't have a budgetary request to align with that. So the budget drivers within the special education budget, um, again, aside from staffing, first and foremost are out of district placements, public and private, um, with more students attending private. When we say public, that um, typically means attending one of the RESC, the Regional edu Education Support Centers. So that could be um, Ed Advance in Danbury, that could be CES and Trumbull. Those are the two closest. We typically don't send kids to the other RESCs like LEARN because they're just way too far away. Uh, we currently have 40 students. Um, Dawn mentioned before the number of students accessing transportation, um, which is less. So the difference between Dawn's number is how many outplaced students are accessing transportation versus our prevalence rate, which is 40. Um, as of right now, they are attending 27 different schools. So if you just take 40 and divide it by 27, you can see um, the ride share opportunities are pretty, uh, pretty minimal of students within district. Um, another budget driver is our contracts with outside groups for professional services, which if you take multiple lines within our budgets and combine them together, total $666,000. 
The vast majority of these go to two categories, evaluations and direct services to students. And the direct services to students are standing contracts for areas that um, uh, we don't have enough in district personnel or are qualified in district personnel for. Um, two examples being um, hearing impaired services and assistive technology. Um, the assistive technology that's contracted here is different than the assistive technology that you'll see in the technology budget under WES, which is instructional. This is specifically for students with communication disorders who need an augmentative communication device or something to that extent to, uh, to communicate. Um, professional development um, is a driver for us. We increase that from 30 to $45,000 from the 1920 to the 20, current 2021 budget. And that's been a, a great, um, a great addition for us and we've taken full advantage of that. And, um, you know, staff have reported they have felt prepared um, to support the kids who are in front of them because they're getting the PD that they need. That doesn't preclude them from participating with their gen ed peers in PD, which they do, but this is specifically for IEP needs. We did make a $25,000 reduction in our legal services from 175 dollars to $150,000. And that was just through a multi-year analysis of our use of legal services. This also is very much um, dependent on what's on the landscape for us in terms of legal cases. Um, a hearing, a due process hearing is a, tr is a very expensive endeavor. And so um, in, in years to come or in time to come, sometimes we do predict that something like that could be on the horizon and that could impact the, the um, funding within this line. Uh, again, we have evaluation materials, uh, just like in the pupil personnel line. Well, that was for our psychologists. These evaluation materials are for our special education teachers, which are, um, we have over 50 of them throughout the district and they have to do academic testing for students um, through the PPT process. So that's what this evaluation materials is for. And then we have $90,000 um, in our budget for private services for students who cannot attend our schools for a variety of reasons. And this money goes to either therapies, academic instruction or vocational services. Very often this is for students who are in interim placements in between school placements, either transitioning from within district to an added district placement moving districts um, from another public school district to ours or um, coming from a private placement back to in district. A lot of times these students need some kind of transition step um, between going schools and this is often what we use these monies for. What you don't see in our budget, which you will find in other budgets are two main things, transportation, which Dawn already spoke to, um, Special ed transportation makes up 31% of the overall district transportation budget. Um, so we have $1,877,000, or 877, $567 in um, transportation. And that's for in-district and out-of-district students. And then assistive technology for instruction per IEPs and 504 plans, which you'll find in West's technology budget, um, which includes uh, software, subscription uh, materials, and a part-time uh, assistive technology specialist, which together um, comes to $110,496. So um, those are two big pieces of special education budgets that um, you're not gonna necessarily see in, in our sections of the budget book, but they are special education, related to special education. And then the other piece before I let Tony go on to the IDEA grant that I just kind of want to add is, as flavor is that this, our special education budget um, is 15%, I believe if I did my math right, 15% of our overall budget. That is tremendously lower than the average across our DERG. If we add in the pupil personnel budget, which I would argue is general education, pupil personnel is not designated specifically for kids with disabilities. It, it, it hits many students irrelevant if they have a disability or not. But if you add in pupil personnel, you're almost at 20%. Even 20% of the overall budget is tremendously lower to our counterparts, not only in our DERG, but in many districts locally. Um, and so, you know, we are mindful of what, you know, what proportion of our overall budget um, our programs comprise of. Uh, supplementing our, our budget is the IDEA grant, IDEA grant uh, which is the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act. Um, that's a federal statutory funding grant that um, 
supplements our both our state and local spending for the uh, salaries and instructional supports that we need to provide students for our students with disabilities. Um, to receive these funds, uh, the state of Connecticut is accountable to provide a free appropriate public education, uh, which is specially designed instruction provided no cost um, to families that meets the needs of every eligible student in the district. Uh, we annually, annually track our spending um, in the IDEA grant um, as an overall picture and per student through what we call maintenance of effort or what not we call, but the OSERS, uh, the Office of Special Ed and Rehabilitative Services at the federal level, uh, calls maintenance of effort. Uh, it's an accountability process uh, that they hold in the state of Connecticut. Um, and that's used to uh, track uh, their accountability to uh, spend those funds uh, per student overall uh, at the federal level. Um, our grant allocation for this year is about uh, 90,000, excuse me, uh, 930,000. Uh, or about 6% of our, our total spending this year. The last big piece of the design of our budget has to do with the excess cost reimbursement grant. Um, and this is uh, a federal grant in which districts are reimbursed when they spend over four and a half times their per pupil expenditure on a student with an IEP. So uh, take student Johnny Smith, uh, when we spend over $91,500, unless Dawn tweaks me that my number is a little bit off, um, when we spend over that amount on Johnny Smith, which is four and a half times the Ridgefield pu per, per pupil expenditure for this school year, we can submit to receive reimbursement over that $91,500. The average cost for a full program for a student with an IEP is two times their per pupil expenditure. So there's a very small number of students who meet eligibility for excess cost reimbursement. We track students when they are within $20,000 of the threshold in case something to their program changes that increases our spending and pushes them over the um, eligibility threshold. And so then we can make sure that we're capturing them in the claim. We file in December and then they allow us to file a revised um, claim again in March. And then we typically receive our allocation in May. The state of Connecticut will reimburse districts a percentage of the amount that we spend over that four and a half per pupil expenditure. So last year, we budgeted 1.4 and we received just over 1.5. We're budgeting 1.4 again for this coming year. Reason being, uh, you'll see here, we have a chart from 1516 until last uh, 1920 school year. The reimbursement rate has generally continued to drop. There was a little blip up um, in 1819 and 1920 last year, we got a uh, 71% re so 71 percentage per percent of what we claimed over the four and a half times amount reimbursed. So we don't know yet what the percentage of reimbursement is going to be. Um, you know, 1.4 we think is um, is an appropriate amount, amount. Um, but you know, they, they, they never guarantee for us uh, what the percentage of reimbursement is gonna be. Also another tip of the hat to uh, Kathy Carnaza and Patty McCarthy for their tireless efforts to maintain all of our records in, in regards to the excess cost reimbursement grant um, that goes down to the penny. <laughs> uh, so we appreciate the work. Um, our cost containment strategies for this budget um, include shifting away or winding down contracted services while we build industry capacity. Um, as Dr. Hanway mentioned before, uh, the Center for Children with Special Needs is, is the big one this year. Um, since we've come into district, we've uh, worked uh, alongside their leadership to make sure that we um, build capacity by hiring our own in-district board certified behavior analysts while I am trained on uh, providing the program support. So those are the, are the two big pieces um, of their contract with us is uh, the consulting BCBAs that they had provided for so long and then uh, their direct program support at the administrative level and then directly to the classroom level through their consultation and training of the BCBA. So as we've wound that down systematically, over the last couple of years, uh, we've now fully developed the capacity to, to take over the program on our own and um, are more or less saying goodbye to that component of the contract. And as Dr. Hanley mentioned, that uh, we'll be maintaining a relationship with them in the future uh, for professional, 
professional development purposes uh, for our BCBAs um, and any future uh, specific or specialized cases that we need their advice on. Um, DBT training or dialectical behavior therapy training um, for uh, targeting students whose social, emotional, and mental health needs may preclude their access of instruction, particularly at the secondary level, has become important to us in the last couple of years as we recognized that need across our schools. Um, that's a, a large um, uh, component of our uh, capacity for our psych, uh, excuse me, our psychologists and our social workers uh, to work with students with that need. Uh, oh, I, I skipped number two. Um, increasing also our professional development budget in order to uh, have staff and programs capable of serving uh, a broader array of students um, and their needs, uh, ideally not requiring further specialization and an outplacement, right? So we, from that previous slide, looked at uh, the number of students, the number of schools. Um, many of those schools are, are so very specialized that, uh, you know, the student needs that, that fit their programs is almost a one for one, but to continue to build our industry capacity so that we don't um, have as many cases of that in the future is one of our goals. Um, and we spoke a little bit about special ed transportation before. Uh, we do um, attempt to ride share. We, we look for ride share opportunities when possible to reduce our special ed, special transportation costs uh, for those students that are in our out of district programs. And we're right now ride sharing with two local districts. And we, we know how dif difficult that can be, not only in terms of just you know two students going in the same direction, but all the other factors that go into designing a, an effective transportation route. Um, and then finally. Um, looking for competitive rates for our contract tutoring services uh, for students requiring those services while uh, homebound or hospitalized. Okay, so hang on, we're almost done, almost there. So trends that we're watching, um, and again, the cost containment measures and the trends, these are not things that within our field really change a lot. These are the expensive things and the things that end up having big implications to budgets over time. Um, so the first is we have an increase of students who are in hospitalization for longer periods of time. We shared this last year. Um, you know, students are uh, in hospitalization six weeks, eight weeks, twelve weeks, um, and so they they are tutored while they're in hospitalization, um, which um, gets you know gets costly as well as having adequate programming for them when they return. Um, so that is something that we continue to watch. Uh, students, as I mentioned before, a trend that we're watching, attending outplacements farther away from Ridgefield geographically, as well as not uh, attending placements together. Um, and frankly, students attending outplacements that are more expensive, the rates of tuition, just like college, increase every year. We do our due diligence in ensuring that if they're increasing tuition, that we are seeing um, a result of that increase. What are we getting programmatically? as a result of that, but the reality is they continue to increase. Um, and again, the more specialized a private school, the more expensive. The average private school tuition for students with special needs right now is about $85,000. And that's just straight tuition. Um, that doesn't include transportation. And then frankly, um, the other thing that we're looking at is the longer that COVID goes on and the more private schools close, reopen, close, reopen, or families are not comfortable sending children in person, the less transportation that's used by those students. While absolutely, that's a benefit for our transportation costs, it can impact our excess cost reimbursement based on what we had projected because we build transportation into that reimbursement assessment. Um, on the whole, our students in outplacements when their schools have been open, they have attended and have used transportation, but that is something, a trend that we're watching. Okay, finishing up. So just a, a few things that we'll just say that you know, we started with our beliefs and kind of come back to um, the reminders. Really, first and foremost, um, our special ed and pupil personnel staff support all students in our schools, just like our general education colleagues own all their students. So students who don't have IEPs, who don't have special programming, they benefit from having special educators and pupil personnel staff um, within their classes as well. Many of our special educators are co-teachers in general ed classrooms at the secondary level and all students in that class benefit from that. Um, our special ed and pupil personnel staff consult with general ed teachers for the benefit of all students. Those teachers skills improve for every kid who they touch because of those conversations. Um, they advise clubs, they coach, 
they attend school activities, they ser serve leadership roles in each school. You'll find that our special ed and pupil personnel staff members, when it comes to any leadership role within a building, a lot of the times it's one of those folks. Um, and then lastly, they celebrate in school successes and are part of efforts to achieving school-wide goals, um, just like their gen ed colleagues. So with that, we're sorry if it was a little longer than we thought it was gonna be, we'll take questions. That's okay, it was a great presentation. Who wants to start us off? Tina. Oh my God, I'm sorry. It's a really easy question this time. Thank you, Liz. And thank you, Dr. Shoa. Uh, I just saw a very quickly a BCBA reduction. Is that because, is that because of the um, contract we are releasing CCN with or did I read it wrong? I'm sorry, I'm a, I'm a little spaced. So we, we moved a BCBA position yeah. to a special education teacher position this school year. So we had five BCBAs budgeted for 1920. We didn't fill five, we filled four and we moved one of them to a special education teacher position in which we, um, when we opened the Barlow Rise cohort. Thank you, it was easy. It's a one for one, really. Okay. Thank we you. thought we need five, we really need four. We use it for the teachers so that that cohort could open. It helps clarify because of the yep. way. Thank you. Karen, I got that right. Okay. So you had a pretty, ready to pretty unmute. big ask okay. last year, right? With, and you got it. You had, you had a very big ask last yes, year. Yes, we did. Got it. Yeah. Um, this year, you're saying what we got last year was what we needed, and it's still what we need. Yes. Is that, is that how I'm reading this? Yes. One of the things that's always been difficult is that it's it's ratchet it's ratchets up year after year after year. Then we go to the board of finance and the board of selectmen, and they say, when does this end? Um, for now, at least, you're saying. The budget I, I, you put forward last year is still good for yes. this coming. I'm not we really believe that. With that but for yeah, now. I, I try to avoid as best I can in public forums. Like, when does this end? Conversation. No, no, no. It no. is an impossible. It, no, in general, and it's a fair question. Like, okay, so when does the trend flat? When do you um, pull back on certain things? So, um, it's it's a really hard question to answer. I think. Um, you know, I don't like throwing stats at people, but sometimes it does help contextualize. Like if you just look at that trend data, um, you know, it's, someone could say, what does this mean percentage wise in five to eight years for our public schools? I mean, more than, more than ever, that's why we want to go to co-teaching because not only is it, do we think a strong model for kids, it is a far more economically sustainable model. Rachel. Thank you so much for that presentation. Um, I just have a couple of questions about co-teaching and I apologize if I miss this. Is some of the funds in professional development next year supporting the district priority of co-teaching professional no. development? No, not next school year. No, we're not ready to do that yet. So we're, we're not doing anything about co-teaching next year? No, what we're doing next year is, is working with, we're gonna develop a committee to develop our plan. I, I just, to be totally reasonable, Rachel, I don't know what COVID is going to come out like. People are going to need to get their bearings. Gen ed teachers are going to need to get their bearings. We start putting them into co-teaching professional development. People's heads are going to explode. Oh, they'll spin. Yes. yes. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. No, it, we're not, we're not ready for next school year. Um, I'd rather people really understand what it looks like, have a clear staffing model, have a clear trajectory. We're not in an emergency. Kids are, kids are getting quality services. We just want to evolve, um, but I don't think we're ready to start in September. You want to be thoughtful about the process moving forward. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Nora, so you had a question? So on the, on the same um, subject um, of the co-teaching model, um, how will you determine which classroom teachers and special ed teachers participate in the model? I just, I know for... Noro, um, I think you, you, yep, we lost you after. We lost I, the uh, end of it, but I think I got the meat of it. Okay. I think, I think what you asked is essentially, how do you choose a personnel understanding and probably that it's an important decision. So, um, you know, that I, I, Tony and I are not going to choose on our own. That's, that's impossible. We don't know the gen ed teachers well enough. That's part of what we need to do next year. I need to, we need to be able to get in classrooms. I need to be able to watch across our elementary schools, 
what it looks like in, in, in classrooms. Um, and I can't do that right now. We can't do that right now um, to even assess like what are the qualities that we're looking for. So to Rachel's point, this is so much prep work that needs to happen. I'm not, I also don't want to send everyone to PD off the bat, not knowing if they're going to implement. And so they implement two years later and they need the PD again because they, it's been too much time. So if, if I had to say today, which um, I have been known to change my mind in short periods, I would say I'd be starting to look at my fifth and fourth grade teachers, right? Because we want to build a second through fifth grade model. Kids have it in middle school it may make sense to start at the upper elementary level, but that's probably the most formed thinking in terms of who in my mind right now. Um, and, and who are the special ed teachers, whether that's teachers who we bring into district, if we're lucky enough to get funding for an increase, which is a much bigger conversation for a year from now, or if we use teachers in district, it's all gonna depend on the specific fit within that school. Cause Nora, you probably know very well if you don't have the right combination of individuals doing that, uh, it is not going to work no matter how much training they have. Jonathan, the, just the one other piece that I wanted to speak to is special education. And um, Liz spoke to it a little bit with the ask for five, needed four, then needed five. I think the unpredictableness of um, student needs and when children get identified, if they get identified, when they may come in from another community is just another variability that we have to tend to in our, in our budget. And we've been fortunate, we were certainly fortunate this year, um, and it looks like we've been fortunate in the past that, that things have balanced themselves, but that's not always the case. And it's something just to consider as we even think about the class size breaks one way or the other, um, whether it's in this, it won't be in this budget cycle, but certainly in future budget years, whether or not we wanna start planning for that contingency and mm -hmm. what that might really look like. And I know we've had tight budgets and we try to stay the course for that for that reason, um, but ultimately it does lead to, to challenges that um, we could possibly face. And, and to be fair, um, this is one of those years, and, and Rachel, you touched upon it very early on about the kindergarten population coming in. But remember, we also have that population of families who have elected um, to either homeschool or look at another um, another service for their children this school year. So bringing those kids back in uh, and all of that unpredictableness of next year is real. Mm -hmm. and, and there's no, uh, Tony and I are two people, like the question around the changing population per school, we can't know that on a month to month basis without people like the elementary supervisors the department chair at the high school, my gig at the AP at the high school who oversees special ed, the, the leader, the assistant principals of the middle school and the middle school teacher leaders, our preschool supervisor, they are our eyes and ears. Um, and and we, know, we know what's happening because of them. Um, so the infrastructure that's at the building level, uh, you know, we people have asked like, we're lean here with me and Tony. It's really not me and Tony. The infrastructure in the building makes this um, as productive as at least it has been for us so far. Thank you. Any other questions? Thank you both. It was a very well done presentation, Thank very you. thorough. Um, okay, standing between us and the end of a very long day is Mr. Moritz. Good afternoon, it's about time. <laughs> Just three minutes behind, or four minutes. Look at that, Joe. We Not caught bad. Up. Not bad. Okay. Let me. Uh... How's that? Can you see that? Perfect. Perfect. Okay, so the objective of my presentation this afternoon is, is basically to give you a brief overview of the facilities operating budget and all the components that go into to making it and you know the various factors that have influenced its development. Uh, but before I jump right into that and the nuts and bolts um, and challenges of developing a budget in the midst of a, a health crisis, uh, the impact of COVID-19 
had a tremendous uh, impact on our flow of work. Uh, and that's, I believe, worth mentioning. Um, despite the hurdles that we faced with COVID-19, the facilities department was able to pivot and adapt quickly to the immediate challenges that the pandemic presented to us. From mid-March, when the district began to operationalize uh, the remote learning, uh, we began working diligently to prepare and to react to the unprecedented, unprecedented changes in our day-to-day -day operations. Over the summer, the facilities responded by putting into place a number of important mitigating efforts. And you can see from that list, uh, such as enhanced cleaning protocols, uh, going into every classroom, reconfiguring for distancing, uh, the installation of 2,000 polycarbonate dust shields, uh, the majority of them over a weekend, uh, and 5,500 square feet of plexiglass. Um, we got directive from the DPH, the Department of Public Health, uh, about ventilation. Uh, so we had to go and have specialized computer programs written to control and increase the ventilation in all of our building uh, that had automation. And through capital, through your support, uh, we replaced a number of older exhaust fans uh, throughout the district to effectively maximize our ability to circulate and exhaust air uh, in our buildings. Uh, we also installed HEPA UV air purification units in all health offices and containment rooms. And we changed over all hand sanitizing stations to alcohol-based solutions. And that just kind of uh, touches the surface of some of the work that we, uh, we accomplished. That being said, I've always believed and I've always kind of started all my budget presentations over the years uh, by celebrating the accomplishments of the facilities group. Uh, and I believe it's an important recognition that speaks to their hard work and commitment. Uh, in the interest of time, uh, I won't go through the list, uh, but you can see from the, the two following two slides, uh, it does represent a significant body of work and effort to date. But if I could just highlight a few, uh, we did uh, complete a comprehensive sprinkler infrastructure replacement project at the high school in early September, uh, and along with a complete remodel of four student bathrooms there. East Ridge received a gym floor facelift, uh, and there was a new carpeting installation at Scotts Ridge in the main offices and conference rooms. Uh, we also had asbestos abatement uh, performed at Branchville in Scotland, as well as a new well delivery and storage upgrade at Branchville. There was a complete uh, energy uh, measure uh, at Ridgebury, uh, where we installed building-wide LED lighting. And uh, probably our most ambitious undertaking uh, was the replacement of the three underground storage tanks um, all at the same time. It took a lot of logistics, but we did get it. Uh, we did it get it done. We did get it done a little bit after the start of school. So this slide just basically shows you what we go through in developing the budget, you know, and, and I won't get into it for the interest of time, but um, it guides us. Uh, you know, everything is rooted in our mission. Uh, we are a service organization. Um, and everything that we do uh, is to perform our core service levels. Uh, but as this slide illustrates, you know, our, our budget needed to be built around, you know, these guiding principles. Uh, you know, we needed to make sure that it aligned with our fiscal responsibility. And you can see that through the budget um, that we, things stayed pretty flat uh, for most of, most of my objects. Um, we also uh, look at any cost containment opportunities. Uh, our biggest one is to strategically optimize um, our internal trade resources, um, which helps us limit our reliance on outside, uh, outside services. Um, and again, the funding needs to support our core levels um, of service. And we have to ensure that, that the budget that we do put forth uh, does give us the adequate funding uh, to remain responsive to our infrastructure, uh, infrastructure repairs, those specialized maintenance projects. And, and one of the bigger things is to make sure that we continue to close up our deferred maintenance uh, gap. But most importantly, uh, we need to continue, the budget needs to continue to invest in our resources um, that support our health, safety, and security needs throughout the district. 
So on to the budget. Uh, the ask this year is $9,086,683. Uh, it represents 8.79% of, of the superintendent's proposed budget. Uh, it's also a 7.44% increase over uh, the current budget that we're in, uh, which also translates to $629,000 increase. Um, and the facilities budget is consistent in a five-year range as the graph on the, the left shows. Um, where we fall as a percentage of the uh, superintendent's uh, proposed budget. And if you look at the five-year data, um, these are our operating budget increases over the five years. And you can see that there's been, a, there's been some good years and there's also been some, some high years. And basically a lot of that has to do with our energy costs. But it is a budget that is targeted and focused uh, and it's specifically focused on supporting nine schools over 1 million square feet. Uh, we also handle five support facilities with a staff of 54 uh, people. And that also represents the 11 cost centers that I have to budget for. This slide highlights the five major object categories that comprise the facilities budgets. Quickly, salaries and comp compensation, energy and utilities, cost of operations, school safety and security, uh, and repair, uh, repairs, and, uh, repairs and projects. So of the $9 million, you can see the big, the, the big uh, part of the budget is salaries and compensation at 40.3% followed by energy and utilities, and then cost of operations, school safety and security, and rounding out at 4.9% of my budget is repairs and projects. And you can see from that list what makes up those, uh, those categories. So as in any budget, uh, there's a need to identify the challenges and the operational elements that drive the direction of the budget. And knowing where the challenges lie is a critical first step in being able to address those items uh, and those concerns through the budget. So in plotting out the direction of this budget, it's important to keep careful consideration um, on the following challenges, you know, the energy costs, um, collective bargaining, budgeting for the unexpected, the, poss the possible residual impacts of COVID-19, uh, the wonderful impact of uh, Ridgefield weather on our ability to operate our schools, and then addressing any unanticipated compliancy changes that we face during the course of the year. All of these can shape uh, the course of the budget. So in reviewing of, of the facilities budget, there are some significant drivers um, that I believe need to be just kind of touched upon. Um, you know, there's always um, concerns with the custodial maintenance salary, the compensation that goes with that. Um, electricity across all course cost centers is up 18.9%, and, and that represents approximately 47% of the total budget dollar increase. Uh, the budget increase is based on forecasted pricing models for the 2021 generation contract year. And in total, uh, it's an increase of 2.4 cents per total kilowatt hour um, across the board. There is also usage assumptions based, built into the budget based on uh, what we expect COVID-19, uh, how COVID-19 may impact our HVAC run times. The same holds true for heating oil. We, uh, we will be going out to bid for the 21-22 heating season as soon as we see stabilization and favorability in the pricing forecast. Uh, and again, these two are very important because they can sway the budget one way or the other. Um, and this will change, um, hopefully, to the good um, from what I do have in the budget uh, as starting points. But as we go through the budget cycle, um, there will probably most likely be a, a significant change in that in those two line items. Uh, the water account you, you'll see for Branchville and Farmingville, those are our two well schools, uh, is up and that's solely based on timing of a number of Department of Public Health mandated testing. Uh, again, we get a schedule every year and unfortunately for 2021, we're being hit with several large uh, tests for those two wells. Um, school dude software in the, uh, the budget book there, 
which is our, our maintenance work order web-based program, is showing an increase based on uh, the annual usage, the new annual usage fee for our recently purchased and implemented events manager web-based program, which will enable us to manage our building rental scheduling and invoicing more efficiently. And collectively, building projects is showing an increase of 32.3% uh, budget to budget based on the number of estimated costs associated uh, with the projects proposed uh, for the 21-22 budget. So in the interest of time, I won't go through all those budgets or all, all those um, projects, but uh, you can reference that chart to see the schools uh, and the, and the uh, projects that I have budgeted uh, for them. Also, every year we kind of take a revisit uh, at the uh, capital improvement plan, uh, which the Board of Ed uh, graciously approved, and I appreciate that. Um, it's broken up into facilities and technology, and as you can see, $1.4 million uh, was approved for facilities projects and uh, a little over a half a million dollars uh, for the technology. I've also included what I like to refer to as the Doug Silver graph. Uh, which basically shows the fluctuation in our approved capital uh, from the Board of Ed um, that goes to the town and what we ultimately end up with. And in the last couple of years, we've, we've done very well uh, with the town uh, supporting our capital. And that's what I got for you folks. So um, I'm happy to take any questions or comments if everybody's still awake. If anyone is still awake, I see Rachel's hand first. There we go. Thank you so much, Joe. I, I just have a question for my own learning. The, sure. the your chiller repair, is that a cooling system? It is. It's the main cooling system for the, uh, primarily for the new section of the high school, as well as uh, some areas of the, uh, the, the, the older part of the building. Um, but it is, again, was installed in uh, the bundle, I guess, 2002. Um, so it, there are some significant repairs that need to be done uh, this coming year. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Margaret. Joe, thanks for the presentation. Um, my question is actually about, um, you mentioned, you know, LED lighting uh, in some of the schools as being projects. I know it's ongoing. Um, and I believe some schools also have solar panels. And so I was looking at, you know, the increases in the electricity and oil and stuff. And I just wondered, I'm assuming that already takes into account the fact that we've been doing these energy saving upgrades um, and we're still seeing that big of an increase year to year. Yeah, what we have for, for the electricity uh, baked into that are the, uh, we have multiple bills now. I mean, we have our, our utility bills uh, from uh, Eversource and uh, NG, which is our generator, uh, as well as the schools that do have solar, uh, we do get bills uh, for those solar companies. Um, but this year, primarily, uh, what I've kind of bumped up was based on what we're seeing with running these uh, mechanic these HVAC mechanicals 24 hours a day, seven days a week, and it is it it does draw a lot. So I'm keeping an eye on that, but I wanted just to make sure that I had a sufficient amount of funding in there to to cover that without knowing you know the duration of of COVID-19. So if I, if, I, if I heard you correctly, so it seems like from some of these energy saving projects that have been undertaken over the past few years, there are some savings, but yet we still have additional costs because of these other. Yeah, and, and basically I haven't seen Ridgebury yet because it's still new uh, with the LED lighting, but there is a definite notice from Branchville, I see in, in, in the usage. Um, and I, I anticipate that it's a lot more than I'm seeing, but I have to factor in that, that we're running these boilers right now 24 seven and, and all the building exhaust fans. So I think there's kind of a, you know, an evening out there for the time being anyways. Who's next? Sean. Sean. Oh, thanks again for the, the heavy lifting you've done during this uh, interesting year. Um, redirect on the, the chillers at RHS, is that 
intended to cover off on what Jake said earlier that there's uneven heating and cooling and that stuff that will address that will address some of it. Yes. Okay. Um, How do we address the rest of it? And is it in the budget? It is um, because of the uh, work that we did on the sprinkler system. I generally carried a, a, a fair amount of money in the repair line at the high school for that, but with the new uh, infrastructure that we put in place, I've used that money. Uh, we're we're going to be probably going in in the spring once we start firing up the air conditioning um, more seasonally uh, to balance out and see where, where we have issues there. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, in, in the olden times, mm -hmm. um, we used to uh, have a bunch of uh, pro projects, I guess we'd call them for uh, school safety that we were looking at bollards and, and, you know, the doors and, glass and uh, none of that seems to be reflected anymore. Did our safety profile completely change? Are we just not as curious about security anymore or have we redirected uh, our efforts elsewhere? No, um, no, uh, we remain very serious about the security um, and there still is uh, outstanding projects from the Capitol on the bollards uh, and the vestibules. Um, in one of my earlier presentations to the board, it was such a hectic summer with the COVID that mm -hmm. a lot of those projects, we just ran out of time. You know, it just, things were just so focused on getting schools ready uh, and prepared. Um, so I, you know, we're committed now to move those forward to this coming summer and getting those all on the, all done and off the, uh, off the docket. So there's no additional ones beyond those planned. That's no. everything we need to be comfortable with our security profile at that at this point in time we're comfortable with where we are we still have some cameras to install uh, but we've done over the years we've done a tremendous amount but we are uh, within the next couple of weeks we're going to be doing our security audits of the schools which i will probably report to the board in executive session at some point in the next month or so um, okay and we'll see what comes out of that and just an observation, the Eastridge steps look awesome. <laughs> the security items, I believe they were all on, on the capital side of the, of the uh, right. budget right. and, and were discussed at that point. So, but yeah, some of those have ongoing budget. components to them um, because there were some of that need, that needed to be reflected. Like we've broken technology out now. Uh, we were going to have a separate line item for those ongoing technology um, line items, but there are none to look at, so. Yeah, generally, yeah, generally, as Jonathan said, generally the security stuff uh, is carried mostly <laughs> on, on capital because it does carry a, a pretty hefty price tag. Oh, one last question, uh, just in arrears, that that uh, issue with the sprinkler systems all got cured and corrected with the town and everybody's happy with that now? Good. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. Anyone else? Hopefully you didn't jinx me. Sorry. <laughs> Thank you, Joe. You're welcome. Thank you, guys. Any more questions for Joe? Or um, if not, do I, I have a motion to vote? <laughs> Hang on, I just want, I wanted to be sure of something if I can, John, I'm sorry. Yes. No, no. I feel like we're ahead of schedule. Um, <laughs> John Mansfield, if you're on, if you don't mind just sharing the Google Doc. And so I just want to be sure that we've answered the questions that were either presented. Um, I, I believe that they were present, the questions that were presented to us in advance. And so I just want to be sure that we're okay there and then that we've also memorialized the questions that are still outstanding. So John Mansfield, if you could just scroll up a little bit, I think there was a question around COVID expenses um, and why we were, not, um, we were not identifying actuals, which I believe has been answered. The art teachers, there were questions around that. Um, I think we've answered that. I'll just keep scrolling. Keep scrolling, John. Elementary level paras, the elementary folks have answered that, those questions. Keep scrolling. Middle school math 180, we've gotten that. We've talked about the alternative high school. 
keep scrolling down. I think we've talked about the administrative structure. We've got that. Keep scrolling, John Mansfield. Special education and the budgetary impact uh, impact from 18 to 21 year olds. Dr. Hannaway answered that. There was a uh, question around facilities. And um, the question was, whilst I understand the Parks and Recs is in charge of this, are we planning to look at um, future equity around playground equipment for the elementary level? And so we did, uh, we did answer that, that that's part of a, a um, capital plan for Ridgeberry and topics that we'll be discussing. We, talk, we began to talk about this with respect to equity and the PTA. So this is probably a further discussion. We talked about shared services with the business office. I believe we talked about the EL tutors, um, the adopted budget from last year around math coaches and the director of security. I think you could keep scrolling, John Mansfield. Okay, and we talked about budget to budget instead of actual. So what we'll do from this point on, any further questions that were asked of us today, we'll look to answer these hopefully by Monday night. Um, you can stop there, thanks. By Monday night and we'll post these on the website for the public. And then once the Board of Finance and or uh, Board of Selectmen ask us any additional questions, we'll just include them on that one document so everybody can look for all the questions. All right. And then I just, if I can, Jonathan, I just wanna summarize the topics that at least may come up at the board meeting and future agendas. I think we talked about class size guidelines mm -hmm. later earlier, school times and how that might connect to our middle, our feeder patterns, uh, pay to participate, sinking fund, and art. Did I miss anything? Busing and busing. Okay. And, and also something that we mentioned before that I think we need to begin to look at maybe after the budget, but sooner rather than later, is the feeder patterns to the middle school as we looked at the demographics how we realigned our elementary structure so that they don't, one doesn't get over, overpopulated. Thank you. And so just if I may, Jonathan, just in summary, I, I want to express the appreciation. I realize it was a long day. I'm actually quite impressed that we ended probably early in terms of our time schedule. Um, hopefully you felt that the day was meaningful. I hope that our families are public at home, felt the same thing and you were able to connect the dots, which is really um, the intention. and. Uh, again, thanks to the cabinet, to our families who are obviously very engaged and give us plenty of feedback um, to the Board of Education and certainly to me, um, to our kids. Um, and I think faculty, staff, and the only last thing I'd say is uh, I want a graph that's named after me, Joe, um, the Doug Silver graph, that's something else. So I guess I know when I've gotten to places if I, if I can get a graph. There's a lot of history there. <laughs> Dr. The Silva, yes, sir. I, I had one clarity. I had had that question about the uh, art education in relation to all the specials. Yes, I actually added that to the questions as well, um, okay. Ken. But I'll be sure. I'll be sure to do that. You got it. Just uh, one quick one, Dr. Silva. Thank you uh, very much. This is uh, your first budget process with us. Um, I I found you to be uh, transparent and on your game, and I really appreciate that. Thanks, Sean. I concur. And I want to thank all the board members for having been able to stay here and present and engaged throughout a very long day. And I, I do appreciate all the work that went into it. With that said, I will entertain a motion to adjourn. I so move. <laughs> do I have a second? In a second. All those in favor of adjourning. We are adjourned. Thank you all very Thank much. Thank you, everyone. Stay safe. <laughs>